48. A new roar haven. Tanith woke. There was the taste of blood in her mouth, and she had the king of all sore throats. She felt sick, like someone had stomped on her insides. Apart from that, though, she seemed to be fine, unhurt. She took a look around. She was sitting on the floor in a small room, shackled to a radiator. She didn't remember how she'd got here. The last thing she remembered was... She shook her head. Unimportant. What was important was getting out. The shackles were tight and the radiator solid. There were scrapes where her chain was looped. Someone had been in this exact same situation, and recently too. She wondered if they'd managed to escape. Footsteps. She pressed her back against the wall. Billy Ray Sanguin walked in. Should have known you'd be involved, Tanit said. Her voice was rough. It surprised her. What the hell is going on? Where are the others? Others, Sanguin said, closing the door behind him. His shirt sleeves were rolled up. His tie was loose. He looked comfortable, like this was home to him. Yes, she said. Others. As in the people who are going to tear your head off when they come to get me. Skullduggery, Valkyrie, Ghastly, the others. She didn't get a smirk in response. She'd been expecting one. Instead, he nudged his sunglasses further up the bridge of his nose. He almost seemed shy. What? What's the last thing you remember? Tanith hadn't been expecting that, either. She was going to dismiss the question, ignore it and bombard him with questions of her own. But the fact was... Fighting, she said. Fighting alongside Valkyrie and Skaldaguri against... Against everyone. The remnants... Sanguine said. It came back to her. Christmas. The remnants taking over. She sat forward. Is that what you are? Did they get you too? No, Tanith, Sanguine said. I ain't a remnant. But all that... All that happened a little over two years ago. What? The remnants, most of them at least, were trapped in that receptacle thing. Everyone woke up with sore heads and no memory of what had happened. Everyone except... He trailed off. Her frown deepened. You're lying. No, I'm not. You're lying, she said. You really expect me to believe that I've had a remnant inside me for two years? Then answer me this. How the hell did I get rid of it? Wasn't your choice, Sanguine said. Darkus reformed it inside you and dragged it out. She sneered. Oh, so now Darkus is loose? Yeah. And she's Valkyrie, Sanguine frowned. Well, she was. Now she's the reflection. Listen, it's complicated as hell. I'd love to explain everything. I really would, but we don't have time. You killed someone. A nasty piece of work called Mercy. One of Vincent Foe's people? You cut her head off. And Vincent is not too happy about it. I have a feeling he might be waiting till Darkus is looking the other way and then he's going to come in here, wanting your head and compensation. You've got to get out of here. He reached for her. Touch me and you'll never use that hand again. Sanguine froze and pulled his hand back. Tanith, a lot of stuff has happened since you've been gone. Darkus is here. There was a war between the sanctuaries. The remnants are out again. They've taken over this little town called Thurlis, or something like that. Things have happened, and you got to be ready for— Why are you talking to me like we're friends? Because we're— He faltered. Because I thought we were friends, he said at last. Uh, we've been through a lot together recently. We are partners, more or less. Tanith laughed. Now I know you're lying. I'd never partner up with someone like you. Color rose in his cheeks. Yeah, well, I guess your standard slipped. Listen, you can either let me get you out of those shackles, give you back your sword and let you hightail it out of here, or you can give me attitude and bad manners and wait for your head to be chopped off. Up to you, princess. Why would you help me? He stared at her. 
like I said, we were friends. She didn't trust Sanguin, but he'd been true to his word. She was free, with her sword on her back and her head on her shoulders. She didn't understand it, though. Didn't understand any of it. She leaped across rooftops until she came to the neighborhood she was looking for. Across the street, a man took his dog for a midnight walk. Nothing suspicious about him. Nothing suspicious about his dog, either. It all looked very normal, very civilian, very mortal. But this street was full of sorcerers. Or it had been, the last time Tanith was here. Every one of these houses was more than it appeared, and, as such, she had to be careful. If she had, in fact, spent the last two years as a remnant, who knew what kind of enemies she'd made? When the man was gone and there was no one else around, Tanith dropped to street level. One hand on the hilt of the sword hidden beneath her coat, she hurried to the door of bespoke tailors and slammed her fist against it. The shop was dark. She knocked again, harder this time. No lights flicked on inside. No one home. Back when telephones had been stationary things with rotary dials, Tanith could recite the numbers of dozens of people without even thinking about it. But things were different now. She doubted she'd ever tapped out Ghastly's actual number in order to call him, or Valkyries, or Skullduggeries, for that matter. So here she was, alone in Dublin City, with no idea how to contact her friends. She didn't even know where the sanctuary was. The last thing she'd heard, there were plans to use Roarhaven as their new base of operations. She didn't like that idea. It was a small grey town full of narrow-minded, spiteful people. The Torment had lived in Roarhaven, and probably a few other children of the spider. Anyone who didn't like mortals could find a sympathetic ear in that horrible little place. Unfortunately, it was her best chance at getting in touch with her friends. She didn't have any cash to pay for a taxi, so she jumped from rooftop to rooftop until she found a motorbike she could steal. She didn't even have a pen and paper to leave an apologetic note. She hot-wired the engine, pulled out onto the road, and gunned it. She got lost twice. She'd only been to Roarhaven once, years ago, and the turn was hard to spot. But as she followed the winding road, she started to think that maybe some of this was familiar. When the road straightened, Tanith knew she'd come the right way. She saw tail lights ahead of her, a car parked at the side of the road. An elderly man waved to her as she slowed. Afraid the road's closed, miss, he said. The sanctuary's up here, is it? Tanith asked. The smile remained on his face. The what? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the... My name is Tanith Lowe. If the sanctuary is in Roarhaven, I'd like to come in. I've been possessed by a remnant for the past two years. I'll wait while you call it in. The elderly man lost the smile. He nodded to her and backed away. Tanith stayed on the bike, but turned off the engine. She heard him speak into her radio, but couldn't make out the words. Thirty seconds later, he came back, but kept his distance. Miss Law, he said. Some cleavers are on their way now to escort you in. I have been asked to try to shackle you. Would you be agreeable to that? That depends, said Tanith. Who's Grand Mage? China Sorrows. Tanith frowned. How the hell did she manage that? I couldn't possibly comment, said the old man. So, the shackles? Tanith sighed and held out her hands. By this stage, the headlights of a truck were approaching. This was a different Roarhaven to the one she'd visited. It wasn't a town any more. It was a city. As she was driven through it, Tanith glimpsed the old drabness still present in places, but this only made the newer buildings appear all the more glorious. When she was here last, the sanctuary had been a low, charmless, circular building. Now it was a palace. It had towers and steeples, a brightly lit beacon to keep the darkness back. The inside was just as glorious, even though she was escorted through it with a ring of cleavers around her. Once the doctors had determined that there was no remnant present, 
Her shackles were removed and Tanith was taken to a quiet room for debriefing. She was brought a coffee. She drank it while her stomach rumbled. She waited for whomever they would send. The door handle rattled and Valkyrie burst in. Oh, thank God, Tanith said, actually laughing. I was getting worried for a... She didn't get a chance to finish. She didn't even get a chance to stand up. Valkyrie wrapped her in a hug so tight it was hard to move. You're alive, Valkyrie whispered. You sound surprised. Valkyrie hugged her tighter. I saw you yesterday. You were covering my escape. I helped you, Tenneth said. Even when I had a remnant inside me? Valkyrie released her and stepped back, smiling. Even then, she said. Valkyrie had changed. She was taller for a start, stronger. Tanith had felt it in the hug, and now she saw it in the shoulders. You look great, she said. It is so good to have you back. Valkyrie ignored the chair and sat on the corner of the table. I'm going to take your word for that, said Tanith. To me, I only saw you a few hours ago. Val, Sanguine said some strange things. I know a lot has happened since I've been gone, but some of what he said was pure nuts. He said you were darkest. Valkyrie took a breath. He wasn't lying. But, but then what? Valkyrie half smiled. Funny, I've just had this conversation with Melancholia. Melancholia? The blonde necromancer? Annoying? Who later became the Deathbringer, Valkyrie said. Darkus was my true name, but I couldn't handle the power. It took on a life of its own, a personality of its own. Now it has a body of its own, my reflection. You're... you're the one all the sensitives had the nightmares about. I was. Now she is. And Sanguine said I worked for her. For Darkus? I'm afraid so, said Valkyrie. The remnant in you glimpsed the apocalypse that Darkus would bring about. You've been helping her. And Sanguine was my partner. Is that what he said? He said we even had our own gang at one stage. Yes, you did. Though partners may be stretching it a bit. He did what you told him. Well, that's something, Tanneth said. At least I didn't let my standards slip too much. Valkyrie adjusted her position. And he didn't say anything else? Sanguine? No. Were you hoping for something in particular? No, said Valkyrie. Never mind. It's really good to have you back. I've missed you. And I've missed a lot. Care to fill me in over some food? I'm starving. Yeah, said Valkyrie. Yeah, of course. Come on. They walked. Valkyrie was hiding something, but Tanith didn't press it. It was bad news. Whatever it was, it was bad news. Before they got to the food, Valkyrie's phone rang. She listened for a moment, her eyes widening. Then she hung up. Come on, she said, and took off at a run. Tanith ran alongside her. They got to a large room filled with thin, mirrored pillars, the perfect place to find someone like China Sorrows. Tanith hung back by the door while Valkyrie ran in, joining China and Skullduggery and a thin, disheveled man. What happened? Valkyrie asked. Where's Ravel? Where's everyone else? Mr. Signet was about to tell us, China said, turning her gaze on the disheveled man. Please continue. You were saying that our plan worked? Signate nodded. It did. It worked. I mean, first things first. Something Ravel to another dimension did break the link to Darkus, like he thought it would. The pain went away instantly. The look of relief on his face was just... Anyway. So, we arrived. It was quiet. The room we'd shunted into was unsuitable for spending any length of time in, so we set up camp on the surface. Ravel was in shackles. We established a perimeter, and I'd turned in for the night. Tanith didn't know what the hell he was talking about, but from the look of panic on Valkyrie's face, she knew this was bad. Then I woke up, said Signet. There were people fighting. There were those cleavers, like he said, the Red Hoods, and there were so many of them, and there were people in robes, and— Skullduggery tilted his head. What happened, Mr. Signet? I'm— I'm not a fighter. I'm not a soldier. 
There was nothing I could do. I ran to an injured cleaver, one of ours, the only one I could get to, and I shunted us both back here. The cleaver's being tended to in the medical wing, said Shanna. I think we can assume the rest have been killed. What about Ravel? Valkyrie asked, like it was the only question that mattered. I saw him, said Signet. Only for a moment, but I saw him. He was running. He may have got away in all the confusion. I'm sorry, I just don't know. China looked at Skullduggery. Well? We need him back, Skullduggery said. The one constant when it comes to Darkus has been her insistence that Ravel be punished. Tanith frowned. Punished? Shunting him out of her clutches has undoubtedly got her attention. But if we want to draw her in, we need him here. More than that, China said. Darkus has a tendency to develop new abilities at a frightening rate. If she learns how to shunt, and she goes after Ravel, if she finds him before we do, we've lost our only chance to predict where she'll be. We need to go, Skullduggery said. Now. I agree, said China. But you have to realize that Mevelin is now aware of our incursion, and he may very well be expecting another visit. If I order... You don't have to order it, Skullduggery said. I volunteer. Me too, said Valkyrie. Then she hesitated. Well, if... Skullduggery looked at her. If what? If you want me. There's probably not a whole lot I'd be able to do. He looked back at China. Then we both volunteer. But as two, no more. A larger group would be easier to detect. China nodded. Agreed. Mr. Signate, you will shunt my detectives over, and you will facilitate their return trip. Skullduggery? Valkyrie? I would like to tell you to take an hour to prepare, but time is of the essence. If Ravel is on foot, you need to start tracking him down immediately. If Mavalon's forces have taken him, you'll need to get him back. Skullduggery nodded. We leave in five minutes. Valkyrie hurried over to Tanith. What the hell is going on? Tanith asked when they were out in the corridor again. Mavalent? He's dead. Our Mavalent is dead, said Valkyrie. But about a year ago we shunted into an alternate reality where he's very much alive and pretty much ruling the world. And you're going back there? And what's this about Ravel? Why does Darkus want to punish him? Valkyrie hesitated. What is it? Tanith asked. You're holding something back. Something bad. But we don't have time for any of that any more. We have minutes before you leave. So just tell me what this terrible thing is that's happened and get it over with. Whatever it was, Tanith's anger wasn't going to bring it to the surface any quicker. Valkyrie licked her lips. They told me you tried Ghastly's place before you came here. I did. He wasn't in. No, Valkyrie said quietly. He wasn't. 49. Stopping for gas. Amazingly, Danny falls asleep. It isn't easy. The Cadillac trunk is smaller than it looks, and it's cold and uncomfortable, and every bump on the road jars his injured shoulder. But after an hour or so, he closes his eyes and only opens them again when the car slows to a crawl. He checks his watch in the red glow of the taillights. He's been asleep for nearly two hours. The car stops, and he can hear muffled voices, and then car doors opening and closing. He stays very quiet, tracking one set of footsteps as they lumber away, and another as they get closer. There's a loud rattle, and for a moment he doesn't know what it is. Then metal bangs lightly against metal, and he knows even before the gurgle and splash sounds that they're at the pumps of a gas station. There's a knock on the lid of the trunk. You doing okay in there, Danny, my boy? Danny frowns. He sincerely doesn't know how to answer that. Danny? Gant says again. You okay? I'm fine, Danny calls. He realizes how loud his voice sounds. It takes a moment for the most obvious plan in the world to occur to him, and he starts shouting, Help! Somebody help me! I'm trapped in here! Call 911! He hears Gans chuckle. That's the spirit. 
How are the legs? Pretty cramped, I would imagine. And the bladder? I don't know about you, Danny, but long journeys tend to put a squeeze on things, if you know what I mean. If you want to use the restroom, just let me know. I want to, Danny says at once. You sure? You wouldn't be saying that in a bold attempt to be let out of the trunk and make your escape now, would you? I need to go, says Danny. This isn't a lie. He suddenly becomes aware of the pressure that has built up. The gurgling stops, and the trunk clicks and lifts. It's night, and the gas station's lights fill Danny's eyes, and he gropes blindly about as he sits up. He feels Gant's long, strong fingers at the ropes that bind him. Then they loosen and fall away. Gant helps him clamber awkwardly out of the trunk. Once out, he stays bent over, rubbing his legs to get some feeling back into them. Gant goes back to filling the car. The road is unlit, but the gas station is of a more than modest size. There's another car at the pumps, a station wagon, and two more in the parking slots. That means people. That means a way out. Danny straightens up. Go use the restroom and then come back, Gant says. No dilly-dallying. Danny nods and limps stiffly across the forecourt. His left shoulder isn't as badly injured as he had feared. It hurts like hell and he can barely move it, but the pain has lessened considerably. His leg, though, has improved a lot. He keeps his limp, keeps up the act, but by the time he pushes open the door and enters the gas station, he's fairly confident he could break into a run if he has to. First place he looks is the counter. Jeremiah Wallow stands there, stuffing a Twinkie into his mouth as he waits for the attendant to come out of the back room. Jeremiah catches Danny's eye, puts a finger to his cream-covered lips. Danny goes to the men's room. There are two urinals and one stall, and the stall is empty. The window is too high to get to, and too small to squeeze through. Danny relieves himself, then goes back to the door, peeks out, and steps into the ladies' room across the way. It, too, is empty. Where the hell is everybody? He goes to the door. How long will Jeremiah wait until he comes looking? Will he come alone, or will he call for Gant? He'll probably come alone. He'll wander down, thump his fist against the door of the men's room, tell Danny to hurry up, and then Danny can spring at him, knock him out with... What exactly? Danny doesn't have a weapon. He's seen a heap of old TV shows where people were knocked out by a swift chop to the back of the head, but he doubts he'll be able to do that. What then? Would he charge? Tackle Jeremiah? Bring him to the ground? What if Jeremiah gets on top? He outweighs Danny by maybe eighty pounds, and Danny has never been much of a wrestler. No. The more he thinks about it, the less and less it seems like a good idea to choose this place as a battleground. Taking a breath... Danny limps out of the restroom as calmly as he is able. You took your time, Jeremiah says from the counter. I'm hungry, says Danny. Jeremiah shrugs. Grab yourself something to eat then, but I'm not paying for it. Danny scans the shelves of quarts of oil and wiper fluid. Nothing sharp, nothing heavy, nothing that can be used as a weapon. He follows the aisle to the sandwiches and picks two, carries them to the counter. Jeremiah is licking cream from his mustache. How's that trunk working out for you? he asks, grinning. It's cold, Danny says. Where are we going? Mr. Gant's house. Is it far? Far enough. How long will I have to stay in that trunk? Jeremiah shrugs. We might be there by morning. We might not. From here on out we travel by back roads. Things are going to get a sight bumpier for you. Danny puts the sandwiches on the counter beside the till. Jeremiah, can I ask you a question? Who are you? Why are you doing this? Why are you so interested in Stephanie? That was three questions, Jeremiah says. Four, if you count the asking of the first question as a question. I'll answer one of them. Which one you want answered most? Danny hesitates. Why are you so interested in Stephanie? Because she's special. 
She's not like you regular people. She's special like I'm special, and Mr. Gant is special. Special people are littered through this world, and some of them are nice, and some of them are nasty. Mr. Gant and I, we are unashamedly nasty. And it's our job to find the nice special people, like Stephanie, and pluck them from this earth like you'd pluck a flower from a garden. What makes you special? Jeremiah's tongue finds that last dollop of sugared cream on his whiskers, and he sucks it in between his soft, pink lips. Everything, he says. Danny looks at him, and the stillness of their surroundings suddenly veer from strange to unnatural. Where is everyone? Jeremiah looks back at him innocently. Everyone? The people who work here, says Danny. The people who own those cars outside. Jeremiah's head twitches towards the back room. They're all in there, he says. Says it like it's nothing. Says it like it isn't even something worth saying. Moving slowly, Danny steps round Jeremiah and limps behind the counter. Jeremiah doesn't try to stop him. His mouth dry, Danny puts one foot into the back room glimpses the bodies stacked in the corner, and immediately steps back. She's following us, Jeremiah says, eating one of the sandwiches Danny has left on the counter. Mr. Gant has seen that pickup of hers, way back in the distance. Mr. Gant talks about fishing sometimes. He says this is like reeling in a fish once it's hooked. You bring it closer and closer until it's out of the water and flapping around on the deck of your boat. Of course, in this case, she doesn't even know she's got a great big hook in her mouth. That just makes it funnier. There's a loud honk from outside. Gant getting impatient. Jeremiah takes his gun from his pocket, points it at Danny's belly. Time to go. Want to take your other sandwich? I'm not hungry anymore, Danny says, his voice quiet. Jeremiah gives another little shrug. Suit yourself. Back in the trunk for you. Fifty. The Car Trick Darka stood in the rain until she was nice and wet. Levitt was watching her. She liked Levitt. He was a quiet man even when he had a remnant inside him. She appreciated the fact that he never spoke. The ability to shut up was something she respected in a man. When she was wet enough, she walked up and knocked on the door. Knocking on the door was nice. She could have smashed through it. She could have made it disappear. She could have turned it into a million bubbles. But she knocked, and she waited, and it was nice. Movement, sounds, a latch being lifted. The door opened and a man in his early thirties stood there, a pleasant expression on his face. Argedian. Hi, said Darkus. I'm so very sorry for disturbing you, but my car broke down and I don't have my phone with me. Could I possibly use your phone to call home? Of course, Argedian said, stepping to one side. Come on in. The phone's on the table there. Darkus gave him a grateful smile and hurried over to the phone. She started dialing a non-existent number as he left her alone in the hall. Hi, Mum, she said. Car's broken down. Yeah, I know you did, and you were right. Could you come and pick me up? I'm at a house opposite the park entrance. You know, the one with the big iron gate? No, it's fine. His name is... She took a step sideways peering into the kitchen. Excuse me, could I have your name? Argedian came back, smiled as he handed her a towel. I'm Michael Tolan. She took her towel, started drying her hair one-handed. His name's Michael Tolan. No, ma'am, he's normal. He's not scary. Argedian chuckled. I'm a teacher, not a serial killer. Hear that, ma'am? A teacher. Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. Okay, thank you. Love you. Bye. Bye, bye, bye. Bye, bye. She put the phone down. Thank you so much.
She'd be here in ten minutes. You can ride in here if you want. Oh, no, I couldn't. I'll wait in my car. It's lashing out, he said. And I've put the kettle on? Well, said Darkus, a cup of tea sounds nice. He smiled, and she followed him into the kitchen. Excuse the mess, he said when he poured the boiling water into a mug. I've just moved into the area, and I'm not used to visitors. She sat at the table. How long have you been a teacher? He laughed. Too long. But I just started at St. James last September. And how do you find it? It's a great school. Did you go there? No, but a lot of my friends did. He handed her a mug of tea. Thank you, Mr. Tolan. Outside the classroom, people call me Michael. She smiled. Thank you, Michael. You don't look like a teacher. No, he said, leaning against the cooker. What do I look like? I don't know. A doctor? Or a scientist? I must look intelligent. Or a... Magician, maybe? Wow! Well, that's new. I look like a magician. Darkus shrugged and sipped her tea. Magicians come in all shapes and sizes. I suppose you're right. Ever tried doing magic? He shook his head, amused. Not that I can recall. You're missing out. Oh, really? You sound like you know what you're talking about. Can you do tricks? Illusions, Michael. I can do some. Do you have a deck of cards handy? I should have, said Argedian, looking around. I remember unpacking them here, putting them... She watched him search through a few drawers. Finally, he uttered a small cry of triumph and came back to her with a box of playing cards, still in its clear plastic wrapping. Perfect, she said, taking it from him. He sat down as Darkus peeled off the plastic, her favourite part, and opened the box, sliding the cards into her hand. She shuffled them thoroughly and fanned them out. Pick a card, she said. Any card. Argedian drew one from the pack, glanced at it, and kept it close to his chest. Darkus shuffled the pack again, then laid them face down on the table and splayed them with one gentle sweep of her hand. That was a brand new pack? she asked. It was, he said. You bought it? You put it in that drawer? Yes. There is no possible way for me to have interfered with that pack? None whatsoever. Please hold up your card. Argedian did so. The seven of clubs, she said. So if every single one of the cards in this table turns out to be the seven of clubs, you'd have to be pretty impressed, wouldn't you? He laughed. I suppose I would. Grinning, she swept the splayed cards right side up. Um, said Agedian, I don't think it worked. Darkus looked at the perfectly ordinary pack of cards before her. Oh, that's right, she said. I hate card tricks. There's something else. She clicked her fingers, and every one of Argedian's fingers on his right hand snapped backwards. The seven of clubs fluttered to the floor as he fell out of his chair, screaming. She went to the window, waved, and a moment later the front door was kicked open and Levitt walked in. Darkus didn't bother with words. She took hold of the back of Argedian's shirt and grabbed a handful of his hair. She turned towards Levitt and pulled his head back. He tried struggling, but he was no match for her. Levitt's throat bulged as the remnant climbed out. Levitt himself collapsed, and the remnant flitted across the space between them and latched onto Argedian's face. Within seconds, it was forcing its way down his throat. She released him, and he fell to his knees, the screams replaced by gagging. Another moment, and even the gagging was forgotten. She returned Levitt to his essence while she waited, just for something to do. Argedian rose, black veins running across his face. Interesting, he said. How much can you remember? Darkus asked. He frowned. I remember everything as Michael Tolan. These false memories they implanted... False experiences. They're really very good. How about your memories as Argedian? They're hidden. Obstructed. But I can... 
I can get through them if I... His eyes widened suddenly, and he smiled. There, he breathed. There. Darkus gave it as long as she possibly could, and then she grabbed him, rammed her hand into his mouth, and forced it down his throat. Arcadian struggled. He wasn't strong yet, but she could feel his power returning to him. It wouldn't be long now. She drew the remnant into her hand, closed her fingers round it, and yanked it out. It squirmed and squealed in her grip, and Argedion collapsed, his throat in ruins and his jaw smashed. Darkus opened wide, forced the remnant into her own mouth. She swallowed, feeling its little claws ripping her insides to shreds. She smiled, healing everything instantly. The remnant struggled inside her, tried to escape, but she kept it where it was. After a few moments, its natural processes took over and she felt it try to slink into her mind. Instead, she pulled it in, isolated it, extracted its memories. When she was done, she burned it, fed on its power. So many memories, it would take time to sort through them. Luckily, Darkus had plenty of experience with this. In some ways, it was a lot like Valkyrie absorbing the reflections experiences back in the old days. She was brought back to the present by Argedion getting to his feet. His power was returning. She could see it. Within moments, he would remember how to heal himself. She poured her magic out through her eyes. A beam of energy, no thicker than a pencil, burrowed through Argedion's heart. He stepped back, then fell. She watched his life leave him. Watched his essence rejoin the great stream, as the necromancers call it, a stream that would soon be bursting its banks. 51. The Temple of the Spider Crayfon's signate flickered and disappeared, leaving Valkyrie and Skullduggery alone to creep through the darkness. Red Hood stood guard, surrounding the remains of this dimension sanctuary. Their sides looked every bit as nasty as the cleavers back home, but somehow their red uniforms were even more unsettling than the grey. Grey was the colour of neutrality. Red was the colour of violent, passionate intent. Can't see any survivors, Valkyrie whispered. I count seven dead cleavers, three dead sorcerers, no sign of Ravel. If they caught him, he's either dead or already on his way to Mevolent, said Skullduggery. Come on. Staying low, they moved away, seeking refuge in the night's darkness. What do you think Mevelin will do to him? Valkyrie asked. Torture, Skullduggery said. But after what Ravel's been through, mere torture would be a blessing. He'll be interrogated. He'll eventually tell Mevelin everything he wants to know about our reality. And if Mevelin has a shunter on staff, and there's no reason to think he doesn't, that could spell trouble for us. You think Mevelin would invade? Possibly. The last time he received a visitor from our dimension, it was Darkus, and she proved to be quite a threat. Mevelin's not the type to sit around and wait for trouble to strike. And what if they didn't catch Ravel? Valkyrie asked. How do we find him then? He knows about this place. He's read the reports. He knows the layout of the city and how to get in. You think that's where he's going? He fought against Mevelin his whole life. But take the worship of the Faceless Ones out of the equation, and what do you have? What ties Mevelin and Ravel together? They both want sorcerers to rule over the mortals. Skullduggery nodded. The city's the place for him. Certainly somewhere to find like-minded individuals, if nothing else. Besides, he knows we'll be coming after him. The city's the best place to hide. If he went there of his own free will, we'd grab him, slap him around, and drag him back. If he was brought there as a prisoner, we rescue him. Then slap him around and drag him back. Okay, said Valkyrie, and wrapped her arm around him. He looked at her. Uh, she blinked. What? We're flying there, aren't we? Not with the Red Hoods and the Sense Wardens on high alert. 
We'll be walking. It's safer. Oh, she said, and took her arm back. If you want to hug me, you just have to ask, he said. Shut up. It's sweet, actually. Shut up. They started walking. When Valkyrie got too tired, Skullduggery carried her, and she slept with her head against his chest. He was an unsurprisingly smooth walker. She only woke on the few occasions he had to hurry behind cover as a barge passed overhead, or dodge behind a tree to avoid someone on the road. The sun came up, and he let her down, and they walked together. Sometimes they talked, other times they didn't. The silence that would accompany them was comfortable and easy. They got to Dublin within the wall a little before midday. The wall that surrounded the city was gigantic, even by Roarhaven standards. They watched mortals in ragged brown clothes bring carts of goods in and out through the massive gates. If he came here himself, said Valkyrie, that's how he got in. He did come here himself, Skullduggery said. We crossed his tracks a few times on our way here. You're sure it was him? Skullduggery nodded. His shoes are standard issue prison wear. They leave a mark like no other. He was right in front of us. So if we'd just been faster, we would have caught up with him. Maybe, said Skullduggery. Or maybe we'd have overshot and alerted him to our presence and lost our chance forever. We did the right thing. We took our time and we made sure. He's ahead of us. And I think you're right. I think he's already in the city. So how do we get in? Skullduggery didn't answer. He just led her away from the gates. When they were out of sight of even the sharpest of eyes, they approached the wall itself. Okay, Skullduggery said. You can hug me now. She scowled at him. We're going to fly over the top? Not quite. Come, hug. Valkyrie sighed, and they hugged, and they leaned against the wall. And the wall cracked and crumbled, and they moved into it, into the cold and the dark and the dirt and the stone and the pebbles, and they were turning, revolving, the whole world rumbling, and then light burst through the darkness, and they were out the other side, Valkyrie coughing and staggering and gasping. Since when can you do that? What do you mean? Skullduggery asked, using the air to brush the dust from his suit. We've done that before, when we were going to get the Hessian grimoire from— Oh— that wasn't me, said Valkyrie. That was Stephanie. Yes, it would appear so. Awkward. Indeed it is. Let's skip by it. What do you say? So, yes, I can walk through walls now. I can't do it as well as Sanguine, and there are some materials I just can't pass through at all. But it's a neat little trick when you're in a tight spot. You're full of surprises, aren't you? He shrugged. To some people, that may have been a modest gesture, but to Valkyrie, it was a shrug that said, Yes, yes, I am. She had to smile. So where to now? If Ravel's in here, where would he go? The first thing he'd do is look up old friends, Skullduggery said. The last time we were here, we passed a peculiar church. Do you remember it? Everything here is peculiar. A faceless one's church? No which makes it peculiar. Come on, we'll have to stick to the back streets, and I think I know the way. He'd only been here once before, and already he was talking about shortcuts, but Valkyrie didn't argue. If Skullduggery thought he knew something, he generally did. They walked for almost two hours. Skullduggery's facade was used only when absolutely necessary, but even so it was close to failing when they got to where they were going. The church was nothing compared to Mevelin's palace, or to the Faceless One's churches, or even the sanctuary in Roarhaven, but it was bigger and more impressive than any place of worship Valkyrie had ever seen back home. She frowned at the iconography built into the structure. The children of the spider, she said. They have their own church? Apparently so, Skullduggery responded. And if Ravel has gone anywhere for refuge, it's here. He planned the takeover of Roarhaven with them. It makes sense he'd seek them out in this reality. He checked the street, made sure there was no city maids' patrols, and they hurried through the open doors. Immediately upon entering, 
they saw a cage suspended by chains. Within that cage, an old man with a long gray beard and long gray hair was forced to crouch, an old man Valkyrie knew as the Torment. Skullduggery's facade failed in that instant, and it flowed back off his skull. The Torment peered at him through narrowed eyes. Skeleton, he said. I'd heard your bones had turned to dust decades ago, and you were carried away on a stiff breeze. Unless you're another unfortunate who has had his flesh stripped from his body. No, Skullduggery said. Same unfortunate, I'm afraid. The torment shifted his attention to Valkyrie, his frown deepening and his lip curling beneath all that hair. And what exactly are you? She sighed. Save your disgust, okay? I've heard it before. You don't like me because I have the blood of the ancients in my veins. And I don't like you because you're old and nasty and creepy and you stole Gandalf's beard. I don't know who this Gandalf is, but that is not why you disgust me, you insolent little... Valkyrie jabbed her finger at him. No insults. You hear me? I'm not in the mood and we don't have the time. By the looks of it, You've been in that cage for a while now, and people in cages probably don't get many opportunities to chat to people who aren't in cages. So embrace this chance while you can, you miserable old goat. What my friend is trying to ask, Skullduggery said, diverting the attention back to him, is why are you in a cage? This is a temple of the spider. Surely this is your home. The torment sat cross-legged and didn't answer. Maybe this is a self-punishment thing, Valkyrie said. But instead of, like, whipping yourself or wearing one of those shirts made of hair, whatever they're called. Hair shorts, Skullduggery said. Maybe instead of doing that, he locks himself in a cage so that more people can see how he's suffering. He probably thinks he's being really dramatic and noble. I don't think that's it. But this cage isn't even bound. It wouldn't stop magic from being used. The torment sneered. My magic, as you put it, is to grow into a beautiful spider that would dwarf the likes of you. This cage stops me from growing. It does its job. I'm sure it does. Skullduggery took a step closer. We're looking for a friend of ours, who might have come through here a few hours ago. The man Ravel, said Torment. Yes, he was here. He seemed surprised when the others found him. I do not think it was what he was expecting. Where is he? They took him away. They're deciding what to do with him now. They'll argue and debate, but eventually they'll do what they always do. Bring him to Mevelin like the spineless, gutless whelps they are. Skullduggery tilted his head. That's why you're in here. He said, you wouldn't bend the knee. Mavelin worships the faceless ones, the torment said. In order to ensure their own survival, the children of the spider have taken to worshipping them as well. I stood against it, as did Madame Mist and a handful of others. But our own brothers and sisters betrayed us. I was the only one left alive after the purge, such as it was. And now, here I sit, another of Mevelin's trophies. Valkyrie remembered the lifeless body of Mr. Bliss floating in that tank in Mevelin's palace. He did seem to have a thing about displaying his enemies for all to see. We need to get Ravel back, Skullduggery said. Where's he being held? The torment uttered a sound that may have been a cough or a laugh. Why would I help you, skeleton? You're a dead thing who should have given up any claim to life a long time ago. And the girl, even she doesn't know what an abomination she really is. In your reality and ours, Valkyrie said, you're still a gigantic asshat. If you help us, Skullduggery said, you'll be hurting Mevelin. You'll be hurting all those people who betrayed you. That's worth something, isn't it, to that? withered little heart of yours. Even here, 
trapped in a cage, you can still manage to slip the knife in and give it a fun little twist. Or I could ignore you, said the torment, and by ignoring you, hit you. At least then I'll be able to see the frustration on the face of the abomination. Please call her Valkyrie. I'll never hear the end of it if you keep calling her the other thing. And you're absolutely right. By not helping us, you'll be able to see with your own eyes the frustration that results. But we haven't hurt you, have we? We may offend your delicate sensibilities, but we have never, and I can say this with absolute certainty, we have never acted against you. But, Mavalent, those children of the spider, they are directly responsible for your imprisonment. They are directly responsible for the death of Madame Mist. And this is your chance, finally and at long last, to strike back, in whatever small and meagre fashion it may be. You can't tell me that wouldn't be far more satisfying than causing us this trifling little moment of annoyance. You talk a lot, Skullduggery nodded. That has been said. The torment settled back. Just when Valkyrie thought he wasn't going to utter another word, he spoke. He was here, your friend. He saw me caged, talked to me like he knew me. Before he said too much, he was taken away. The terror likes to make regular offerings to his lord and master, Mevolent. I expect your friend will be one such offering before long. So he hasn't been handed over yet? As far as I'm aware, he is still being held in the confessional, in the uppermost tower. If you are considering a rescue attempt, I wholeheartedly endorse such an idea, as it will surely get you both killed. Do you have a better idea? No, and nor do I feel the need to supply one. Time, however, is not on your side. The hour is almost upon us when Baron Vengeus pays the temple a visit. Valkyrie frowned. Vengeus is dead. The last time I was here, I saw Anton Shudder kill him. The torment curled his lip behind his beard. Death means little to Mevelin's generals, though I admit Vengeance is not the man he once was. That pool of Mevelin's, the one he bathes in daily, has properties as strange as they are, unnatural. Baron Vengeance is a man transformed, and when he arrives, your friend will undoubtedly be passed into his custody. Well then, Skullduggery said. We'll have to endeavour not to be here when he shows up. Top of the stairs, you say? Skullduggery didn't wait around for an answer. Valkyrie shot another glare at the torment, then followed Skullduggery through the archway. They passed three children of the spider. Valkyrie tensed, ready to fight. But Skullduggery just walked by, acting like he owned the place. It was one of his favourite tricks, and it usually worked. Nobody likes to bother someone who looks busy. Not even a walking skeleton. They got to a vast hall housing the stairs, the sight of which made Valkyrie start. The base of the staircase was ridiculously wide, but then it split into narrower tributaries at the second floor, tributaries that curled and spiraled and split again and again and got narrower and narrower as they rose, crisscrossing into the gloom overhead. Supporting pillars of varying thicknesses stood like impossibly tall trees, so tall their tops could not be seen from where Valkyrie stood. Skullduggery slipped through the forest of pillars like this was something he saw every day. Valkyrie trailed after him, seemingly unable to close her mouth, and the only thought in her head was a fervent wish that the children of the spider had been wise enough to install elevators. Skullduggery stopped walking and looked straight ahead. From this position they had an unobstructed view of the ceiling high above. Valkyrie stepped close, and his arm encircled her waist. They lifted off the ground, flew upwards, eliciting a few startled cries from people who blurred by too quickly to see. They reached the top 
and landed behind a man with unusually large hair, probably a new craze sweeping Dublin within the wall. He turned, and Skullduggery hit him, and he bounced off the ground and lay still. They hurried down a corridor that narrowed the further they got. Another guard was stationed ahead of them. They walked right up to him, and just as he was about to deny them entry, Skullduggery punched him. This one didn't go down as easily, so Skullduggery smashed his head against the wall. They moved on to a junction, heard a cry of pain, and a moment later, Erskine Ravel ran round the corner. He saw them, and his eyes widened. He raised his hand, but Skullduggery was already splaying his. Ravel flew backwards, tumbled and got up, staring straight into Skullduggery's gun. He froze. Valkyrie checked round the corner. Three people lay unconscious. Beyond them was an open door and another unconscious person. A pair of shackles lay on the floor nearby. Why? Ravel asked. Why did you come? Why bother? You could leave me. Why don't you? You can just walk away. And it's not like I'll have a happy life here. I'm probably going to be caught again, taken to Mevelin, tortured until I die. That's the thing about Darkus's punishment. The agony was exceptional, but I was never going to die from it. Mevelin's way seems a lot fairer. You think we'd let you off that easily? After what you've done? asked Skullduggery. You deserve a lifetime of agony, Valkyrie said, rejoining them. I thought I did, Ravel said. But what Darkus did to me, that's what we'd label cruel and unusual. I can't go back to that. I just can't. You have no idea what it was like. You have no idea what something like that does to you. I'm exhausted. I need to recover. I need to get strong again. You need to put those shackles back on and come with us, Skullduggery said. No, Ravel said, almost shouting, before visibly calming himself. No, you're not taking me back. Darkus will find me and it'll start all over again. Skullduggery thumbed back the hammer of his gun. This is not a negotiation. Ravel offered a wan smile. You won't shoot me. Will you need me alive? I'll settle for wounded. Go ahead, wound me. Hope the wound slows me down but doesn't bleed me dry. Hope it makes me more cooperative and not more stubborn. Skullduggery didn't respond for a moment, and then he gave a shrug. Very well, he said, passing his hat and his gun to Valkyrie. Hold these. Ravel chuckled softly as Skullduggery stepped towards him and flexed his fingers, readying his magic. Before he could raise his hands, however, the door opened beside him, and four unsuspecting children of the spider walked out. Alarm swept over their faces, and Ravel lunged at one, and Skullduggery dived at another. Ravel was still recovering from Darkus's punishment, so the dismantling of his opponents wasn't as precise or as polished as Skullduggery's, but it was impressive nonetheless. Valkyrie had seen Skullduggery fight like this before, alongside Ghastly or any of the other dead men, giving battle with the absolute assurance that the person by his side was doing his job. The children of the spider didn't have time to even cry for help. Fist collided with chin, and elbow smashed into jaw, and forehead met nose, and in moments Skullduggery and Ravel were standing over four unconscious, broken bodies. "'You're going to need my help getting out of this city.' Ravel said. I came here looking for assistance. It's obvious I'm not going to get it. So I need to escape too. And when we're out of here, Skullduggery said, you'll surrender? Not a chance. But we can have that argument once we're clear. From somewhere close, running footsteps. A whole lot of running footsteps. Come on, Skullduggery said, turning to the window. He flicked his hands and the glass exploded outwards, and then all three ran forward and jumped. Air rushed. It brought Valkyrie to Skullduggery's side. She hung on. The street hurtled towards them. No red hoods gathered below. Not yet. They slowed, following Ravel's trajectory, and landed at the same time. Get to the back streets, Skullduggery instructed. Get under cover as fast as... 
he stopped talking. Valkyrie glanced at Skullduggery, then at Ravel, noticed how pale he'd become. Then she saw what they were looking at. Three men, walking up the street towards them. Baron Ventus, Lord Vile, and Mevolent. 52. The Devil Comes to Play The world got very quiet all of a sudden. Baron Vengeus wore his grey hair short and his grey beard tight. His uniform was spotless and his boots were polished, his sabre still in its scabbard at his belt. All of this Valkyrie expected. She did not expect his skin to be so pale as to be almost blue. His face, usually so stern, so filled with anger, was slack, lifeless. Anton Shudder had, it seemed, killed him, but Mevolent had not let him rest. Lord Vile's black armor twisted lazily around him, savoring the calm before the storm. Between his two generals, and taller than either of them, Mevolent wore his battle suit of grey chain mail and black leather. His tattered cloak, covered as it was with sigils, caught the breeze as he walked. The hood was drawn. His face, that gaunt, nicotine-yellow face, was hidden behind his metal helmet's screaming visage. Shadows curled round Vile, and he disappeared into them. At that same instant, he stepped out of the swirling shadows right in front of Skullduggery. They stood there, looking at each other. You'd think we'd have a lot to talk about, you and I, said Skullduggery. Vile didn't answer, so Skullduggery continued. You'd think we'd have questions that needed answering, but I don't. All I need to know is that you are still here. You didn't fight it, like you should have. You weren't strong enough to control it. Vile's armor grew spikes. I've done terrible things. Skullduggery said. Things I will never make right. But there's one thing I know. There's one thing of which I'm certain. I'm a better man than you. Shadows crashed into Skullduggery and sent him flying. Ravel snapped his palms against the air, but Vile was already moving. In a blur of shadow, he battered down Ravel's arms and took his legs from under him. Before Ravel could recover, the shadows grabbed him and threw him. Ravel rolled to his feet, but now Vengeus was behind him. That slack face didn't change its expression as he wrapped his arm round Ravel's throat. Ravel was lifted off the ground. The choke came on instantly. A few seconds later, he collapsed. Valkyrie stood motionless. Her shock stick was still on her back. Vile was watching her, waiting for her to make a move. For all he knew, she was darkers, ready to tear the city down. One slight twitch on her part would probably lead him to lashing out, killing her in an instant. She left the stick where it was. And then, from the street to the west, a siren. Vile and Vengeance looked round. With that particular slow confidence that characterizes the most powerful player on any field, Darkus came walking. Vile looked at Valkyrie, quickly deciding she was not the threat he thought she was. He rejoined Mevolent and Vengeus, and the siren cut off. Darkus gave them all a smile and pointed at Ravel, who was doing his best to get to his feet. I just want him, she said loudly. I learned how to shunt and came all this way simply to make sure he didn't run off. Hand him over. You can do what you want with the others. Vile and Vengeus remained silent. Only Mevolent spoke. I've been waiting for you. Darkus laughed. I bet you've thought about nothing else. But I'm not here for a rematch. You don't interest me. None of you do. Only him. Only Ravel. Mevelyn turned to observe Ravel for a moment. He doesn't appear to be that special. Oh, but he has sentimental value, said Darkus. I won't bore you with the details. 
I don't have much sentiment left, to be honest. But he has earned a special place in my heart. Give him to me and I'll let you live. As if by a silent command, red hoods melted from doorways and alleys, surrounding Darkus. She shook her head as she rose into the air. You do not want to test me, Mevalent. I have punishments to deliver. Valkyrie became aware of Skullduggery standing at her elbow. They watched as Alexander Remit teleported in, passed Mevalent a brown metal gun, and vanished again. It was the size of a shotgun, but thicker, like a rocket launcher. Glowing sigils ran around its circumference. Mevalent's right hand curled round the grip. The mouth of the barrel was open and jagged, like the thing had teeth. Darkus surrounded herself with a bubble of energy as she hovered there. You're not going to hurt me with toys, she said. A single beam of green light burst from the gun, sliced straight through the energy shield, and hit Darkus square in the chest. The bubble vanished, and Darkus dropped. She landed on her feet, staggered a little, then straightened up and laughed. That's it? That barely tingled. Then a cleaver hit her from behind, and she went stumbling to the ground. Valkyrie's eyes widened. A kick came in that snapped Darkus's head back. She sprawled, got up, the confusion vanishing from her face as anger swarmed in. She grabbed the nearest red hood and tore him apart. A scythe came for her, and she caught its blade in her hand and snapped it, then took out its wielder with an eye blast. Mevalent fired again, the beam hitting Darkus in the side just as she waved her hand. A scythe flashed and took her fingers. Darkus screamed, clutching her hand, too shocked by the sight of her spurting blood to do anything about it. The red hood whirled, taking her legs out from under her. She hit the ground and tried to scramble away. Her jacket bunched up, exposing her back, and the red hood impaled his blade in her flesh. Her scream was cut off. Her mouth was open, but no sound came out. Pain danced in her wide eyes. And then, as if the pain had only been an act, her eyes narrowed and the terror washed away. Black flames consumed the red hood and burned him from existence. She stood, pulled out the scythe, and dropped it with one hand even as her fingers grew back on the other. The other red hoods closed in. She swept her arms wide and they exploded into nothing. Then she fixed her glare on Mevalent. She dived into the air and flew at him, but he caught her again with that dazzling green light and she fell into the street. Lord Vile shadow walked to her side. She sprang up, waved her hand, but nothing happened. Tendrils of darkness lashed at her face, drawing blood and cries of pain. She ran, slipping and sliding away from the shadows. She didn't even see Baron Vengeance waiting for her. He ran her through with his cutlass, finding the space between her jacket and waistband. And Darkus gasped, gagged, fell sideways, sliding off the blade. Her strength returned, and she swung wildly. But Vengeance was already calmly stepping away. She got up, healing her injuries. But instead of attacking, she stayed where she was, looking from Vengeance to Vile to Mevalent. Her face was tight with anger, but tempered with something else. The realization that she was not going to win this. She started to flicker, slowly at first and then faster. The gun in Mevelin's hands was getting ready to fire again, but before he could aim, she straightened up, looked over at Valkyrie and gave her a shrug, and then she shunted. Mevelin lowered the weapon. Hands seized Valkyrie from behind. Skullduggery tried to fight, but there were too many red hoods. She glimpsed Ravel being thrown to the ground and shackled, and then someone hit her and the world spun. Her knees gave out, but she wasn't allowed to fall. Baron Vengeance came into view. From this close, he looked like a corpse. Take the skeleton and the elemental to the racks, he told someone. I want them screaming before the hour is up. And the girl? Vengeance barely glanced at her. Take it to Professor Nye. Tell it. It can do whatever it likes to her. 53. The End is Nigh. 
strapped to another damn table. This one was elevated so that Valkyrie was almost vertical. She couldn't see the mechanism that raised it to this position. She couldn't tell if it was magical or mechanical. It was silent, though, and smooth, the result of thought and effort and ingenuity. This was the work of someone who liked to get straight down to business. Professor Nye stooped low to get through the door of its laboratory. And once it was through, it unfurled to its full, gangly height. The surgical scrubs it wore were a deep red, and the leather apron was old and black. Like its counterpart in Valkyrie's dimension, it wore a surgical mask and cap, so that only its small yellow eyes were visible. Professor, its assistant said, hurrying to its side. Oh, we have a new patient, female, approximately eighteen years old, in good health. The assistant's name was Sivet. He had assisted Ken Speckle Grouse back in the reality Valkyrie knew, before the grotesquerie had killed him one lazy afternoon. He'd been a goofy guy. Here, he assisted a murderous sadist. I can see that, said Nye in that curious, high-pitched voice, pulling the clipboard from Sivet's hand. The only thing I can't see is why she's here. A Baron Vengeance sent her to us, Sivet said. She was with the living skeleton and another man. The Baron wants to know more about her. Nye leaned in, its long fingers tracing lightly down Valkyrie's arm. The jacket is armored, it said, almost in wonderment. I haven't seen quality like this in... I don't think I've ever seen quality like this. It moved to the cabinets, taking out trays of instruments. Remove her clothes, it said. I want every centimeter of this material examined. Sivet nodded, stepped forward, and Valkyrie glared. Touch me and die. Despite the manacles and the straps holding her down, Sivet faltered. Nye looked round, saw the distance between its lackey and Valkyrie, and pulled down its surgical mask in annoyance. Its skin was as pallid as the nigh that Valkyrie had known, but this one had not had its mouth sewn shut or its nose cut off, and so its ugliness was marginally less horrifying. She intimidates you? She's powerless, you cretin. She's tied down. What exactly is she threatening you with? She, uh... Appears easily agitated. And yet harsh words are the only things she can throw at you? Are you afraid of harsh words? No? Then remove her clothes before I remove your skin. Nye turned back to its trays of sharp bladed tools, and Sivet took one more hesitant step closer to Valkyrie. He reached out to unzip her jacket, and she bared her teeth. He thought better of putting his hands anywhere near her mouth, and dropped them to waist level, where he hesitated again. He glanced up, saw her glare, and looked away quickly. After another moment's hesitation, he knelt, one hand on her ankle. "'If I take the manacle from around your foot so I can get at your boot,' he said, "'are you going to kick me?' "'Without a doubt,' said Valkyrie. "'That's what I thought.' Sivet said miserably. Nye came back, shoving Sivet out of its way. Leave me, you buffoon. You can strip the clothes from her corpse, as that's all you're good for. Yes, Professor, Sivet said, bowing as he took his leave. Sorry, Professor. What are you going to do to me? Valkyrie asked. Poke you, said Nye. Prod you? Do unpleasant things. Why? Because I can, it said, reading the information on the clipboard. And it amuses me. And you're a curious creature. You are clearly mortal with no aptitude for magic, and yet... And yet what? Nye examined a nearby monitor. And yet there is something... The last time Valkyrie had been strapped to a table like this, 
She'd had an autopsy performed on her while she was still conscious. She doubted this nigh would be any gentler. She couldn't escape. She had no magic, and her shock stick was on a table across the room. The only thing she could do was delay the inevitable, offer up distractions. I'll save you some time, Valkyrie said. I found out my true name. My true name then took on a life of its own and was recently separated from me. Nye swiveled its head towards her. You offer this information freely? I want to know what I am even more than you do. You said there was something. What is it? Is it magic? Nye blinked a few times. I... I do not know. I, uh... Valkyrie sighed. I guess it's... okay. You're not used to people you experiment on asking questions. But I need this to happen. So buck up, bucko. I don't have a true name anymore. My magic has left me. Can I get it back? I've never heard of anyone being separated from their true name before, Nye said. It will take some time for me to come up with a hypothesis. And there, there are so many tests to run, and I, I don't, I don't think I can do this. Do what? It didn't answer. Do the tests? I can't work with you when you're like this, it blurted. To every one of my specimens, I am the last thing they see. Terror is what I am used to. Terror is what I like. I prefer my subjects to scream and beg, not to see results. I'll scream my questions, if that helps. It won't, it said sadly. I'll know you're only trying to make me feel better. Well then, it looks like you're in for an uncomfortable few hours, Professor. Unless, of course, you'd like to tell Mevolent you were unsuccessful. Nye's small eyes narrowed. Run your tests, said Valkyrie. When you're done and you have an answer for me, I'll behave. Elsewhere in Dublin within the wall, Skullduggery Pleasant and Erskine Ravel were being tortured. She knew this. She didn't give a damn about Ravel's discomfort but she was worried about Skullduggery. She just didn't think it was fair. He'd been tortured so much in the course of his lifetime, after all. That's how he died. Nefarian Serpine had tortured him for three days, using that red right hand of his, employing all manner of barbaric techniques and cruel instruments. Skullduggery had died screaming, looking into the face of the man who had killed his wife and child and now he was back on the torture table while Mevolent or Vengeous or even Vile took turns. Curious, Nye muttered. Valkyrie looked up. What is? You said you'd pretend to be unconscious. Well, now I'm pretending to wake up. What's curious? What? Nye sighed. It's merely a theory based upon the most rudimentary of tests already run, and I do not know how to explain it exactly. Please, said Valkyrie, use small words. Your magic is indeed gone. When your true name was taken from you, all your magic went with it. But my tests did pick up something, and that something led to a thought and that thought to an idea, to a theory, and lastly, to a hypothesis. Our true names act as our link to the source of all magic. This we know, and every sentient being has such a name, in theory. Only in theory? Magic is too vast a subject to be mastered. We view magic one way, from one perspective. Who are we to say that ours is the only perspective? Warlocks and witches are virtually extinct thanks to Mevelin's purges a hundred years ago. But they didn't follow our rules, and yet they had access to the source, and their access was arguably purer than our own. There could be a thousand different aspects to magic that we don't know about, that are invisible to us, that we will never know about. And what does this have to do with me? You do not have a true name. And yet there is, as I have said, something, 
or rather the complete lack of something, which is in itself rather something. I know you're trying to dumb it down for me, but I think you've gone a smidge too far. My tests show nothing, I said impatiently. Absolutely no trace of magic within you. Zero. Even in the most mundane mortal, there's a sliver of a trace. Not enough to ever activate or ever affect anything or be affected, but a sliver nonetheless. But within you, there is nothing. Sir Darkus took everything with her? Yes, but that's not important. The complete lack of magic may not necessarily indicate that there's no magic within you. It may instead indicate that there's something blocking you from magic. But since I don't have a true name, then you're an empty vessel, said Nye, almost excitedly. You are something unique, something I've never seen before. And like any empty vessel, you're just waiting to be filled. So how do I get filled? I don't know. As I said, all this is conjecture. I will know more after the autopsy. I'm sorry, said Valkyrie. The what? I've done all I can with your living body, said Nye. Once I've dissected you, I'll know more. I won't be much used to you dead. That's what every living person says. They're always wrong. But there have to be more tests you... This is why I do not like conversing with specimens on my table, said Nye, interrupting her. Arguments, discussions, appeals to my humanity. I am a Krengarian. I am not human. I will now cut you up into little pieces that I will weigh and catalogue. You only interest me from this point on as a collection of body parts. What about the soul? Valkyrie asked. The nigh in my reality was always looking for the soul. Don't you want to do that? Nigh leaned over her. The soul? I found where the soul resides four years ago. Rest assured, I'll be dissecting that also. Sivet came back in. He walked stiffly. He looked terrified. Professor? Nye turned to him. Yes? What is it? What do you... Sivet was shoved sideways into the wall, and a silenced pistol gripped by a red hand was aimed straight into Nye's startled face. Nye raised its hands. What? What is this? What does it look like, you ridiculous creature? Nefarian Serpine asked. It's a damn rescue. 54. The Deal In Valkyrie's reality, Emmett Peregrine was a teleporter who had been dead for years, killed by the Diablerie. In this reality, he was alive and well and waiting for them in the corridor outside Nye's laboratory. With her stick in one hand, Valkyrie grabbed his arm, and Serpine took hold of the other, and suddenly they were outside. Valkyrie stepped away from them both. They were in a small village. People hurried by. She could hear the sea. She could smell fish on the evening air. Peregrine disappeared, and Serpine turned to Valkyrie and smiled. Hello, Valkyrie. What do you want? That's all the thanks I get, he said. I just saved your life. A little gratitude would be nice. What do you want? Serpine didn't seem overly wary of the stick in her hand at all. Valkyrie, this may come as a shock to you, considering the history you've shared with both me and my counterpart from your dimension. But I'm not altogether a bad guy. I have my good moments. I have my redeeming features. In the time since you were last here, I've taken over as leader of the Resistance. Are you shocked? I don't care enough to be shocked. Not caring is a sign of shock. After China Sorrows was so tragically killed during Mevelin's attack on Resistance territory, I put myself forward for... You killed her. Eh? You killed China. You broke her neck. Serpine frowned. You saw that? Darkus did, said Valkyrie. 
which means I did. Ah, said Serpine. Well, it was a chaotic day. Lots of people did lots of things. It was very confusing. Who knows who did what? I know you killed China. Let's not get bogged down in specifics, he said, speaking quietly. Yes, I killed China. But in a more general sense, China was killed and I was nearby. That's just a lot softer to say, isn't it? It isn't nearly as spiky as I killed her. So let's stick with China was killed and I was nearby, and let's not tell anyone the rest. It'd just complicate matters. For you as well as me. And now here I am, striking a blow against tyranny by releasing you, Valkyrie Kane. You're welcome, by the way. Why? Because I am in need of you. Come, walk with me. No, said Valkyrie. He sighed. You're stubborn. Some people might find that admirable. I find it annoying. Valkyrie looked around. Are all these people sorcerers? Hm? Oh, no, he chuckled. Not at all. Look at them. What a sorry state we'd be in if they were. So this is a mortal village? Yes. It's the perfect hiding spot. There's enough depressing mundanity here to frighten off even the most ardent of sense wardens before they get too close. Isn't it dangerous? We can handle it. Not for you, she said, glaring. For them, the mortals. If Mebelin finds out your base is here, all these innocent people will be caught in the crossfire. Serpine nodded. So? So these are the people you're supposed to be protecting. Who told you that? It's not our job to protect them. Our job is to fight Mevolent. And if you beat him? When we beat him. What then? Are you going to rule over these people just like he did? Of course, said Serpine. What did you expect? You really think we'd let mortals run the world? Look at them. Watch them stumble and fumble, gaze into their dull eyes. Can you see even the faintest glimmer of intelligence? Mortals are not fit to run their own lives, Valkyrie, let alone the world. If you give them a chance... They don't want a chance. They need guidance. They need wisdom. The oldest mortal is still only a child compared to a sorcerer. Would you trust children to run your life? They're not children. You haven't heard your surge yet, have you? So you're as young as you look. And as such, you've probably still got sentimental attachments to a mortal family or friends. But you learn. You just need a few more years. Please, would you come with me? Valkyrie glowered. But she couldn't just stand in one place until she thought of something better to do. They walked up the road a little, to a tavern. You're not buying me a drink, she said. Serpine smiled. I can be quite charming when I put my mind to it, you know. You might even find yourself liking me. She didn't even bother responding to that, and he laughed. They walked into the tavern. Immediately the atmosphere was different. The people in here held themselves straighter than those outside. They were stronger, more alert. Sorcerers. A girl drifted over to them, pale, with a scar curling from the corner of her mouth. Valkyrie, said Serpine. You remember Harmony, don't you? Harmony is my assistant. Valkyrie, Harmony said. A pleasure to meet you again. Harmony used to tell me what to do, Serpine continued. She used to mock me. I think it's fair to say she didn't like me at all. Maybe she despised me as much as you do. Would that be fair, Harmony? Harmony glared at him. Serpine smiled. But that didn't stop her falling for my charms. Oh, it was an illicit affair, torrid even. She hated me, yet was drawn to me. Very passionate. I really don't need to hear this, Valkyrie said. And then the dearly departed China Sorrows ordered me to help you and your skeleton friend to sneak into the city, and Harmony feared she'd lost me. You feared that, didn't you, Harmony? You thought I'd be killed. But I returned. And it was China who died so, so tragically. The resistance wasn't tatters. It took someone special to draw them all together. There was only one man for the job. But then he died too, also tragically. And I was the only soul brave enough to replace him. After that, Harmony began looking at me with a newfound respect, nay, admiration. Harmony set her jaw. These people needed me, Valkyrie. They looked upon me as a savior. It has been a lot of responsibility, and I, I admit it, I've made mistakes. 
How many mistakes did I make, Harmony? Let's count them, shall we? Hmm? There was flaring, and Chakra, Essione, and Calista, Luciana, and Rosella, and Rapture, and— A lot of mistakes, growled Harmony. But finally I came to my senses, said Serpine, and we found our way back to each other. Now Harmony is in charge of holding my coat. He shrugged out of it and held it out. Harmony's lips tightened, but she took his coat and didn't drop it as she walked away. Valkyrie had had enough. Why did you get me out of there? What do you want with me? Serpine motioned to a table and they sat down. That magic-sucking gun Mevelyn used on your evil doppelganger, said Serpine. He's been working on it since the last time you were here. That's what I want. You owe me that. Valkyrie frowned. I don't owe you anything. Serpine leaned forward, his elbows on the table. I had the scepter in my grasp, my only means of defeating Mevelent and his psychotic, shadowy lapdog, but Darkus took it back with her into your reality. So now you owe me one unstoppable weapon. How am I meant to get it? I have a plan. She shook her head. I don't have any magic any more. I'm sorry? I'm not going into details, but my magic was taken from me. It's gone. I can't help you. Someone took your magic? With a weapon like Mevelance, or— No. It was something else. That's awful, Serpine said. No wonder you were defending mortals. You are one. Oh, that must be soul-destroying. You poor, pathetic thing. Whatever, snapped Valkyrie. So I can't help you. It doesn't matter. You don't need any magic. You just have to do what I say and try to be convincing. Convincing as what? Serpon's smile reappeared. As Darkus, of course. What? I want that gun. The only way Mevelent will bring it out in public is if Darkus shows up again. From what I've heard, though, it looks like she's run off back to your dimension with her tail between her legs. But has anyone ever told you that you look a lot like her? How do you expect that to work? asked Valkyrie. He'll know it's me when he attacks and I die horribly and don't get up again. Serpine shrugged. We'll just have to make sure you don't die, then. I'm very eager to hear how we'll manage that. We have recently come into possession of an extremely rare artifact. He took a cloaking sphere from his pocket. Do you know what this does? It envelops the wielder in a bubble of invisibility. Quite an ingenious... I know what it is. You want me to take the sphere into battle against Mavalent? You won't be using it, Serpine said. My teleporter will. This is far too rare an item to entrust to someone who might take it back to her own dimension. Peregrine will be right beside you every step of the way, invisible. Mavalent will use the gun, will let it hit you, and then Peregrine will teleport you a few steps forward or back. To Mavalent, it will look like Darkus has found a way to overcome the effects of the weapon. When he abandons his broken toy to take you on with his bare hands, and he will, Peregrine will scoop it up and teleport it, and you back to us. Questions? What about Skullduggery? If you agree to this, Pleasant and Ravel will be waiting for you when you return. You're going to break them out? asked Valkyrie. Naturally. I don't believe you. I'm hurt. Unsurprised, but hurt. The fact is, I would have gladly lied to you about rescuing them. But I knew how you'd be. So I actually have a solid rescue plan ready to swing into action. Tomorrow morning... Everyone will be distracted by your heroic confrontation with Mevelent, which will allow a team of my best people to break into the dungeons. I can show you the plan. You can meet the team. You can satisfy yourself that they, at least, are honorable people. So long as you say yes right now. If you try to cheat me, I wouldn't dream of it, Serban said, extending his hand. Well, do we have a deal? Valkyrie hesitated, but not for long. Every moment wasted was another moment of pain for Skullduggery. She grasped Serpine's hand and shook. 55. 
the exiled. China came from a meeting with Melancholia Sinclair and Solomon Wreath, and instructed her pretty little assistant to run a bath. Melancholia had been polite in the presence of authority, but Wreath had been his usual aggravating self. If she hadn't needed him to make Melancholia feel more at home in the sanctuary, she would have arranged to have him escorted from the city gates days ago. She undressed while she waited for her bath to be ready, and looked at herself in the bedroom mirror. Her head ached. Meetings, conflicts, anxieties, disruptions, expectations, and responsibilities. These were the things that made up her life now. She had a troubled frown on her face. There was a small invisible sigil by her left eye. Her fingertip grazed it lightly, and it glowed, and a feeling of slow warmth spread through her, cancelling out the ache and returning her forehead to its usual frown-free perfection. Her pretty little assistant stood at the entrance to the bathroom. China removed a delicate bracelet and her necklace, placing them carefully on the dresser. There was a knock on the door, and the frown reappeared. Her assistant rushed to fetch a bathrobe, but China strode across the room before she could find it and pulled the door open. Tipstaff faltered midway into the first word of whatever he'd intended to say. Behind him, seven people stood calmly. "'Thank you, Tipstaff,' China said curtly. "'That will be all.' Tipstaff bowed, his face flushed, and removed himself from her presence, leaving the seven visitors standing there. China addressed the black-haired man with a single scar marring his beauty. "'I don't like vampires, Mr. Dusk.' He inclined his head ever so slightly. "'I am aware of that.' "'And yet you've still brought six of them to my private chambers. "'It's been a long day, and it will be a long night. "'If Tipstaff brought you here, you've something of value to say. "'So out with it.' "'We represent the exiled,' Tusk said. "'Vampires who've broken the most sacred of our codes.' You've all killed other vampires. Again, an almost imperceptible nod. Because of this, I've been cast out. It's not easy for a vampire to be alone. It's not safe for us or anyone else. China graced them with a smile. If you've all come here to be put down, I'm sure I can accommodate you. Put down like animals, you mean? I'm going to credit you with the intelligence I know you possess, Grand Mage, and choose to believe that you don't really think of us in those terms. You may not like our kind. I despise your kind, China said. So please, get to the point. I'm getting cold. We come to Rohaven to request asylum. Request denied. You haven't heard us out. Mr. Dusk. A burgeoning city like Roarhaven cannot have vampires within its walls. You have sorcerers here who've done far worse than any vampires ever managed, Tusk said. And yet I would still prefer all of them to call round for afternoon tea instead of even one of you. Provided we have serum, said Dusk. Vampires can operate in a civilized society. The problem is nobody likes vampires, Mr. Dusk. You unnerve people. Some people could do with a little unnerving. Despite herself, China smiled again. Indeed. But the answer remains no. But you still haven't heard us out. She sighed. Very well. Make your case. But be quick. My bath is calling me. We want housing, said Dusk. We want access to serum, and we want the same rights as everyone else. This made China pause. In exchange for? Oz. I'm sorry. Vampires, he said. Not only would Roarhaven be the first sorcerer city in the world, but it would also be the first magical community to count vampires among its citizens. It would show every sanctuary and every continent that there's nothing Roarhaven is afraid of. There is no threat it cannot control, no beast it cannot tame. 
You're offering us your services. You'd be our tame vampires. He nodded. We would be part of the city and part of the sanctuary. You would have your operatives, your sorcerers, your cleavers, and your vampires. China hesitated. This has never been tried before. With good reason. But times are changing. And why exactly have you chosen now to make this offer? Darkus, a pack of vampires might not last that long against her on its own, but as part of a strategic plan. So you think you're swooping in to aid us in our hour of need? We need you. You may have need of us. This is an opportune time for a deal to be made, I think. Would you agree? China had to admit she liked the idea. The first magical community to have its own vampires. What a signal that would be. What a message that would send. Dusk was right. Roarhaven would instantly develop the kind of reputation she needed it to have. And as for what it would do for China's own reputation. Come in, she said. Talk to me while I bathe. 56. Toe to Toe Showtime The midday sun, distant and indifferent over her head, Valkyrie walked the wide street, forcing herself to stroll with confidence towards the palace, watching the people scatter and the street empty. Even the Red Hood stayed back. The white-robed sense wardens watched her, but didn't try to peek into her mind. They had learned their lesson when they tried that against Darkus. She felt vulnerable. The only disguise she needed was a change of clothes, which meant she'd had to leave her black ones behind. The outfit she'd been given, red, like Darkus's, wasn't even armoured. She didn't like this, not one bit. She had to resist the urge to reach behind her to check if Peregrine was still there. She couldn't even hear his footsteps. Her mouth was dry. She really wanted to lick her lips, but was afraid that would make her look nervous. She couldn't afford to drop the act, not even for a moment. Valkyrie stopped walking, put her hands on her hips, and smiled. They'd expected Mevelin to appear long before this. Maybe he wasn't coming. Maybe he didn't believe for a moment that she was Darkus. Maybe someone was going to shoot her from a rooftop before Peregrine had a chance to teleport her to safety. One bullet, right between the eyes. How stupid would she feel then? She was almost relieved when Mevelin drifted down from the sky. Almost. He didn't have Vile or Vengeance with him. Were they too busy torturing Skullduggery and Ravel, or were they sneaking up behind her? She wanted to look round, but kept her eyes fixed straight ahead. Sorry about yesterday, she said loudly. You caught me unawares. Shall we pick up where we left off? Her voice only trembled a little, right at the start. She didn't think he noticed, though. She hoped he didn't. Mevelin brought the magic-sucking gun out from beneath his cloak. Valkyrie kept the smile and wondered if this was going to hurt. The beam hit her, and it was hot against her skin, and hit with enough force to drive her back one step. But with no magic to drain out of her, once she'd got over the initial impact, all she felt was a mild tingle. Even so, she mimicked Darkus's earlier reactions and fell to her knees like she was exhausted. Nevalent cut off the beam and strode forward. Before he had a chance to finish her, Valkyrie stood up, felt Peregrine's hand on her back, and suddenly she was on the opposite side of the street. "'Is that it?' she asked forcing a grin onto her face. Is that the only setting it's got? Mevelin raised the weapon and fired again. This time, when the beam hit her, Valkyrie laughed. Peregrine teleported her three strides to the left. Your little toys only work for me for a short time, she said. Then I learn. I adapt. We have a race of beings in my universe. We call them the Borg. They told me everything they know about adapting to new weaponry. You cannot defeat me, Mevelent. Resistance is futile. Mevelent fired again, and again, 
After each blast, Valkyrie forced her smile to grow wider. He leaped at her, and suddenly she was on the opposite side of the street, watching Mevelin land. She tried to give a laugh, but all that emerged was a strangled bark that she really hoped nobody heard. Mevelin turned to her. Valkyrie did her best to look arrogant. After all those years of being arrogant, it should have come to her a lot more naturally than it did. I'm not here for you, she said. I'm here for Skeldegory Pleasant and Erskine Ravel. Give them to me and I will leave this depressing little reality and never come back. You have my word. Mevelant observed her from behind his helmet. Then he dropped the magic-sucking gun and held out his hand. For a moment he stood there like that, and then the god-killer broadsword drifted down from the rooftops and settled into his grip. Involuntarily, Valkyrie reached behind her, grabbing for Peregrine. Her fingers grasped at nothing but air, but her entire body went cold. Are you there? she whispered, trying not to move her lips. Hey! But there was no response, and no reassuring pat on the back. The moment Mevelin dropped the gun, Peregrine had moved. She was alone. Mevelin walked forward slightly, the flat of the broadsword resting on his shoulder. The magic sucker, on the ground behind him, disappeared, scooped up by the invisible teleporter. She couldn't run. Even if she had somewhere to run to, she was nowhere near fast enough to get there. She couldn't fight. She didn't even have her armored clothes. Not that they'd do any good against a god-killer. That sword was going to slice her in two so cleanly she doubted it'd get any of her blood on its blade. Stop! she screamed. Mevelin stopped walking. Fear turned to fury inside her and bubbled from her belly to her throat. You think you can kill me? she roared, and found herself striding forward. You think I'm going to be killed by the likes of you? I am Darkus. I have lived inside nightmares since before I was even born. I was always here. I was always meant to be here. I'm going to kill every man, woman, and child, every animal, plant, and organism in my reality, and I'm going to do it because I can. I am a god, you pathetic little man. I am the darkness at the end of the day. I am the cold that overcomes the heat. I am inevitable, you insignificant little toad. Who the hell are you to think you can threaten me? When she finished talking, she was standing right before him, glaring up through the eye holes of his helmet and seriously regretting this course of action. She wanted to pee. Her left leg was shaking so much she thought she was going to collapse. Thankfully, Mevelin's sword was still resting on his shoulder. He seemed to believe that she was who she said she was, that she was capable of carrying out her threats to. Mevelin's left hand rose unhurried. Valkyrie forced herself to ignore it, to keep her glare fixed. His hand went to her face, cupping her chin. The slightest squeeze would crumple her jaw, she knew. But she was all out of ideas, and staying very still and looking very angry seemed to be the best thing to do in her current situation. She felt him observing her for the longest time, as if he were peering into her soul and weighing up what he found there. If he found her strong enough, he might just let her go. If he discovered her weakness, he'd kill her where she stood. His hand left her face. You are not Darkus, he said. And even as he was stepping back to swing the sword, Valkyrie felt hands on her from behind, and then she was indoors. She recognized this place, the darkness and the smell. It was the dungeon beneath Mevelin's palace. The cloaking sphere retracted, and Peregrine stuffed it in his coat. He held the energy sucker in his other hand. You came back for me, Valkyrie said, her eyes wide. Of course, said Peregrine. You think I'd leave you there? We're the good guys, Valkyrie. Indeed we are, said a voice behind her and she turned as Serpa and joined them, Skullduggery and Travel following behind in shackles, escorted by a team of grim sorcerers. See, your colleagues, as promised, I am nothing if not a man who sometimes keeps his word. Peregrine, 
What is that wonderful object you are holding? Is it, perhaps, the weapon I've been waiting for? Peregrine handed it over, and while Serpine gave it a cursory examination, Valkyrie rushed over to Skullduggery. Are you okay? I wanted to get you out sooner, but— You got me out when you could, Skullduggery said. You have no need to apologize. Where's the key? Valkyrie asked Serpine. The key to the shackles, where is it? I'm sure I don't know, Serpine mumbled, his attention still on the magic sucker, and I'm sure I don't care to. Satisfied, he looked up. Your skeleton friend has a habit of hitting me, so he's going to remain in shackles until you go home, which hopefully will be very soon. Peregrine, I think it's time we all got out of— Company! One of Serpine's sorcerers snarled as Baron Venger stormed towards them. Oh, this should be fun, Serpine said, aiming the magic sucker at him. He pulled the trigger and nothing happened. Serpine shook the weapon. Work, damn you! Get us out of here, Skullduggery ordered. And everyone linked up, and before Valkyrie had formed her next thought, they were back in the small fishing village on the other side of the country. Damn it! Why won't it work? Serpine yelled, stalking away from them. He tried firing at the sky, spun and aimed at Peregrine, but again nothing happened. Why won't it work? Maybe it doesn't work because you don't know how to work it, Valkyrie said. Maybe it's not so simple as pulling the trigger. You're like a kid who gets a toy in Christmas morning and flings it away when it doesn't work first time. Why the hell would kids get toys at Christmas? Serpan said. And why are you still here? Don't you have a dimension to get back to? We don't rendezvous with our shunter for another twenty-six hours, Skullduggery said. Well, that's just annoying, isn't it? Do yourself a favor and stay out of everyone's way. He tossed the magic sucker to one of his men. And you, get this working. I'll be in my chambers. He stalked away, shouted Harmony's name. She emerged from a doorway and hurried after him with a scowl on her face. Peregrine passed a small key to Valkyrie. For the shackles he said. I'm assuming you've arranged to meet up with your shunter in Roarhaven. Whenever you need to go, come find me. We will, she said. Thanks. Peregrine and the other sorcerers dispersed. Valkyrie ignored Ravel and unlocked Skullduggery's shackles. You okay? she asked. I'm fine, Skullduggery said, adjusting his cufflinks. That is a very useful weapon they've just stolen. It is, said Valkyrie. It's called a magic sucker. That the technical term for it, is it? Yep. You know, taking down Darkus would be a lot easier with that weapon. She nodded. I was just thinking that. But Serpine's not going to let us simply take it. We already have a scepter from this reality, taking the— How can you stand to talk to him? Ravel asked, his voice dripping with disgust. Skullduggery turned to him slowly. I'm sorry. Serpine, said Ravel, for hundreds of years hunting down this man was what drove you. What drove us? We chased him across the world to make him pay for what he did. He killed our friend, Skullduggery. He killed your... Skullduggery moved. And all at once they were standing so close that Skullduggery's hat brim was touching Ravel's forehead. I know what Nefarian Serpine did, Skullduggery said in a low, quiet voice, and the Nefarian Serpine who killed those people is dead. They're the same man, in a lot of ways. But the Serpine who just walked away from us is not the one who killed our friends. I carried around that anger for long enough. I let it change me. Do you really want me to pick it up again? Ravel hesitated. He's the enemy. Skullduggery didn't say anything to that. He didn't have to. Ravel took a step back and looked away. Skullduggery turned back to Valkyrie. Serpine thinks he has twenty-six hours in which to get paranoid. But we can take the magic sucker, steal some horses and get to Roarhaven in ten, just in time to make our actual rendezvous with Signet. Valkyrie smiled. You are sneaky. When I have to be. 
They waited around for two hours for their chance. It was getting dark by then. Valkyrie, clad once again in her black clothes, kept watch. Ravel stood beside her. His hands were still shackled, and the shock stick was on her back and fully charged. If he tried anything, she was ready. Minutes passed. Skullduggery emerged from the doorway, the magic sucker wrapped in a blanket. Not a word was spoken. They moved through the village quickly. They got to the stables. Stop! Valkyrie froze. Ever so slowly, she turned, saw Skullduggery and Ravel do the same, as Serpine walked up. Behind him, a squad of sorcerers armed with shotguns and automatic weapons. I knew I couldn't trust you, Serpine said. I knew this would prove just too tempting. You come in here, cause trouble, then disappear with something that belongs to us? Well, not this time. This time you fail. Hand it over. Why? Skullduggery asked. It's not like you can get it to work. We will, said Serpine. And if we don't, so be it. But you're not taking it with you. We just want to borrow it, really. We'll bring it right back. Drop it at your feet. I'll give the order and all three of you will be blasted apart. Skullduggery put the weapon on the ground slowly, then straightened up hands in the air. If I ever see you again, said Serpon, I'll assume you're here to try and steal something else, and you will be treated as an enemy. You can leave now. Valkyrie and Skullduggery backed away from the magic sucker, taking Ravel with them. At any moment, Valkyrie expected Serpine to give the order to shoot, but as soon as it became clear that he'd lost interest, she relaxed. She watched him gesture to one of the sorcerers, instructing him to fetch the weapon. Instead, another sorcerer went to get it, a man in a tattered coat and hood. She glimpsed his face, frowned, and reversed her course. Valkyrie, said Skullduggery, but she ignored him, stepped closer, peering under that hood as the sorcerer bent to pick up the weapon. His face was unshaven, his lips stretched into a grin, in fact, his whole face was stretched, like it was a mask pulled too tight. The sorcerer raised his head. She saw blackness curling from his empty eyes, and she knew it was a mask, a face cut from another man's head. Lord Vile! she cried, and Vile straightened, tendrils of shadow tearing his clothes to shred as they lashed out at the startled sorcerers. Bullets raked his armor, either bouncing off or being absorbed into it, and Serpine cursed and dodged back, stumbling to avoid a shadow that would have taken his head off. Skullduggery grabbed Valkyrie's arm and they ran, joining Ravel behind cover. Bullets whined and fire whooshed and energy sizzled, and screams mixed with shouts until the sound of people dying became the only thing they heard. Valkyrie raised herself up, took a peek. Bodies lay strewn about and only Vile and Serpine remained standing. Red energy coursed from Serpine's right hand and met the stream of darkness that flowed from Vile's fist. At first, they seemed evenly matched, but as Valkyrie watched, she could see that the darkness was inching forward bit by bit, and Serpine was showing the strain. He was pale and sweating, and his arm was trembling. The magic sucker caught her eye. Vile had dropped it, or someone had snatched it from him. Either way, it was on the ground once again. She remembered how it had looked in Mevelin's hands, how he had held it. Right before he pulled the trigger, his left hand had tightened on the barrel. Maybe that was it. Maybe activating the sigils there was all that was needed to ready the trigger. Serpine's legs gave out, and he dropped, the red energy dissipating and the shadows glancing off his shoulder. He grunted went sprawling, and Vile's shadows turned sharp. Then Vile hesitated. To him, this Nefarian Serpine was the man who had murdered his wife and child, the man who had been responsible for turning him from Skullduggery Pleasant into Lord Vile. Valkyrie reckoned that killing such a man was bound to make anyone relish the moment. Valkyrie ran from cover, snatched the weapon up, 
but even as she aimed, Vile was turning, sending a shadow shard out to meet her. What happened next happened slowly. The magic sucker buzzed slightly in her hand, and she felt it activate, felt the beam ready to burst forth. The shadow shard came around like a whip, caught the weapon at its exact center, a hair's breadth from Valkyrie's forefinger. The gun split as it tried to fire, and light erupted from within and filled Valkyrie's vision. She wasn't aware of being thrown back. She wasn't aware of vile stumbling. She wasn't aware of her own screaming. All that she was aware of was the pain, and that was enough. 57. A World of Pain Valkyrie missed the long trek back to Roarhaven. That trek, as long as it was, was entirely replaced by never-ending pain. Skullduggery would later tell her that following the explosion, Lord Vile had Shadow walked away, injured. Serpine had picked up the two halves of the magic sucker, examined them, cursed, and had Peregrine teleport him away. Skullduggery had then bound Valkyrie's arms and legs so she would be easier to manage, and took her with him on his horse. Ravel went on ahead, his horse tethered to Skullduggery's. It was slow going and they missed their rendezvous. But they made the one after that, and Signate shunted them into the circle that China had devised in the sanctuary in their own dimension. They'd left Ravel in that circle, hidden from Darkus. Valkyrie missed all that. All she saw were blurred faces and faraway voices. If she was lucky, unconsciousness would snatch her away from the pain for hours at a time. She wasn't lucky very often. 58. Valkyrie's Affliction Disjointed. That's how Tanith felt. Like nothing fitted right. Like she'd lost the rhythm of how her life was lived. She couldn't shake the feeling that she was stumbling. She couldn't shake the feeling that her feet were suddenly leaden. She was dealing with a life interrupted. She was lost and alone, and she had no one to help guide her back. She hadn't called her family. She wanted to leave that until she had a handle on where things were going, which would be a nice change. Ghastly is dead. Those three words haunted her. They waited at the end of every thought. Sometimes they'd fade a little, allow her a distraction, a moment of engagement, but they never left her alone for long. They were persistent, those three little words. She took to exploring Roarhaven. She'd tried to help with preparing the city for Darkus's wrath, but she only got in the way. Saracen Rue was too busy to talk, and while she'd read their books, she'd never been introduced to Donegan Bane or Gracious O'Callaghan. Her remnant self knew them, apparently. It was funny. Her remnant self had had a better grip on her life than Tanith did. Mostly she just hung around the sanctuary and waited for Valkyrie to get back. She was there when they shunted in, thank God. She'd even visited Ravel in his little circle. She used to fancy him. He was so smooth, so charming, so good-looking. And those eyes, those beautiful golden eyes. But now she hated him. Ghastly is dead. She needed to get out. She needed to get on her bike and ride. She left Roarhaven in a cloud of dust. She didn't know where she was going. She got onto the motorway, joined the traffic, found herself taking a familiar exit. Oh, so that's where she was going. She pulled up outside Valkyrie's house, knocked on the door. Melissa Edgley answered it. Desmond passed behind her, with little Alice scampering around after him. Tanith smiled. Hi, she said. I'm... I know you, Melissa said. She looked agitated. You came to our house a few years ago after Christmas. You were Stephanie's substitute teacher. Ah, Tanit said. Right. That actually wasn't me, not really. And I don't remember it, so I apologize for anything I may have said or done. I was possessed at the time by this horrible little thing that 
turned me evil for a few years. I just got rid of it, actually. Today is my first Saturday remnant-free for over two years. My name is Tanith Lowe, and I suppose I was a teacher to your daughter, actually. I handled half of her fight training. Melissa stared at her. Valkyrie told me you found out about the whole magic thing. I, um, I didn't misunderstand or anything, did I? Where is she? Melissa asked. She hasn't been answering our calls, and we don't know where she is. Is she all right? She's in the medical wing in the sanctuary. Basically, she's in the hospital. I thought you'd probably be worried about her, and it would never occur to Skullduggery to let you know these things. Melissa went very pale. Take us to her. That's not a good idea. She's our daughter, and you'd better— Melissa, Tanith said, talking over her. It isn't a good idea to take you to see her, because seeing her would distress you too much. What's wrong with her? She's in pain, said Tanith. A hideous amount of pain, if I'm honest. But it shouldn't be too long now before it passes. What happened? It's a long story, and full of aspects that you'd find confusing. So I'm going to stick to the simplest explanation, if that's okay with you. Valkyrie and Skullduggery went away to do a job. While they were away, she was caught in an explosion of sorts. An explosion of sorts. Physically, she's fine. She's uninjured. But she is in an incredible amount of pain. Our doctors didn't know what to make of it at first, until they realized that it wasn't nearly as complicated as they'd feared. In fact, Valkyrie is going through something that everyone there is very familiar with. What? Melissa asked. For God's sake, what's wrong with her? It's a magic thing. But she's not magic. She told us herself she lost her magic. So she did, said Tanith. But the facts are the facts. And the fact is the explosion kick-started her surge. What she'll be when she emerges is anyone's guess. 59. The Corpse Trail The Cadillac slows... The high whine of asphalt replaced by the crunch of roadside gravel. And then there's nothing. Apart from some residual ticking, even the engine is silent. Danny stops his teeth from chattering long enough to hear a few muffled words of conversation from up front. He doesn't get all of it. He's too cold, and he has a pounding headache, and he's nauseous, and he desperately needs to pee again. But he catches the gist of what they're saying. They're afraid they've lost Stephanie. Or rather, they're afraid that Stephanie has lost them. Jeremiah suggests they loop around, to see if they can pick her up again. But Gant is against the idea. He doesn't want to make it obvious that they're luring her in. They talk about this for a few minutes, with Jeremiah coming up with suggestions like an eager employee trying to impress his boss. Gant, for his part, grows increasingly irate and Jeremiah eventually gets the message and stops suggesting stupid things. There's movement, and then a door opens, only one, and someone gets out. Gant. His footsteps move along the side of the car and stop somewhere close to Danny's head. I need to pee, Danny calls. There's the sharp bang of a fist on the trunk. Shut up, says Gant and a moment later Danny hears an approaching car. He catches a brief sweep of headlights through the cracks of the trunk, and then the car slows. It isn't Stephanie. Stephanie wouldn't pull up to where Gant was standing. He hears a voice, a man's voice, saying something, possibly offering to help in some way, and then he jumps as three gunshots ring out. Gant's movements are unhurried as he gets back into the Cadillac. The engine fires up, and they pull out onto the road and continue on. Danny doesn't need to hear the conversation to know that that was a sign for Stephanie to follow. A half hour later, he can't hold it any longer. He unzips and pees into the carpet under the latch, the sense of relief momentarily overwhelming the bizarre sense of shame that threatens to engulf him. When he's finished, he zips up and shuffles back as far as he can. His jacket held up over his nose and mouth. He tests the air every few minutes until he can't smell anything rank, 
and begins to breathe normally again. They haven't bothered tying him up after the gas station. They know he's beaten. He knows he's beaten. The acceptance is sudden and unexpected, but no less valid than the thought that follows after. He's beaten now, at this particular moment in time. But once they let him out of this trunk, once he's got his strength back, then he has a chance again. The Cadillac slows again and he wakes. It's morning now. A thin line of warm sunlight falls across his face. He hears Gant say, Excuse me, very clearly, like he's leaning out of an open window. Running footsteps approach. A woman's voice. An early morning jogger. A thought surfaces in the murk of Danny's mind. The man in the car, the gunshots, a trail of carnage for Stephanie to follow. Run! Danny screams. Run! He's going to kill you! He hears the woman's voice. Not the words, but the tone, confused, suddenly wary, and Gant trying to be soothing, trying to coax her closer. Then there's a scrape of rubber soles on the road, and the woman is running, and Gant is cursing. Car doors open. A gun fires twice, more cursing. Go! Gant shouts, and Danny hears Jeremiah take off in pursuit. Gant gets back in the car, and they leap forward, tires spinning. The Cadillac swerves violently, and Danny hits his head and jars his shoulder. The world rattles and bumps around him. They're off the road now, on some kind of dirt track. Branches scrape against metal. Water splashes. Another turn, and another. And for a moment they're going sideways, and Danny is sure they're going to crash. But somehow Gant gets the big car back under control, and they straighten out picking up even more speed. They take a long, wide turn, then break, coming to a skidding, sliding stop, and the engine cuts out, and the door opens, and Danny hears the woman grunt. Something thuds heavily onto a crackling surface. Twigs. The ground is covered in twigs, and old leaves, and Gant and the woman are rolling around on it. The woman struggles fiercely. Gant curses. There's a burst of snapping branches and trampled undergrowth, and another thud, and Jeremiah's heavy panting has added to the mix. Let go of me! The woman shouts, Let go! Let... There's a gunshot. Danny lies in the darkness, listening to Jeremiah getting his breath back while Gant mutters to himself. After a minute, Jeremiah gets to his feet with great effort. He sighs a few more times, grunts, and Danny hears something being dragged, getting closer. It moves round the car to the trunk. A rattle of keys. The trunk opens and Danny shields his eyes. He hears Jeremiah's cry of disgust as the smell hits him, and then Gant is saying something and Danny finally looks up. No, says Danny. But Jeremiah drops the woman's body on top of him and slams the trunk shut. Danny screams, shrinking back from the tangle of limbs and long hair, trying to push the body away but his hands are suddenly wet with something warm and sticky. There's a new smell in the trunk now, the coppery smell of blood. That's what you get, says Gant from outside. That's what you get. Danny wants to scream and scream, but he locks it down. He keeps the screams clamped inside his chest, and he breathes fast and shallow. You can smell the woman's coconut shampoo. Car doors close and the engine starts, and the Cadillac reverses into a three-point turn and heads back the way it's come at a gentle pace. When they get to the road, they stop, and Jeremiah comes round and opens the trunk again. His face is red from exertion. Dribbles of sweat run from his forehead. Glaring at Danny, he takes hold of the woman's torso and hauls her out. He lets the body fall at his feet and looks in at Danny, his nose wrinkled in disgust. Then he closes the trunk. Sixty. Freaks. Finally, the pain went away. They ran a few more tests, then okayed her release. She eased herself out of bed, her joints aching, and dressed slowly. She was zipping up her jacket when Skullduggery stopped by. Clarabel tells me I've had the surge, said Valkyrie. We've all gone through it, 
he responded. It's not nice, but it's necessary. And at least you have magic again. How do you feel? Tired, sore, but most of all, different. I can feel the magic inside me, but it's not like it was. And I don't feel the air like I used to. I don't think I'm an elemental anymore. Valkyrie clicked her fingers. No sparks flew. They have an eye over there, she said, carrying on clicking. It's a professor, still skulking around in the shadows. While you were being held by Mevolent, I was delivered into its delightful hands. After a few tests, it came up with a theory. When Darkus was pulled out of me, I was left as an empty vessel. The surge filled me back up, but with what? Magic. She stopped clicking. But what kind? Nye said there could be all those different kinds of magic that even sorcerers don't know about. That's true, Skullduggery said. She joined him as he walked from the medical wing. I've come across a few such examples. So have you, for that matter. The Jitter Girls? We have no explanation for them at all. We don't know how or why they exist. They just do. I don't know how you're going to turn out. You don't have a true name any more, Valkyrie. You're not bound by our rules. The magic that's within you right now has come directly from the so-called source, with no filtration. I could turn into a Jitter Girl? Unlikely. From what we do know of the Jitter Girls, some very specific circumstances led to their present condition. You're probably closer to warlocks and witches than you are to sorcerers right now. Put a smile on that face, Valkyrie. You're unique. Easily as unique as I am. Two freaks in a pod, eh? His head tilted, amused. Wouldn't have it any other way. They walked on through the glorious corridors. This one had flowers and plants growing from the walls in bursts of vibrant colour. Fletcher's back, he said. Is he okay? Skullduggery hesitated. Yes, I think. He apologised, said he just had to get away. I don't think anyone holds it against him. How do you think he'll cope with Darkus? What do you mean? His judgement. Will he be clouded? By anger, you mean? I don't think so. Fletcher's not really a revenge type of guy. He'll do all he can to help, but he's not going to do anything stupid. No more stupid than usual, anyway. Good. We'll be depending on him. He won't let us down, she said, and then smiled. I'm really going to miss this, you know. Miss what? This. Valkyrie waved at her surroundings. Plans and missions and briefings, you and me. If we all die, I'm really going to miss this. If we all die... Skullduggery said. You're not really going to miss much of anything, but I appreciate the sentiment. And? And what? And is there anything in particular that you're going to miss? Do you have anything particular in mind? Well, I don't know, said Valkyrie, standing in his way to make him stop. Maybe someone in particular? Maybe someone in particular who's standing very close to you at this very moment in time? The plant? No, not the plant. I said someone. And it's not the plant. I know who you're going to miss most. It's okay to admit it. He stepped round her and continued on. That's nice. She got up. Seriously? After all this time, you're not going to give me this little piece of honesty? After all we've meant to each other? You meant after all I've meant to you. I've meant just as much to you as you have to me. Debatable. Please just admit it, said Valkyrie. You're going to miss me, aren't you? Obviously, said Skullduggery. Thank you. Like a drowning man misses the land. Oh. Like a hesitant man misses the chance. Yeah, like an oblivious man misses the point. I have a feeling you're mocking me somehow, but I can't put my finger on how. They entered the room of prisms. China sat on her throne sorting through a sheaf of papers. Saracen, Donegan, and Gracious were talking with Fletcher and Tanith. To one side stood Solomon Wreath and Melancholia Sinclair. To the other, Dusk. Whoa, said Valkyrie. Dusk looked at her. 
the scar she had given him reflected in a thousand tiny mirrors. I bear you no ill will, he said. She blinked. Right. Okay. Skullduggery looked up at China. Reading anything interesting? Preliminary reports following our raid on the Church of the Faceless, China said, putting down the papers. Finding a lot of names mentioned? Possible worshippers we never knew about? Getamine, Verdant, even your new friend Keir Tanner, the prison warden? He liked me, Skullduggery said. I could tell. China stood. All right, then. Before we begin, I think we're all glad to see Valkyrie back on her feet, and we appreciate Fletcher being here after what happened. Tanith has also rejoined us. Tanith smiled. It's nice to be loved. China ignored her. First of all, what is our current situation as regards the remnants? We've lost them, Saracen said grimly. Any chance we had of tracking them down vanished when they took Dexter. The moment they make trouble, though, we'll know about it, Donegan said. So far, and this is both fortunate and worrying, there hasn't been a peep. China nodded. Focus your efforts here. Darkus is our only concern from this moment on. How are we on that front? Erskine Ravel is staying in the circle, said Skullduggery. Darkus hasn't smashed down the door so I think we can assume it's doing an adequate job of hiding him from our senses. So we have our bait once again. How fares the trap? That bit's trickier, I'm sure. Darkus doesn't have any obvious weakness, as far as we can see, Skullduggery said. Like anything. If we hit her enough times, she'll eventually die, but the question then becomes, what shall we hit her with? Dear Louisa, Gracious mumbled. The weapon Mavelin used, China said. That had an effect on her, yes? It drained her power for a few seconds at a time, said Valkyrie. But we have no idea how it worked. Magical technology has been flourishing in that reality for the last two hundred years, Skullduggery added. They're far more advanced than we are. We've no hope of replicating the magic sucker. China's lip curled. That's what we're calling it? Valkyrie nodded. That's the technical term. What about the sensitives? Have they seen anything new? I've just spoken with Cassandra, said Sarson. They've been having the same dreams and visions. Details change all the time, but the result is always the same. Death and destruction. China sat back down. I want you all to understand something. I have been doing this job for a little over a month, and I like people doing what I tell them. It's fun. And I don't want the world ending just when I'm having fun. We use Erskine Ravel to lure Darkus here. Once she's here, we engage her in combat. We throw everything we have at her. Sorcerers, cleavers, Dusk, and his exiled will be a part of our strategy, as of course will the Godkiller weapons. If they take care of the problem, wonderful. We can all go home early. But our main objective is to keep Darkus busy, keep her distracted. Valkyrie, this means you will more than likely encounter her on a one-to-one -one basis. Valkyrie nodded. China sighed. Which means you'll probably need something to fight her with. I have magic again. But it hasn't manifested, has it? You feel it, but you don't know where it is. You might discover you possess the magical ability to talk to goldfish. Your magic might manifest as an offensive ability, or it may not. But you need something. She nodded to someone out of sight, and Tipstaff appeared from nowhere, holding out the death touch gauntlet for Valkyrie to take. She glared. I'm not wearing that. I'm afraid I'm going to have to insist, said China. What good is it going to do me? Valkyrie said. I'd need to get right up close to Darkus to use it, and she'd kill me with a slap. I may have something to offer in that department, said Solomon Wreath. China looked at him. Go on. Twelve hundred years ago, 
The highest clerics of the necromancy order got together and constructed a sigil which bestows upon its user incredible strength and complete and utter invulnerability. Are you aware of this sigil, Grand Mage? Of course, said China. The Merin sigil, elegant and intricate. Its beauty is marred only by the simple fact that it doesn't work. They were necromancers, Reed smiled. You really think they'd let one of their secrets out without keeping something back? Physical activation is necessary in order for the sigil to start working. But the high clerics, in their wisdom, decided that strength and invulnerability were gifts to be used only by those who had proved themselves worthy necromancers, sorcerers who have mastered death. They thought the future would be full of such people. How many have there been? Valkyrie asked. At the last twelve hundred years? Reed said. None. And how does this help us? asked Saracen. It doesn't help us, said Reed. It helps Valkyrie. Wait, she said. When you say sigil, you mean a tattoo, don't you? No. I had one in the vision, and I was wearing that gauntlet, and there's no way I'm using either of them. No way! You might have to said China. All Valkyrie's old objections reared up, but one by one the arguments against them knocked them down before she had a chance to utter a word. Not wearing the gauntlet, not having the sigil, there was no guarantee that would be enough to save her family. In fact, without them, her family could even die that bit sooner. It doesn't even matter, Valkyrie said. It's activated by someone who's mastered death, right? Well, that's not me. No, said Reith. But there's no rule that says the person who wears the sigil has to activate it. You can, for instance, send someone else to activate it. And if anyone here can be said to have mastered death, it's Detective Pleasant. Skullduggery tilted his head. What is involved in this activation? I don't actually know, said Reith. There are three tests you'll have to pass. I'm sure there'll be no problem for you. Where do I take these tests? Marinta Ul, also known as the Necropolis, the city of the dead, the city beneath. I can take you there if you'd like. Valkyrie stays where it's safe. You pass the tests, activate the sigil, and suddenly she's invulnerable. For how long? Valkyrie asked. Wreath shrugged. Long enough, I should think. If you truly intend to go up against Darkus, though, you'll need every advantage you can get. Skullduggery? China said. If you're okay undertaking the three tests in the necropolis, I'll get the specifications for the sigil and apply it to Valkyrie personally. Skullduggery nodded, looked to Wreath. How long will you need? A few hours, Wreath answered. I have never been to the necropolis myself, so I'll have to make inquiries. We may require advanced transport, though. Fletcher will accompany you, said China. Valkyrie, I'll be ready in thirty minutes. Please come to my chambers. Everyone else, get back to work. The group dispersed, and Skullduggery put his fingertips on the small of Valkyrie's back and guided her out of the room. I'm not happy, she said. No? I thought you'd always wanted a tissue. Not happy. Yes, well, I don't blame you. But seeing as how you're about to do everything possible to prepare yourself for the upcoming confrontation, it is only good manners that I do likewise. She frowned. Where are we? Oh. They passed into the old sanctuary and walked in silence until they got to the accelerator room. Hello, Valkyrie the engineer said. Hello, Detective Pleasant. Are you here to deactivate the accelerator? Not yet, said Skullduggery. Valkyrie stayed by the door, making sure no one was going to walk in on them. She tried to keep her eyes from the spot where Stephanie had been killed, but her gaze kept dropping, kept picturing her there. Images surfaced of what her final few moments must have been like to be that scared and that alone. You have three days, nineteen hours, 
and one minute left, the engineer said. Plenty of time to decide who will give their soul. We're not here to shut off the accelerator, Skullduggery said. We're here to use it. Is that possible? Of course. Would that affect the time we have left? From what I know of its processes, using it at this late stage could speed up the overload. You are quite correct, said the engineer. A full boost to your power would have a cumulative effect on the accelerator systems. If you wish to avoid that... I can reduce the level to which your abilities are enhanced. Instead of you reaching 100% of enhancement, you would reach 63%. Still a significant boost, if I do say so. Skullduggery looked back at Valkyrie. Thoughts? Many and magnificent, she said. But you're the one who reckons we need all the help we can get. To start down this road, though, Skullduggery said, it's dangerous. The roads we take usually are. You heard the lady, Skullduggery said to the engineer. But before we do this, can I count on your discretion? I am a robot, said the engineer. I do not gossip. Please step into the accelerator. Actually, I'm going to stay out here, Skullduggery said, and began unbuttoning his shirt. Tendrils of shadows seeped out from between his ribs. They collected in his outstretched hand, forming a spinning sphere of darkness that grew in mass the more the shadows flowed. Finally the tendrils trailed off, and Lord Vile's power drifted from Skullduggery's hand to the accelerator. It hovered over the dais, which began to tremble. A glow spread beneath the skin of the machine and the sphere spun faster, expanding and contracting at an astonishing rate. The glow in the accelerator became a light that hurt Valkyrie's eyes. She looked up and down the corridor, no one coming. She examined her own shadow, stark against the wall. Then the shadow began to fade as the light behind her grew dim. She looked back. The accelerator had powered down but the sphere was still spinning so fast it looked to be in constant danger of unravelling. She knew it was taking all of Skullduggery's self-control to keep it in one piece. It darted to Skullduggery's hand. Now was the moment when it could all go horribly wrong. If the shadows morphed into armour and enveloped him, a supercharged Lord Vile would destroy this world just as readily as Darkus. Skullduggery's head twitched. The sphere broke apart into a thousand tendrils, and Valkyrie's heart lurched in dreadful and sudden fear. But the tendrils flowed up under Skullduggery's sleeve, up his arm, making his jacket bulge. They twisted at his shirt collar, curled out of his eye sockets, and then he arched his back, and it was like he inhaled, and the shadows were sucked back inside his ribcage. See? Valkyrie said. Told you it'd be fine. Skullduggery buttoned his shirt back up. You told me no such thing. Yeah, but I thought it. How does it feel? He fixed his tie and brushed lint from his lapel. It feels, he said. Angry. Yikes. It was necessary. Even if I don't have to draw on my necromancer power for the three tests in Meren Ta'ul... I dare say it'll be handy for when we go up against Darkus. Engineer, thank you very much for your help and your discretion. The engineer bowed, and they left. Valkyrie looked at Skullduggery. What are the chances of us just giving Ravel to Darkus if she asks? Slim. Ravel is the one thing we know she wants. Apart from that, we're blind. We have no idea where she's going to go or what she's going to do because we don't know what else is driving her. I should know what she wants, Valkyrie said. I mean, shouldn't I? I'm her. Okay, I'm not her now, but surely I was in her mind long enough to pick up a few things, right? In theory. So question me, Valkyrie said, turning to him. Go on, interrogate me. I have the answer. I must have the answer. I just can't recognize it. I don't know what's useful to you. Get it out of me. Interesting, Skullduggery said. That might actually work. 
Very well. Let's give it a go. What does Darkus want? I have no idea, said Valkyrie, then frowned. That's a terrible start. It's less than auspicious, I'm forced to admit, Skullduggery said. Valkyrie, Darkus is you. She's your dark side, your bad mood. She's still you, but she's growing, evolving. Are you saying I'm not evolved? She's evolving beyond you. Into what? What is she becoming? What we've always feared, Valkyrie said. Her voice so quiet it actually surprised her. A god. And what do gods do, given the chance? They punish people. Not all gods. All the ones I've heard about, she said. The faceless ones were insane and ruthless, and so mean and nasty that even though they can't exist here in physical form, they still want to get back in just to punish us for kicking them out in the first place. But Darkus isn't like that. She wasn't like that, Valkyrie corrected. She started off fine. She couldn't understand why people were having visions of her destroying the world. She didn't want to hurt anyone. But the more godlike she got the less she cared about little things like people. She sees everything as forms of energy now. Life and death are the same thing. So she doesn't want to hurt us, exactly. Well, maybe not. But she doesn't view killing us as hurting us. Is that why she wants to expand her mind? She wants to learn more about matter and atoms and energy. She knows a lot, but it's all... it's instinctive. She doesn't have the words to think it all the way through, and that's what she's after. When she has the words, when she has the framework to deal with all this, she'll be able to do what she wants to do. And what is that? I don't know. She's growing, like you said. She's evolving. She goes up against something, she figures out how to beat it or control it, and then she moves on to the next thing. She's after a challenge, Skullduggery said. Yes, said Valkyrie. That's when she's happiest. So what's her biggest challenge? It's not us, I'll tell you that much. Then what is it? I don't know. I... Don't think about this. Don't try to anticipate. Just answer. What is Darkus building towards? What is she evolving to meet? I don't know, Valkyrie said, exasperated. The faceless ones, maybe? Skullduggery tilted his head. What? Valkyrie's eyes widened. That's it. That's what she wants. She's evolving until she can beat the faceless ones. And then she'll find something else to fight. That's her goal. It has to be, right? It's definitely a challenge, Skullduggery said. Does this help? How can this possibly help? In order to defeat your enemy, Skullduggery said, first you must understand them. Up till now... We haven't been able to do that. Now we can. And we can adapt our plan to fit. Valkyrie grinned. I'm a genius. 61. The Plan The god-killer dagger was heavy in his belt. He could feel its entire weight and had to resist the urge to constantly check to make sure it was staying in one place. One slip, after all, and that blade could nick him, and then Sanguine would be no more. It was a risk, carrying it, but it was even more of a risk to leave it behind. Darkus was fretting. No, fretting was maybe the wrong word. She was preoccupied, and puzzled. She couldn't keep still, pacing through the small living room, muttering to herself and occasionally looking up. She hadn't said much when she returned from that other dimension. All Sanguine knew was that she'd failed to bring Ravel back and that Mevolent had found some way to beat her, and that was not going down well. Like that, she said, snapping her fingers. Like that! And I was helpless. Helpless! Me! I've never heard of anything like it. I'm pretty sure Ken Speckle hadn't either. Argedian? He might have been able to figure it out, but I didn't even know that was possible. Sanguine watched her and didn't say anything. He was glad of this sudden preoccupation. So far, she hadn't said anything about Tanith's escape, even though they all knew what he'd done. 
Vincent Foe and that creepy vampire sat across the room, and every so often Foe would glance at him. The vampire's gaze never wavered. Someone knocked on the door. Darkus barely noticed. I'll get it, said Sanguine. He did his best to walk the way he always did, but the dagger was making every movement stiff. He went to the wall beside the door, pressed his head against it. The wall crumbled, and he poked his head out the other side, saw Dexter Vex standing there. She in? Vex asked. She is, Sanguine answered. He withdrew his head and opened the door, and Vex walked in like he owned the place. Sanguine followed him into the living room and took up his usual spot by the window. You called? Vex said to Darkus. She stopped pacing and looked up. There was a flicker of irritation on her face. I did, she said. Hours ago. You're late. Vex gave a small bow. Apologies. I found it hard to tear myself away from praising you to the others. I am here now, and I, like my fellow remnants, exist only to serve. What dost thou will, my mistress? Darkus peered at him. Are you being cheeky, Dexter? The corner of Vex's mouth twitched upwards in a smile. Perhaps. Normally I don't mind cheeky, said Darkus, but today I'm in a bad mood. I'm cranky. I've been offered a glimpse of my own vulnerability, and I didn't like it. It's a reminder that no matter how powerful you get, there's always something out there that can topple you. Wise words, said Vex. When I return to full strength, I'll be back to my usual charming self. But right now, I want you to shut up and do what I tell you. The scepter is hidden in Valkyrie's house, probably her bedroom. It's bonded to her baby sister, so she won't be able to use it. But even so, if it's out there, it's a threat. It's something that can hurt me, kill me. I cannot stand those things. The irrational part of Sanguine's mind expected her to swing round and pounce on him, and he brought his hand closer to the dagger. I want it in my possession, Darkus continued. I'm thinking of hiding it on the moon, once I've mastered space travel. The scepter, Vex said, giving another nod. We'll retrieve it for you. You have my ward. Is there anything else I can help you with? Faced with Vex's calm demeanor, Darkus paused, allowed herself to stop fretting. Your brothers and sisters, are they ready to strike? They await your command. I haven't heard of any major remnant disruption. You asked us to lay low, said Vex. That's what we're doing. How have you kept them under control? Vex shrugged. I like to think all they needed was the right kind of leadership. I'm their boss, but I'm also their friend, you know? Darkus took a moment. You don't talk to me the way the others do. Because they're afraid of you, said Vex. And you're not? Why should I be? You're going to destroy the world. You're my dream girl. Darkus grunted. Next time I call. Be here sooner. Vex flashed her a dazzling smile. Your wish, my lady. He bowed again and left. Darkus turned to Foe and Samuel. Are you scared of me? Samuel didn't reply. Sanguine doubted anyone expected him to. I have a healthy respect for your power, said Foe. In some circles, that may be seen as a type of fear. And you, Billy Ray? Darkus asked. Are you scared of me? He saw no point in lying. Yes. And yet, Darkus said, walking closer, you released Tanith. You let her escape, and you stayed. You didn't even try to run. If you're so scared of me, why are you still here? Because you'd probably be able to find me, Sanguine said. I felt I had a better chance talking to you face to face than running away from you. At the very least, I'd be able to see the killing blow coming. Interesting. She stopped, just out of arm's reach. Did she know? Did she know he possessed one of the only weapons in the world that could kill her? 
He waited for her to take one more step. One more step, he decided, and he'd go for the dagger, no matter what. You miss her, don't you? He licked his lips. You sorry? Tanith, she's not here anymore, and that makes you sad. Hey, Billy Ray, I remember being sad. Sad is not fun. So what are you going to do? As regards... Me. Us. I think it's time to be honest with each other, don't you? You were only on my side because you were tagging along with Tanith, right? She's the only reason you were here. I guess. So what happens now? Are you going to leave me too? She took another step forward. His hand remained where it was. The dagger remained where it was. He chose his next words with care. Well, I mean, I figured this is the winning side. And I ain't never been on the winning side before. So I'll probably stick around, if you'll have me. You really mean that? Darka said, clapping her hands in delight. Sure, he said, his heart sinking. Why not? What do you think, Vincent? What do you think, Samuel? Should we trust him? Not one bit, said Fo. Oh, you are no fun, Darker said, and turned her smile back to Sanguine. This means so much to me, it truly does. You really want me to destroy the world? You really want me to end your life along with everyone else's? Uh-huh. Oh, that is good news. Thought you might want to kill me last. Because of the loyalty and all. Loyalty, Darka said. Of course. She kept that delighted look on her face. But Sanguine wasn't fooled. So what's the plan, boss? The plan? Well... I've learned all I can as a physical form. I think my next state of being will be pure thought. Yes, I like that idea. But there are two things delaying me. The first is Erskine Ravel. He took ghastly from us. I'm still angry about that, so I think just for my own sense of closure, I need to find Ravel again and punish him. I need to drive him mad with pain and then destroy him utterly. He doesn't deserve to live on as energy. And the second thing? Darkus hesitated. Valkyrie. It kills me to say this, it really does, but without her, I'm not all I could be. I'll never live up to my true potential until we're one being again. I'd like to see Mavalent using the magic-sucking thing on me then. Rad. Okay, so what are you going to do? End her life, Darkus said simply. Absorb her energy. Once I'm whole, I'll be ready. Ready for what? She smiled. For what happens next? 62. The Knock on the Door Fletcher teleported Valkyrie home. Can I see? he asked. She put her fingers to her lips, went to her bedroom door, and listened. Her parents were downstairs. She turned back to Fletcher, took off her jacket, and showed him her arm. Wow, he said. She pulled back the sleeve of a t-shirt, revealing the whole tattoo. Long swirls of solid black tumbled from her shoulder. They twisted round her bicep linking with angular slashes that ran from the triceps to just above the elbow. Between these shapes were a dozen different markings that, by turn, bisected, separated, and joined the two sections. It was a sigil comprised of smaller sigils, a tattoo that China had never tried before. She was, however, confident it would work. I was thinking of getting one, Fletcher said. Not that, obviously, but a tattoo. Of what? Valkyrie asked. Your own face? I can see you with a tattoo of your own face. That'd be typical of you. Fletcher tried to smile. Yeah, he said. It would. But I was actually thinking of getting just Stephanie across my arm. Oh, 
said Valkyrie. Right. Well, you know, that's... Listen, we haven't had a chance to talk since... since she died. I'm sorry about that. I really am. Don't be, said Fletcher. I'm the one who ran, and when I got myself together enough to come back, you were going through your surge. How was that, by the way? Painful. You know when someone tells you it's painful? You should really believe them. Oh, joy, he muttered. I can't wait for mine. Fletch, are you okay? He smiled again. But this time it wasn't forced. It was sad. I don't know, Val. On the outside I feel normal things. I'm in mourning. I miss her. I think I may have loved her. Maybe. I feel all that, and I think about that. But then, on the inside, I feel terrible. Like guilty. Because of the things she probably heard. And what she thought before she died. And what she thought of me, and... So I have these normal feelings of loss, but I also have these selfish feelings of me, me, me. And I don't know which is stronger. I'm not altogether sure I'm a nice person. You are, Fletch. But my sadness isn't all about Stephanie. A lot of it's about me. Of course. You've lost her. You've suffered a loss. You have to deal with that. He shook his head. Other people don't. Other people are capable of feeling sad for the person who died. How do you know? Can you look inside their minds? Maybe everyone feels this exact same way when they lose someone they care about. I mean, mourning itself is selfish, and there's nothing wrong with that. There was a quiet beep from the triangular piece of metal on Fletcher's belt. Time to go, he said. We're going to have to follow a load of complicated directions to get to this necropolis place. Sure, we'll be teleporting instead of walking, but we still have to travel slowly or else we miss clues or turns or whatever. Skullduggery reckons we'll be searching for at least a day. You'd better get going then. Thanks for the lift home. On impulse, she hugged him. You're going to be fine, she whispered. He smiled and vanished. Valkyrie changed into jeans and pulled on a warm top. Then she took a few deep breaths and went downstairs. Her parents were in the living room playing with Alice. The mood was unusually sombre for playtime. Hi, Valkyrie said. Stevie, Alice cried and hurtled over. Didn't hear you come in, said her mum. She stayed on the floor, her feet tucked beneath her. Valkyrie scooped up Alice. Fletcher dropped me off. We teleported. Her mum sighed. Yes, of course. Tanith said she'd been keeping in touch with you. Valkyrie's dad nodded as he sat into his armchair. She called over and rang to tell us you were out of your surge. Am I getting that right, surge? That's right. Oh, good. She said you were in huge amounts of pain. It wasn't that bad. She told us a lot about what sorcerers do, her mum said. Told us stories. She told us about a man who can make people believe whatever he tells them. That's Geoffrey. You could have asked Geoffrey to brainwash us, couldn't you? Made us forget about this magic thing. Yes, said Valkyrie. I thought about it, but I didn't want to lie to you any more. It's just too hard, too complicated. I think you have a right to know. No one else thinks that, by the way. If you have a mortal family, the generally accepted rule is that you keep them in the dark for as long as you can. And then what? Then you leave. You come up with an elaborate story, and you disappear, or you fake your own death. They wanted you to fake your own death, Valkyrie hesitated. Sorcerers live longer than other people. They live for hundreds of years, providing the world doesn't end in the next few days, and providing I survive. I'll probably stay looking eighteen until I'm at least forty or fifty. Her mum had tears in her eyes as she stood. You're never going to grow up? Valkyrie smiled. I am grown up, Mum. I'm just going to age really slowly from here on out. I'll be the youngest looking forty year old you know. You'll be missing out on a normal life. What's so great about a normal life? I'm going to be strong and fit and healthy for centuries. I'm going to live an extraordinary life. If you can call that living. 
What about meeting someone? Falling in love? Raising a family? I can still do that. But we won't get to see it. We'll keep ageing. We'll die and you'll carry on and you'll have no one left. We won't get to see you start a family. I want grandchildren, Steph. Mum, you're not being fair. You're not being fair. This is about more than just you. When Alice is old enough, what's she going to think? Is she going to be like you? Like me? Magic, her mum said, making it sound like a dirty word. I don't know, Valkyrie answered, suddenly hurt. She put Alice down gently. Maybe, maybe not, but we don't have to tell her. And when she realises that her big sister isn't getting any older, or when she sees her big sister flying around in a broomstick or casting spells or whatever it is you do, she's not going to want to join in the fun. Mum, I don't have all the answers. When you were born, I wanted you to be special. Of course I did. Every mother does. Every parent does. Please, God, let my child be the smartest and the prettiest and the best at everything. Let her have all the advantages in the world. But there's another thought, and it rests just underneath that one. That thought is, please, please let my child be ordinary. Let her just be smart enough and just pretty enough and just special enough to get what she wants and be happy. Extraordinary people are outcasts, Steph. They're shunned. They're called names. They're hated and feared and misunderstood. I just wanted you to be happy. I am happy. Des, feel free to contribute. Don't you dare make me the bad guy in this. Valkyrie's dad was silent a moment longer, and she knew he was sorting his thoughts into some kind of order in his head. When he was ready, he spoke. I think it's wonderful. Valkyrie looked up. You can't be serious, her mom said. I don't want our daughter risking her life any more than you do, Melissa. But that's what she does. She risks her life for others. It's amazing. It's inspiring. When she was a kid, you never wanted to read her princess stories. Do you remember that? You said she gets enough princess stories rammed down her throat from cartoons and toys and colouring books. You wanted her to colour in pictures of astronauts and footballers, and you wanted to read her stories about adventurers and mad scientists. Remember, in spite of everything we did, she went through a pink stage anyway, where everything had to involve princesses. She got bored of that pretty quickly, didn't she? Not conforming to society's view of what girls should be is one thing, Des, and it's a good thing, but this, this is insane. It's what you wanted for her. Valkyrie's mum looked shocked. Are you saying this is my fault? It's no one's fault, Melissa. No one is at fault. There's nothing wrong with what she's doing. She's a hero. Our job now is to support her. I can't support our daughter living a life like this. You can't expect me to. Jesus, Des, she's going to get herself killed. She's fighting to save us all. Let someone else do it, her mum shouted. And Alice started crying. There are plenty of people with magic powers running around this place. Let them handle it. It doesn't work that way, and you know it. Valkyrie's mum picked up Alice. If something happens to her, Des, if she gets hurt, if she... If our daughter dies, I will never forgive you. Holding Alice tightly to her, she walked out. Valkyrie's dad watched her go. Do your best not to die, sweetie, he said quietly. She's the only one who knows how to work the dishwasher. Then he followed after her. Valkyrie went to bed early that night. She wanted to call Skullduggery to talk this through, but he was out trying to find the necropolis. She would have called Tanith, but found herself hesitating. Even though the remnant was gone, even though Tanith was back to her old self, ignoring the last two years was something Valkyrie couldn't do easily. She realized then that the person she needed to speak to wasn't there any more, and she cried for Stephanie and finally went to sleep. The next morning started in silence. Valkyrie woke up early, nightmares driving her from slumber, but got up late, almost midday. She pulled on her dressing gown over a pair of light shorts and a T-shirt. She stood in her room and listened to her parents downstairs. She didn't even know what day it was. Was it the weekend? Was it a Sunday? She didn't want to go down. 
She didn't want to find out that her parents hadn't spoken to each other all night. Her folks never argued. There was never tension in the air. She left her room. The door to Alice's room was open, and Alice lay napping in her cot. Valkyrie couldn't help it. She looked at her sister and smiled. Her baby sister always made her smile. She went downstairs. Someone knocked on the door, and she went to answer it, tightening the sash round her waist as she did so. Her bare feet settled into the bristles of the welcome mat, and her hand went to the latch, twisted it to the right. She pulled the door open, smiling politely in gentle anticipation. The smile didn't leave her face, even as she saw Di Maybury standing there. It left her face when he hit her, though. As she stumbled back, blood spouting from her nose, sudden tears in her eyes, her mouth was opening to what? Curse? Cry out? Threaten? She'd never know, because he was already in the hall with her, and he grabbed her and hurtled her into the living room door. It burst open under the impact, and she sprawled over the armchair. She heard her mother's cry of alarm and a rush of feet, and she raised her head in time to see Di's hand collide with her mother's jaw. Her mum collapsed. Valkyrie shoved the armchair out of the way and dived at Di. He batted down her arms keeping her fingers from his eyes, and she followed up with a headbutt that she realized too late he was expecting. His elbow cracked into her cheek, and lights flashed behind her eyes, and he pivoted out of the way and let her own momentum take her into the wall. Her shoulder dislodged some family photographs. One of them, in a heavy frame, fell right on her foot. She didn't notice. Her father came running in, charging straight at Di who watched him come and moved only at the last moment, hip-throwing Desmond Edgley to the carpet. Di leaned over, hit him three times, and Valkyrie's dad stayed down. The room spun, and Valkyrie lurched upright. She went to run at Di, but her knees bent without warning, and she stumbled sideways, falling out of the coffee table. Di walked by her. She watched him go, her eyes unfocused. He went upstairs. She needed to get her head straight. She was stunned. Her equilibrium was shot. Blood ran from her nose. She was close to passing out. Concussion? Maybe. If she was concussed, then passing out would be the worst thing she could possibly do. She took a moment, breathed in through her mouth, working to sharpen her thoughts. Upstairs, she heard movement. Di was searching for something. What was he searching for? The scepter. Valkyrie stood. The sounds of the search upstairs had ceased. He'd found it. Her vision no longer swam. She was back in control. She grabbed the poker from the fireplace as Di came down the stairs. She ran into the hall, about to swing it at his head. Di was calm. Why was he calm? She saw the backpack over his shoulder, the backpack containing the scepter. In his arms, he carried the sleeping beauty, little baby Alice. Valkyrie froze, horrified beyond measure. Di drove a kick into her stomach so hard it launched her back off her feet. She hit the wall and bounced off, falling to her hands and knees and then curling into a ball. That dreadful panic seized her, the terror that comes with not being able to draw breath. She forced open her eyes, maneuvered her seized-up body around enough to see out of the front door to where Di was opening her mother's car. Moving with a calmness born of unnerving, unnatural confidence, Di put Alice in the back seat and set about strapping her in. Gritting her teeth, Valkyrie made her body straighten. Her muscles screamed at her, begging to contract, but she straightened her spine, arched her back, managed to suck in a sliver of air. Feeling sick, feeling weak, winded, terrified and desperate, she rolled over, pushed herself up, the poker still in her hand. Satisfied that Alice was secure, Di closed the door gently so as not to wake her and put the bag containing the scepter on the passenger seat. He walked round the car, and when he was at the closest point of the house, Valkyrie ran at him. He saw her at the last moment, ducked the poker, but she kept coming, ramming her shoulder into his sternum. He fell back onto the bonnet, and Valkyrie swung back towards his head. He rolled off the car, the poker striking the windscreen, cracking it, 
and he grabbed her wrist. Valkyrie let go of the weapon, jabbed her free hand at his eyes. Di cursed, released her, stumbled away, trying to clear his vision. She tore the sash from her dressing gown, looped it over his head from behind, and tightened. Di gagged, fingers digging into his own neck as he tried to loosen the stranglehold. Valkyrie pulled him backwards, tightening the loop with vicious tugs. His heels kicked, pulverizing the flower bed. Then he got his legs beneath him, and he powered backwards, the back of his head crashing into Valkyrie's face. They both went down, the sash lost amid the mad scramble. Her face stung with that numb feeling just before the pain kicks in. She felt his hands on her, pulling her up. She slipped out of her sleeves, leaving him holding her dressing gown. She spun, her hands latching onto the back of his neck, and she jumped, driving a knee into his solar plexus. She held on, kept throwing knees, just like Tanith had taught her, never letting up, never giving him a moment to counter. She touched down with her right foot, and her ankle gave, and in that moment, Di moved. His left arm snaked over her shoulder, his hand clutching her back, and his right shot down and under her legs, all the way under his hand grabbing the back of her shorts. Suddenly Valkyrie was being lifted and turned, and she clutched at him, but there was nothing she could do to stop him from tipping forward. They hit the driveway, die on top, and for the second time in less than a minute, her breath left her. She lay there, groaning, eyes open and blinking. Die looked at her, the black veins running beneath his skin. Nice try, he said, and stood brushed himself down. Valkyrie grabbed weakly at his ankle. He looked down at her hand and slowly raised his foot. She lost her grip and her hand fell to the ground. He gave her a little smile and stomped. Valkyrie sat up, screaming, clutching her broken fingers to her chest. And I walked back to the car, got in behind the wheel and reversed out of the driveway. Her screams had turned to sobs by the time he drove away. 63. The City Below The search for the necropolis took them to Scotland. Fletcher's feet were sore. The night had been cold, and he lagged behind Skullduggery and Wreath, finally giving up altogether and sitting down. He left the searching to the experts, and as long as he could keep them in sight... He could teleport to their side whenever they needed him. Because of this, he only heard snippets of the conversation. At first, silence had reigned. He knew the two men had never liked each other, and so he'd expected this. But gradually a conversation had sparked up, and he caught a few barbed comments every time he was close enough to listen in. They mentioned Wyoming once or twice, and the war, the old war, with Mevolent. Fletcher left them to their argument. When he was hungry, he teleported off to grab something nice to eat. When he needed a warmer jacket, he teleported away to get it. When he needed to use the bathroom, he teleported to an annoying celebrity's house, and he didn't bother flushing. But he spent most of his time not thinking about Stephanie. When the sun came up, all Fletcher wanted to do was sleep. He sat with his back against a tree and dozed until his phone rang. We found it. Skullduggery said. Fletcher stood. It was a cold day and the seat of his jeans was damp. He looked around, saw nothing but trees and rocks and sky. Turn south, said Skullduggery. Fletcher turned. That's east. Okay, that's north. There you go. See us? In the distance, Fletcher saw a burst of fire. He put away his phone and teleported over to Skullduggery's side. Wreath was standing at a doorway cut into a rock wall. Skullduggery still had his phone in his hand, and when he moved closer to the doorway, the screen blanked. Skullduggery examined it. A dead zone, he murmured. Fletcher, stay close. We won't be able to use these. Fletcher nodded. The steps were black marble. Wreath led the way down, and Fletcher stayed beside Skullduggery. It was cold, and getting colder, dark, and getting darker. 
Flames sputtered in the iron brackets that were hammered into the walls. The space was tight, and the ceiling sloped with them. Nobody spoke. Their feet echoed. They kept going down. Once more the cold got colder, once more the dark got darker. And then the ceiling came to a sudden end, and their surroundings opened to a vast city of concrete with a rock sky and a thousand glowing orbs of light. Fletcher stopped, frozen in an unexpected moment of awe. The buildings, featureless save for the narrow rectangular windows, formed a maze of right angles. The streets were narrow, made for people, not carriages. To set foot in this city was to be lost. Fletcher somehow knew this. We can go no further, said Reith. The living cannot cross into the necropolis. Only the dead may go. Don't suppose you got a map, Handy? Skullduggery asked. Reith smiled. Sadly, I do not. We'll be watching, though. There's a balcony in the rock wall that gives us a panoramic view of the place. We can shout out directions from there, if you'd like. Wonderful. So what can I expect? In order to activate the sigil, you'll need to get to the square in the exact centre of the city. On your way, you'll be faced with two challenges. I don't know what they are, and I don't know how to beat them. Once you get past them, you'll face the Guardian in the final challenge. I'm assuming that one's a brawl, which should make you happy. I know how you like to hit things. One of my hobbies, Skullduggery murmured. Skullduggery continued on while Fletcher followed Wreath to a hidden staircase that led up to a long room with an open balcony. Fletcher hurried over, stood with his hands on the cold stone, looking down at the city. He saw Skullduggery almost immediately, a lone figure moving in the stillness. More than that, though, he heard him. He heard every footstep. Somehow the acoustics of this huge chamber fed the sounds from the city up into the balcony. Wreath reached out, and Fletcher realized there was glass in front of him. At least, he thought it was glass. A few swipes of Wreath's hand, and their view of Skullduggery was magnified. "'That's pretty cool,' Fletcher said. "'Indeed it is,' said Wreath. They followed Skullduggery's progress for ten minutes. Shouted directions were not needed, as it turned out. Skullduggery was reading the air— somehow divining what path came to a dead end and what led on. Then there was movement, and a shape emerged from the shadows. Who goes there? The voice was male, Scottish. The viewing window showed a person in a black robe, wearing a porcelain mask. Skullduggery stopped and observed the shape. My name is Skullduggery Pleasant. I'm here to activate the Marin sigil. Do you mean to stop me? No, said the shape, and Fletcher realized that it wasn't a mask he wore, but his actual face, porcelain and delicate and astonishingly creepy. I am the Inquisitor. I mean only to test you. Whether or not I have to stop you will depend on the outcome. What's the test? A simple one. A test of purity. You have no skin, I see. Nor blood, nor organ. Correct. A curious creature. I know of some who would very much like to examine one such as you. Would you be willing to be examined? Probably not. A pity, said the Inquisitor. If you agreed to be examined, I could let you pass. I would deem that a worthy enough compromise. I'm not here to compromise, said Skullduggery. I'm here to take the test and activate the sigil. But the route I offer you is easier. All it would require is your consent to be examined. I assure you, it would take no longer than the life of a day. I said no. The Inquisitor was silent for a moment. I know of some who know you, Skeleton. 
They whisper in my ear even now. They know the things you have done. They know of the things done to you. They know of your wife and child. Now it was Skullduggery's turn to pause. What does any of this have to do with the test? Your wife and child, said the Inquisitor, murdered in front of you by a man whom you later turned to dust. They died screaming. They died begging you to save them. Your existence from that point on has been defined by that moment. If you're trying to provoke me, it won't work, Skullduggery said. These are not my words, said the Inquisitor. These are the words being whispered in my ear. Who's doing the whispering? Now there was amusement in the Inquisitor's voice. Ones who know you, ones who are aware of you, ones you would not wish to be aware of you. Any of them got such a thing as a name? You and your kind rely so much on names, said the Inquisitor. But there are those who do not. Fantastic, Skullduggery said. Can we please get to the point before... Your wife and child, said the Inquisitor. Skullduggery stopped. What? They whispered to me also. They are here in this city, waiting for you. They're dead, and this is not the city of the dead. They've been dead hundreds of years, said Skullduggery. They've gone. They're not here. No part of them is here. You're lying. Why? If you believe that I am lying, you can pass on and I will not stop you. What about the test? This is the test. Skullduggery didn't move for a few seconds. Fletcher glanced at Wreath. The necromancer had a slight frown on his face. Skullduggery walked by the Inquisitor, and the Inquisitor stepped into the shadows and vanished. That was easy, said Fletcher. So it would seem, said Wreath. Fletcher frowned. It was too easy, wasn't it? Wreath nodded. So it would seem. Sixty-four. Chasing Alice. Valkyrie's mum helped her dress. Get Fletcher, her dad said, his eyes frantic. He appears and disappears, doesn't he? He'll take us right to Alice. Fletch teleports to places, not to people, Valkyrie said while her mum guided her right foot into its boot. Her ankle was sore, but at least she could walk in it. The rest of her ached. Her ribs, her face, her jaw... Her left hand was already swelling up to twice its normal size. The pain would have been excruciating were it not for the leaves she chewed. Her mother pulled the cuffs off Valkyrie's trousers down over her boots, and Valkyrie stood up from the bed. Hissing, she slipped her left arm through the sleeve of her jacket, and her mum helped her with the right, then zipped it up. "'We're coming with you,' her mum said. She'd been quiet since Valkyrie had stumbled back into the house. Now Valkyrie knew why. No, Valkyrie said, limping out of the room. This is dangerous. You have to stay here. Alice is our daughter, and we're coming with you, her mum said. Valkyrie got to the bathroom, grabbed a wet cloth, and cleaned the blood from her face. Wiped her eyes, too. Di will kill you. I thought Di was one of the good guys, said her dad. He is, said Valkyrie. He's got a remnant inside him. He isn't himself. She dropped the cloth, turned to them. Dad, please say you understand why neither of you can come. I'm going after Alice. I know this world, and I know these people, and I'm used to things like this. We're wasting time, said her mum. Valkyrie looked at her parents, realised there was no way she was going to win this argument, and her mother was right. Di already had a five-minute head start on them. Fine, she said. I'm driving. I'm driving her dad corrected, already heading downstairs. You're injured, and your car is slow, and you're not a very good driver. Valkyrie limped quickly after him. I'm a very good driver. He grabbed his keys from the hall table and stood at the door impatiently. Not at the speed we're going to be travelling at. 
There were two roads out of Haggard, one going south, one going north. They took the one going south, and the old familiar countryside whipped by at a worrying rate. Going over the slight hills, the car actually left the road a few times, sending a wave of weightlessness churning through Valkyrie's belly. Melissa Edgley, in the passenger seat, held on tight, but didn't caution her husband to slow down. Valkyrie's dad swerved round a tractor on a tight bend. Not even that elicited a complaint. Valkyrie realized her parents had become missiles, locked onto their target, unmindful of anything else. For a curious moment, she felt like she was a kid again, strapped into the back seat of the car while she took a drive with her folks. Maybe they were going to the cinema or the zoo or maybe to her uncle's house. Wherever they were going, she was safe, because she was with her mum and dad, and nothing bad ever happened when she was with her mum and dad. The pain from her hand brought her back to the present. Her fingers were now a deep, ugly purple that ran past her knuckles to the back of her hand. She could move her thumb and her pinky, but the others were useless. Every time the car took a turn, every time Valkyrie swayed in her seat, the pain stabbed at her despite the leaves that had left their usual bitter aftertaste in her mouth. Where do we go? her dad asked, his voice tight. Valkyrie looked up. Around the next few bends, there was a straight stretch of road, and at the end of that was a junction. They could go right towards Balbriggan or straight into Lusk, or left towards Dublin. Left, she said. Where is he taking her? her mum asked, keeping her eyes fixed on the road. Thurlis, Valkyrie said. That's where the other remnants are. That's where Dexter Vex is. She didn't say why they wanted her baby sister. She didn't mention the scepter or the fact that in order for Vex to be able to use the scepter, he'd have to kill Alice. She'll be fine, she said instead. Dexter won't hurt her. He'll just use her to lure me in. They got to the straight stretch of road. There was a line of slow-moving cars ahead of them, puttering lazily along. Valkyrie's dad beeped his horn and flashed his lights at oncoming traffic, warning them that he was about to do something stupid. Then he swerved into the middle of the road, overtaking everything in his path while other cars turned sharply to avoid a collision. He clipped a wing mirror and got a blast of a horn in response, but they'd already reached the junction. The car drifted a little as it made the turn. Valkyrie's phone was in her left pocket. She reached across with her good hand, lifting her hips to allow her fingers access. She lost her grip, tried again managed to pull it out slightly, like a turtle emerging from its shell. She lifted her hips again, got a firmer grip, pulled it out. Immediately, she dialed Skullduggery's number. It went straight to voicemail, as she feared it would. Skullduggery's not answering, she said. You've got other friends, said Melissa. Call them. Call the girl with the sword. Call all the magic people. She couldn't. If it got out that Alice was bonded to the scepter and the scepter was up for grabs, then her sister would never be safe again. Your haven's in lockdown, she said. No calls in or out. But I don't need them. I can get Alice back myself. With our help, her dad said. Valkyrie said nothing. The day was pulling the brightness from the sky, and by the time they reached Thurlis it was beginning to get legitimately dark. The streets were quiet. Empty. No cars passed them. No one was out walking. Valkyrie's dad slowed their car to a crawl. I don't like this, he said. It feels like a trap. How would you know what a trap feels like? Her mum said. I just know. Steph? Valkyrie nodded. It feels like a trap. Pull over somewhere. I'll look around and come back. No chance, her mum said turning in her seat. We all go. And what will you do if there's trouble, hmm? These people will be trying to kill us. Then I'll fight, said her mum. Anyone comes after me, I'll kick them between the legs. Valkyrie sighed. Mum, I'm not staying behind Steph. I've made my decision. Fine, Valkyrie said, biting back her frustration. She looked to the residential street ahead. After a few seconds, her scowl softened. But don't kick them there. Why not? Isn't that the best place to kick them? Des, you don't like being kicked there, do you? He frowned. I don't like being kicked anywhere. 
First of all, Valkyrie said, kicking anyone is a bad idea when you're in danger. You're panicking. You've got adrenaline shooting through you. You've got all these new instincts screaming at you. Your body wants to flee or fight. It needs to make itself lighter, so it wants to empty its bowels and its bladder. You're going to want to pee yourself. That's perfectly normal. But your legs are jelly. You're suddenly trembling so much your teeth are chattering. You really want to kick someone when you don't even know if your other leg will support you? I suppose not, her mother said, frowning. And if you do kick, there's no guarantee you're going to hit what you're aiming for. And if you do hit what you're aiming for, the pain could take seconds to travel to his brain. He can do an awful lot of damage in those few seconds. Then there's also the risk that kicking him there will just make him mad. Okay, her mum said. Fine, I won't kick them between the legs. But is there anywhere I can hit them? I don't think I'd be able to punch very hard. But if they're all as strong as Di Mabry was... You can't build muscle on your throat, said Valkyrie. The throat's vulnerable. And I don't care how many push-ups you can do. Your eyelids aren't going to get any tougher. Everyone has eyes. Well, almost everyone. Throats and eyes, said her mum. Okay, that sounds straightforward enough. Her dad pulled over. They got out. Valkyrie winced with every movement, but she limped to a small tree in someone's front garden and pulled three twigs from it. She kept one for herself and gave the others to her parents. Hold these with your thumb pressed against it, she said, like this. Will this ward the remnants off? her mom asked. Valkyrie shook her head. We don't have anything to fight them with. Look, remnants are little shadowy creatures that fly around, and when they possess you, when they're inside, it's instantaneous. One moment you're you, the next you're not. How do they get inside? They attach themselves to your face and force their way down your throat. Her dad clamped his hand over his mouth. That won't do a whole lot of good, Dad. The point is, if we're spotted, a remnant could possess one of us in a matter of seconds and the rest of us wouldn't know it. So, if you see one, you break the twig, okay? Just press your thumb down and the twig will snap. An unbroken twig means we're all who we say we are. A broken twig means one of us isn't. Her mum suddenly hunkered down. Oh, I don't feel well. My legs are weak. They're all wobbly. Then stay in the car, Valkyrie said. No, no, it's just nerves. It'll pass. Look! She forced herself to stand. She was so pale. Mum, I know you want to help, but if you're not ready for this, you're going to be a hindrance. I won't be, her mum said. My daughters need me. Lee down, Steph! Reluctantly, Valkyrie started forward. Their progress through the town was slow. They darted as best they could from cover to cover, but all too often they had to cross a lot of open ground without anything to hide behind. Thankfully, there was no one around to see them and raise the alarm. But the closer they got to the town centre, the warier Valkyrie became. She stopped at a corner, the hairs on the back of her neck prickling. There, a woman holding a crowbar standing with her back to Valkyrie, a sentry. Valkyrie put her finger to her lips and motioned for her parents to crouch down. Then she passed her twig to her dad and left them there. She moved silently. The woman tucked the crowbar under one arm and blew into her hands a few times to keep them warm, allowing Valkyrie to sneak up right behind her. The shock stick was fully charged and ready to go, but she left it where it was. There was no telling when it might come in useful. She waited until the woman had dropped her hands back down, that she wrapped her right arm round her throat. The sleeper hold came on at once, and the woman jerked back, the crowbar falling, her fingers digging into Valkyrie's armoured sleeve. Valkyrie squeezed. Her broken hand sent white-hot daggers straight into her brain. The woman powered backwards, slamming them both into the wall. Valkyrie banged her head, but didn't let go. The woman's remnant-augmented strength was astonishing. She tried flipping Valkyrie over her shoulder, but Valkyrie wrapped her legs round her slim waist. They fell, the woman scrambling, panicking, but all she did was allow Valkyrie to adjust her position, to bend her knee round her foot. After a few more seconds, the woman went limp, and Valkyrie released her. Her parents hurried up as Valkyrie got to her feet. 
Her dad handed back her twig. That was so cool, he said. Yeah, she answered, trying not to cry with the pain. I know. They hurried on, passing another two sentries whom they left oblivious behind them. The streets became broader, more open. Valkyrie found herself wasting more and more time trying to figure out ways to progress undetected. They doubled back twice, tried a different route. Frustration biting into her words, Valkyrie said, Mum, stay here. Dad, head over to that corner and see if we can get across the street from there. I'm going to check further up. She took off before either of her parents could object, the shock stick in her hand. Her leg was getting better the more she used it, but every step was causing her pain. She only had a few leaves left, though, so she withstood the discomfort. She reached the end of the alley, found herself at a wall she could easily have jumped over with the aid of her elemental magic, but which now may as well have been a hundred meters high. She cursed under her breath, allowed herself a moment of pure anger and helplessness as she spun round, punching at nothing. Then she got herself back under control and retraced her steps. She saw her mother at the mouth of the alley, looking like she didn't have a care in the world. Valkyrie slowed. Her mother's anxiousness was gone. She was standing up straight, not looking scared any more. A dread filled Valkyrie. Was she? The twig. She needed to check the twig. Where was the twig? As she neared, she looked her mother up and down, and there it was. Her mother still held the twig, and it was in one piece. Do I know you? A man asked, just out of sight, and Valkyrie ducked back. Valkyrie's mum shook her head. Nope, don't think so. The man sauntered into view. He was middle-aged, wearing slacks and a heavy jumper. You look nervous. Do I? Valkyrie's mum said. I'm not feeling very well. Something I ate, probably. Valkyrie crept closer as the man nodded. Yeah, he said. Listen, I don't mean to be rude or anything, but... You are one of us, right? One of... Oh, you mean, am I... Do I... Am I possessed? The man laughed. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I mean. Valkyrie's mom laughed along with him. I don't take any offence at that at all. Don't worry. In fact, I take it as a compliment. Good, <laughs> the man chuckled. But the real question is, how do I know for sure that you are possessed? The man thought this was hilarious. Oh, no! <laughs> you got me! <laughs> I'm faking it! I knew it! Valkyrie's mum laughed. How will I prove it? Hmm? How could I possibly prove it to you? Oh, I know. His smiling lips turned black and the veins rose beneath his skin. How's that? His mum paused a moment, then laughed again. That's pretty convincing! I thought it might be. Now your turn. Now my turn. Exactly. Now it's my turn. Let's be having you. Valkyrie's mum's laugh was becoming strained. Are you ready? <laughs> I don't think you're ready. I'm ready. I don't think you are. Her mum laughed and laughed, but the man's laugh turned to a mere chuckle. <laughs> so let's see he said. Her mum doubled over with laughter. Okay, then, here it comes. Uh, ready? I hope you're ready. Three, two, one. Her mum straightened up. She blinked at the man. You're not one of us, he said. All laughter gone. No, Valkyrie's mum admitted. I'm confused. What exactly did you think was going to happen when you counted down? I'm not sure. I'm not very good at thinking on my feet. Apparently not. He looked around. Are you Valkyrie Kane's mother? We were told that you might be on your way. Where's your daughter? I don't know. You may as well tell me. She'll come running anyway when you start screaming. If you lay one finger on me, the man slowly pressed a finger into her chest. Yes. Valkyrie's mum hesitated. Sorry, the man said, leaning in. What was that? Valkyrie burst from cover. 
But the man heard her coming and smacked the shock stick from her grasp even as she swung. She cried out, pain shooting up her arm, and he hit her on the shoulder and she fell to her knees, fireworks going off behind her eyes. She heard a mad scramble, her dad charging into the man from behind, looked up in time to see her father get punched in the face. He stumbled back, sat down heavily with a dazed expression. Valkyrie grimaced, forced herself up as the man returned his attention to her mother. Now then, he said, what was that you are saying? Valkyrie's mom jabbed her fingers into his eyes and he howled in pain and staggered away. He tripped over his own feet, fell to his hands and knees, and Valkyrie ran up and kicked him in the chin. His hands lifted off the ground for an instant and folded beneath him when he collapsed. Ignoring the pain in her arm, Valkyrie turned to her mother. Are you okay? Mum? I'm... I... Mum, are you okay? Her mother looked at her. Everyone has eyes, she mumbled. 65. The Second Test Fletcher watched Skullduggery move through the dead city. The glass on the balcony, whatever it was, was better than any computer screen Fletcher had ever seen. At a gesture, Wreath could change their viewpoint whenever Skullduggery disappeared behind a building. He could zoom in close, swivel round to the side, tilt up and down. It was a fully controllable camera with perfect resolution. Something like this could change the face of movie-making forever. Has any sorcerer ever tried selling magic as technology? Fletcher asked. Wreath shrugged. Sure. The sanctuaries are usually very good at preventing it, but now and then they miss something and some little slice of magic slips through. Like what? Smartphones? Bluetooth? Glow-in-the-dark fridge magnets. Seriously? Oh, yes. How do you think they stick to the fridge? Magnetism? Magic. And what about the glow-in-the-dark bit? Also magic. That's amazing. Wreath nodded. Practically unbelievable, his eyes narrowed. Did you see that? Something? In the necropolis, another porcelain-faced man stepped out into the middle of the street. And who might you be? Skullduggery asked. Wreath repositioned their viewpoint. I have many names, said the man, and none. I am who I am, as we all are. You may call me the Validator, since that would appear to be my purpose. His accent was French. Right. Can we skip the talking in riddles part and go straight to the bit where you tell me what this test is? This test is about you, the Validator said. This is a test only you can take, only you can pass, and only you can fail. Is it maths? You use humor to avoid taking your situation seriously. On the contrary, I use humor because it's really, really funny. I'm curious, though. Do you live here? Do you ever leave? If you never leave and all you do is hang out with the last guy I was talking to, I can see why you're so ponderous. The city below is my home. Why would I ever want to leave? They make an excellent point. It's calm. It's peaceful. It's charming in a disquieting sort of way. Lonely, though. Oh, no, said the validator. It is anything but lonely. Sometimes, though, its citizens need some coaxing to emerge. The dead are such shy creatures. I've not found that to be the case. A woman's voice spoke up. Then you need to surround yourself with a better class of dead. Wreath frowned, pulled the viewing angle back as a shape, a ghost, drifted from one of the darkened doorways. It was female. Fletcher could see that much. And there was a face, hazy though it may have been. He saw eyes and a mouth. Hello, my love, the woman said. Skullduggery watched the ghost without speaking. I have missed you, 
Skullduggery turned to the validator. How are you doing this? This is not trickery, I assure you. It is really me, said the ghost. You're not allowed to talk, Skullduggery said, anger snapping at his voice. However you're doing this, I'm going to give you one warning. Stop it before I lose my temper. The validator took a single step back, allowing the ghost to drift closer to Skullduggery. I have been waiting for you, she said. You are not my wife. And you are not my husband, said the ghost. He was kind and gentle and loving, and he did all he could to avoid violence and bloodshed. But you, you are dark and twisted, and your soul is tormented by the things you have done. You have lost who you once were. That man is dead, and the man who's taken his place. You should be here with me, said the ghost. With us. Fletcher saw another smaller blur, the size of a child. It ran, in that indistinct way, in and out of doorways, like it was playing. Skullduggery stepped back suddenly, as if he'd been struck. His shoulders sagged. When the madman killed us, the ghost continued, we stood on the other side of life and we watched. We watched you fall. We watched what he did to you in the days after. We saw you scream and weep and beg. We prayed for you to die, for your suffering to come to an end. When he finally released you from your agony, we reached out, tried to pull you to us, to be together in peace. But you resisted. You fled back to the living world. Now the time has come again for you to join us. The child ran to its mother, and Skullduggery took another step back. I am not going anywhere. You have taken your vengeance, the ghost said. You have killed the man who murdered us. What else is keeping you here? I have debts that need repaying. He was speaking to the woman, but his head was down, looking directly at the child. As Fletcher watched, Skullduggery took one step forward. He started to reach down to the child, then stopped himself and stepped back. He stood there, trembling. Suddenly Fletcher didn't want to be seeing this. He didn't want to be seeing this at all. My love, said the woman's ghost, my sweet, you have done terrible things, things that have marked your soul. You carry that mark with you wherever you go, and because of it you have worked so hard to redeem yourself. You have saved the world. You have done so much. Surely it is time for you to be at peace. Maybe some day, but not today. My darling, you belong dead. And then another voice, as a third blurred figure stepped into view, a familiar voice. You belong dead, said ghastly bespoke. Skullduggery jerked away, raising a hand as if to ward him off. Ghastly? We're waiting for you, Ghastly said. In the cold and the dark, we're waiting. We're watching. We see everything. What are you? Skullduggery asked. Who are you? You killed my mother, Ghastly said, and Skullduggery went quiet. We see the past and the present and the future. I know the things you've done and all the lies you've told to me, to your oldest friend. If you truly see into my past, Skullduggery said, then you know what happened. You know I wasn't myself. I don't care, Ghastly said. Being dead means you don't care. You don't hold grudges. You only need. We need you, my friend. Your time is up. No, said Skullduggery. We never got to say goodbye. We never got to shake each other's hand. I'm offering it now. 
Join us! Ghastly held out his hand. Skullduggery observed it for a moment, then shook his head. I'm sorry. I can't do that. Another figure emerged from a side street. Told you, said Anton Shudder. More blurred shapes stepped into view. You belong dead, said Shudder. You deserve to rest. While I was living, I was never at peace. Now? Now I'm content. Now I can smile. Skullduggery took another step back. What is this? We are the people you have left behind, his wife said. We are the people you have let die. We are the people who have died around you. We are the people you have killed. More figures, thickening the crowd. Fletcher saw Mr. Bliss and Ken Speckle Grouse and the assassin Tesseract and the necromancer Craven. He searched the faces, eyes flickering from one blurred visage to the next until he found her. She turned in that instant, as if looking back at him. Stephanie. Fletcher grabbed Reed's arm. Is it real? Is it really them? I don't know, Reed said, disentangling himself without taking his eyes off the scene below. I don't know how the necropolis operates. I don't know what they're capable of. But it's a trick, said Fletcher. They're drawing all these memories from Skullduggery's mind or something, right? Skullduggery Pleasant does not have a mind that can be read, said Reed. But it may still be a trick. Some kind of subterfuge, or... Or what? Or it could really be them. Blocked from the great stream of life and death, like fish. One of the figures, the ghosts, reached for Skullduggery, snagging his sleeve. He yanked his arm back. What do you want? You belong here, said Ghastly. Stay with us, said Skullduggery's wife. A hole was opening in the ground, widening till it filled the narrow street. Some of the figures slipped down into it without alarm. Others saw it and willingly let themselves fall. Skullduggery looked back at the validator. That was this part of the test. What does this prove? People I've known have died. I've lived for over four hundred years. A lot of people die in four hundred years. These are your dead, said the validator. Did you bring them here? What gives you the right to hold them in this place? I'm not just here, said Ghastly. They're everywhere. At all times, we're with you when you're a boy, or with you on your wedding day. The day you die, the day you die again. We see you laughing and screaming. We see you whole and we see you broken. We see you when the worlds collide and when the darkness falls. We see you surrounded by blood and fire and rotting flesh. You see my future, Skullduggery said, so you know I have one. I don't go with you today, Ghastly. But if you want to help me, if you really want to help me, you can tell me how to beat Darkus. She can't be beaten, said Shudder. I don't believe that. It does not matter what you believe, his wife said. Her hand closed round his arm, and ghastly seized his hand. Skullduggery tried pulling back, but now Shudder was gripping him, and someone else, and then another, and they were pulling him towards the hole, and they were losing their faces, their forms merging into one blurred mass that was sinking beneath the surface. Skullduggery cursed and twisted, but could do little as more hands emerged to grab hold. One pulled at his ankle, and he went down, and they dragged him, kept dragging him, and he lost his hat, and now it was just him, clinging on while dozens of hands reached for him, gripped him, and all of a sudden he slid under, and the hole closed up. Skullduggery was gone. Fletcher stared. What? What does that mean? I don't know, said Reith. He sounded genuinely stunned. Is he okay? Fletcher asked. Where is he? Wreath shook his head. I'm not entirely sure what has just happened. 
Fletcher watched the validator step forward, looking down at Skullduggery's hat. He reached down to pick it up, but froze. The hole opened and Skullduggery lunged upwards, his jacket torn, his tie wrenched to one side. An unholy chorus of anguished cries followed him, and all at once there were a hundred hands reaching up from the darkness. Skullduggery rolled, got to his feet, so he was standing beside the validator. So this test is about facing your personal demons or something, he asked. Well, how about you face them instead? And he pushed the validator and the validator toppled and the hands grabbed him and he vanished into the hole. The hole closed up once again, and silence descended. Skullduggery fixed his tie and buttoned his jacket, then he picked up his hat, dusted it off, put it on. 66. Table Manners Eventually Valkyrie stopped hiding. The remnants knew they were there. Of course they knew. They couldn't not know. So with her parents behind her, Valkyrie walked to the town square where all the people were. Black lips, black veins. They stood silently, watching her. Hundreds of them. Above their heads, more remnants flitted. Thousands. But they didn't swoop. They didn't attack. The crowd parted. Valkyrie and her parents walked right through. The path led to a restaurant. The door was held open by Di Mabry. He didn't say anything as they passed him. Vex sat at a table in the corner, cutting into a bloody steak. The strap of the scepter bag crossed his chest. On the table beside him, with an easy arm's reach, was Alice, sleeping in her car seat. Valkyrie's parents started forward immediately. But Vex glanced up, black veins rising beneath his skin, and they froze. The veins faded, and Vex went back to his dinner. He speared a ragged bit of steak with his fork, popped it into his mouth, and chewed with his eyes closed. I was a vegetarian once, he said. For about two years, back in the late sixties, I met this girl, Sally, who you'd probably— Give us Alice back, Valkyrie said. Vex opened his eyes. Let me finish, he said. He took a sip of wine, put the glass down, and continued. So Sally, she was a nice girl, what you'd probably call a hippie. This was in San Francisco during the Vietnam War. And I went on peace marches with her, and I grew my hair, and I thought, this might be it. She got me into eating rice and lentils and green beans, and for a while, hey, life was good but we went to the airport this one time to pick up some friends of hers flying in from New York, and there was this G.I. walking past, this soldier back from the war in his army greens in his bag over his shoulder, searching the crowd for his wife or his girlfriend or his folks. And Sally doesn't even think. She doesn't even hesitate. She just spits on him. Spits on him and calls him a baby killer. Now, let's be clear. I did not agree with what the Americans did in Vietnam. But even if you object to the war, you respect the warrior. That's always been my feeling on the subject. So I cut my hair, and two days later I was in the Congo, tracking down the head of a death cult. You don't say vegetarian for very long when you're hiking through the jungle. He chewed another piece of steak, savoured it, and swallowed. Valkyrie looked him dead in the eye. What do you want? Well, that's the thing, you see. I am a mess of conflicting desires. The man in me wants to help you. The remnant in me wants to tear you apart. But the two together simply want a compromise. Give Alice back and we'll compromise, Valkyrie's dad said. Vex held up a finger to silence him. Hush now, Desmond. The adults are talking. When we first heard about the glimpse into the future, where darkness would decimate the world, we were positively giddy with delight. That's the world for us, we said. What we'd like, what we'd really love, is a future with maybe a tenth of the world's current population left alive. 
Enough for us to play with, but not enough to cause us any problems. Darkus is not going to leave anyone alive, said Valkyrie. Exactly, said Vex. When we started to realize the full extent of our plans, our giddiness faded. Only Foe and his crazy bunch of nihilists would find Darkus's ultimate aim attractive, because not only do they want to die, but they want the world to die with them. And, to be honest, we also saw how she treats remnants when they've served their purpose. Let's just say that they hold no special place in her heart. So now you're scared of her? Vex smiled. The same as everybody else. So I'll ask you again. What do you want? We wish to offer you our support. Sorcerers and remnants working together in perfect harmony. Can you think of anything more beautiful? Problem is, remnants can't be trusted. Normally, I'd agree with you, said Vex. In fact, even now, I agree with you. But we promise to be good. How exactly do you see this working? Are you going to join our army? So you'll either possess hundreds of sorcerers or thousands of mortals? Do you really think anyone would agree to that? Do you really think you can pass up this opportunity? Vex asked. As you say, there are thousands of us, each with a vast personal collection of knowledge and talents just waiting to be shared. Valkyrie pulled up a chair and sat. If your accumulated wisdom is so great, then how come you haven't figured out a way to stop Darkus without our help? Vex smiled at her. Darkus is tricky. There's no way China will agree to this. But if you let us leave with Alice, I'll do my best to convince her. Why are you so worried about the baby? Vex asked. Look at her. She's fine. She cried a bit earlier, but I changed her nappy, fed her, and she went right back to sleep. Then I'll stay, said Valkyrie. Let my parents take her and you can keep me. That won't do, I'm afraid. I'll need Alice if I want to activate the scepter. What do you mean? Valkyrie's mum asked. And Valkyrie went pale. But Vex looked at her mum. And instead of opting for the cruel option, instead of explaining that Alice would have to die, he simply said, For reasons too complicated to go into, your baby is the only one who can charge a very powerful weapon. I need her close to me if I have to use it. Then he looked back at Valkyrie. Do we have an understanding? The truth would damage her parents. It wouldn't just shock them, wouldn't just horrify them, it would actually damage their ability to move forward, to be useful. If they were insisting on accompanying her, Valkyrie needed them to be at least be able to function, which meant the full truth would have to be kept from them. Just you, she said at last. Your friends can stay here. I'll take you into Roarhaven and ask China to hear you out. That's the best I can do. I reluctantly agree to your conditions, Vex said, smiling and Valkyrie knew this was what he had wanted all along. He dabbed at the corners of his mouth with a napkin and stood. Shall we leave? I assume your parents will be coming with us. We're not letting Alice out of our sight, Valkyrie's mum said. Ah, a spirit. He picked up Alice's seat and went to carry it past Valkyrie, but she blocked his way and looked over her shoulder at her parents. Can you give us a second? she asked. Please? Her mum frowned at her, concerned, but allowed Valkyrie's dad to move her back a few steps. Valkyrie turned back to Vex and lowered her voice to a whisper. Dr. Nye has a warehouse, she said. You go in there, you're dead. Living bodies die, but they're still aware. They can still move and think. Let me take Alice in. She'll be dead. Technically, she'll be dead. And you can take ownership of the scepter, and then I can take Alice back outside, and she'll be alive again. I don't want to do it. I don't want to expose Alice to that horrible, cold feeling. I don't want her to experience that. But if it'll make you let her go... Nye's warehouse was raided, Vex answered softly. All enchantments, such as they were, have been dismantled. It's just an ordinary building now. Then the coach, said Valkyrie. The coach the Banshee calls, with the headless driver. The Dullahan doesn't do favours, Valkyrie. If he takes your sister, you'll never get her back. 
He put a hand on her shoulder. Besides, as long as I have her, you'll do exactly as I say. Because if you try anything, I'll kill her without a second thought. He moved by her, exposing his back, leaving himself open and vulnerable, daring her to test his resolve. But Valkyrie sagged, and simply followed Vex and her parents outside, where the crowd of black-veined people parted to reveal a sky-blue minivan. Behold our battle wagon, Vex said as the side door slid open. There were two rows of seats, plus the two seats up front. Vex climbed into the very back, clicking Alice's seat into place beside him. Melissa, he said, you can sit in the middle there, and Desmond, you drive. Valkyrie can sit up front with you. She knows where we're going. If anyone needs to pee before we leave, you better go now. We've got an hour's drive ahead of us, and we won't be stopping. 67. Lightning. They drove to Roarhaven. Valkyrie was all out of leaves, and the pain from her broken hand was making her sweat. She wiped her forehead and looked back. In the rear of the minivan, Vex sat with his head down. It was too dark to see his eyes, but his breathing was regular. She was sure he was sleeping. Even so, she didn't make a move. She'd been around the dead men enough by now to know that they never sank into deep sleep. If she tried anything, he'd be wide awake fully alert and back in control in an instant. She glanced at her mum, making sure she wasn't about to do anything desperate. But for once her mum's attention wasn't on Alice. She was frowning, looking out of the window. Mum? Valkyrie said softly. Her mum's frown deepened. Do you hear something? Valkyrie peered out into the darkness where the black shapes of trees and hedgerows blurred and melted together. She listened to the minivan's engine, to the rock and roll of the tires of the poorly maintained road, to the sound of the heater blasting out warm air, and behind all that, what? What was that? Another engine? I see something, her dad said, his eyes on the rearview mirror. I think there's someone. Headlights flicked on, Singular beams that cut through the gloom on either side of the minivan. There was a loud bang, like a gunshot or a small explosion, and the minivan wobbled violently. Her dad cursed, but Vex's eyes were open and calm. Everyone hold on, Valkyrie's dad said, and Valkyrie braced herself right before he braked. The minivan skidded to a shuddering, juddering halt and two motorbikes sped into the yellow glare of his headlights and rode onwards, vanishing into the dark. Alice, Melissa Edgley said, starting to scramble into the rear seats as her husband flicked on the interior light. She's fine, said Vex, holding up his hand to block her way. It glowed briefly, but it was enough to make Valkyrie's mum freeze. Put your hand down, Valkyrie's dad said. Melissa, stay where you are. Mr. Vex, do not threaten my wife. Put your hand down. Vex gave a little smile and lowered his hand. Who was that? Valkyrie's dad asked. Steph, did you know those people? They blew out a tire or something. It was Vex who answered. A man named Vincent Faux and his gang ride motorcycles, Desmond, and they happen to be working with Darkus. You think she's here? Valkyrie asked. No, said Vex. She sends Foe out to do the little jobs she can't be bothered with. The only people out there are Foe and Samuel. We can take them, Valkyrie said, without much conviction. I'm sure you can. She frowned. You're not coming. I don't have my magic back yet. You'll be fine, said Vex. You have to go with her, Valkyrie's mum said. She can't go out there alone. She's got her stick, hasn't she? She won't need me. Besides, I'm babysitting. Hurry now, Valkyrie. We don't want Alice waking up. She could have argued, but she knew it'd be a waste of time. She unbuckled her seatbelt. I'm coming with you, her dad said. You can't, Valkyrie responded. I may not be able to do magic, but my clothes are armored. Yours aren't. Everyone stay here. I'll see if I can talk our way out. She got out, closing the door behind her. 
The road was narrow, with trees on either side. Quiet. She stood in front of the minivan. Her shadow stretched before her, joining the darkness ahead. The motorcycles were coming back. They stopped just out of reach of the minivan's headlights, and the engines cut off. A moment later, Foe and Samuel stepped into view, and her heartbeat quickened once more. Samuel was sweating. His hands were clenched. He was coming down off his serum. He was a hair's breadth away from turning. If things had gone differently, said Foe, we just take the scepter. That's all we want, after all. Anyone else who wants the scepter also wants your sister so they can kill her and take control of it. But we have no intention of taking control of it. Darkus doesn't want to use it. She just doesn't want anyone else to use it. So, as I said, if things had gone differently, we would have asked for the scepter and ridden off into the night. But things didn't go differently. Things went exactly as they went. Samuel walked to the edge of the light and vanished into the darkness. Obloquy is dead, Fo continued. That's not your fault. Darkus did that, and Obloquy was fine with it. But Mercy, Mercy was killed to protect you. And I have to say, I have to say it, I kind of had a soft spot for Mercy. Call me an old romantic if you want, but I had dreams of dying with her. There'd be blood and screaming and fire and pain, and we'd be there, together. Foe passed into Valkyrie's shadow and was lost to sight. But I can't have that now, he said, because of you. And so, even though we're just here for the scepter, and we have strict orders not to kill you, we're going to anyway. We're going to kill everyone with you, too. We're going to kill your family, your mammy and your daddy and your little baby sister. We're going to beat you to a pulp. We're going to make you scream and cry and beg, and we're going to kill them in front of you. Then we'll take the scepter and throw it in a ditch somewhere. He emerged into the light. That sound good to you. Dexter Vex is with me, Valkyrie said. Foe nodded. We'll kill him, too. You think you have a chance? she asked. Against me, yeah, of course you do. But him? This is Dexter Vex we're talking about, one of the dead men. And with that remnant he's stronger and faster and doesn't possess one shred of pity. If I were you, I'd get back on my bike and I'd ride away. Fast. I like you, said Foe. Despite it all, I like you. You're in a no-win situation that you're treating like a fair fight. You've got guts. But I have a vampire. Something moved in the corner of her eye, and then Samuel was on her, his body crushing her broken hand. She cried out, and he snarled, and he launched her into the air. She landed and rolled, shrieking in pain as she got to her feet. But Samuel was there again to grab her. Beat her to a pulp, Foe said walking to the minivan. I'm going to kill her family. Samuel hit her, and Valkyrie dropped to one knee, her head swimming. Her jacket absorbed most of the kick that followed, but it still sent her tumbling. Holding her broken hand close to her chest, she whipped the shock stick from her back and leaped up. Samuel ducked under her first swipe and leaned back to avoid the second. Then he grabbed her wrist and twisted, and the stick fell, and his fist ploughed into her exposed belly, and she staggered back, whooping and gasping. Through teary eyes, she saw Foe reach the minivan. Samuel grabbed her hair and yanked her head back. She twisted and fell, and got up as he pulled her from one side of the road to the other. With her right hand, she tried pushing the air. She tried clicking her fingers. Nothing worked. The magic was inside her. It was bubbling and boiling and churning, but nothing was happening. Nothing was working. Nothing was... White lightning danced from the tips of her fingers, and Samuel jerked away. Valkyrie scrambled backwards. Her hand... Her right hand was glowing. Samuel doubled over. His snarls turned guttural. 
He straightened up suddenly, talons tearing into his clothes and skin, shredding it from the vampire's body beneath. White skin like alabaster, bald, big, black eyes. The vampire sprang at her, claws ready for ripping, fangs ready for tearing. Valkyrie fell onto her back, her glowing hand held up, and it was through her hand that she poured her magic. Lightning burst from her fingers. It caught the vampire in midair, snapping it back like it had hit a wall. It fell to the road as a charred, smoking carcass. What did you do? She looked round. Foe came forward, staring at the vampire's corpse, his face slack. What did you do? He asked again. There was something in his face, something Valkyrie recognized. Anger, of course, surprise, confusion, but also fear. It was dark there on the roadside, but as Valkyrie stared at Samuel's body, the patch of darkness she stood in seemed to brighten. At first, she thought she was caught in a beam of moonlight, but it just got brighter and brighter. Her hand, it was glowing again, lit up from the inside with a silver light. Both her hands and her face, her neck, beneath her clothes, her entire body was glowing. She stood up, fingertips burning. The magic churned inside her. Her hair stood on end. Energy crackled around her, forming a barrier that lifted her off the ground. Hissing in panic, she drifted sideways. The energy barrier kept her from colliding with a tree beyond the grassy verge. She didn't know how to stand like this. She fell, but didn't hit the ground. She turned over, rolled, tried to straighten up. What the hell are you doing? asked Foe. She turned, falling backwards again in this cocoon of energy. Foe stood there, staring, the confusion on his face beautifully illuminated by the light Valkyrie was giving out. She managed to stand. She was unsteady, but she did it. Foe threw a stream of energy. It hit the cocoon and flowed round it. It didn't hurt her. It didn't even touch her. He threw another, and another. Something was happening. Valkyrie could feel it. The magic thrashed inside her. It was building up to something. Ran, she said. Foe poured all his strength into another energy stream. It proved just as useless as the others. Ran, she said again. But it was too late. The magic burst from her in a wave that turned the trees to splinters. It hit Foe and he was gone, obliterated. She could feel the wave expand in all directions. She could feel it nearing the minivan. She grimaced, reached out with her mind, searching for control. She reached to the edge of the wave and snagged it, grabbed it, pulled it back, pulled it all the way back, and the magic returned to her and she dropped to her knees in the crater that had formed around her. She was no longer glowing. She stood up on shaky legs. She was exhausted. The roadside was dark again. Stephanie! Her mum ran to her, and Valkyrie slumped into her arms. Oh, God! Steph, are you okay? Please tell me you're okay. I'm good, Valkyrie mumbled. Oh, thank God! Oh, thank God! What was that? You were glowing, and it was hard to, to look at you. It, it was all so bright. What was that lightning? Where's that man? Where is he? Valkyrie forced her eyes open. Mum... I need you to help me into the van. Too tired to... Her mother pulled her up. Shh! Don't talk. You don't have to talk. They got back into the minivan and Valkyrie fell asleep while her dad changed the tire. 68. The Hourglass Up in the balcony... Fletcher and Wreath watched Skullduggery walk into the square at the exact centre of the necropolis. There, another man in a black necromancer robe stood waiting. Beneath his hood, like the others, his face was porcelain. Skullduggery approached. Do you have a name, or a names beneath you? The porcelain face smiled. I am known as the Guardian. 
I am the final test. Skullduggery nodded, looked around, then back to the Guardian. I go through you to activate the sigil. Is that it? In essence, but of course there is more to it than that. And of course there is. Skullduggery tilted his head. Don't suppose you're going to tell me exactly what's in store for me, are you? True understanding comes later. True understanding usually does. The guardian smiled again. You are a warrior, when I need to be. You are a violent man, when I have to be. Is it, do you think, an appropriate response to the world around you? Violence? Skullduggery asked. Violence is never the answer, until it's the only answer. Another porcelain smile. Your words are weary. They're just well travelled. If I could save the world with words, I would. I'd lay down my gun and I'd talk until my bones turn to dust. But words are for reasonable people, and too often the people I meet are far from reasonable. You have blood on your hands. I do. So other people don't have to, said Skullduggery. But that is not why you fight. You fight because the fight is all you have. You fight because you enjoy it. What are you looking for? Skullduggery asked. An insight into my soul? You want to shock me into admitting some dark little secret that I've been hiding away for all these years? I've just spoken to beings claiming to be the ghosts of my friends, the ghost of my wife. I saw my child. After all these years, I saw the face of my child again. I'm all shocked out for today. If we're going to fight, let's get to it. Skullduggery raised his fists. I've got living people to get back to. So be it, said the Guardian. If you prevail, you may activate the Merin Sigil and power grafted from the source of all magic shall endow the one who wears the sigil with great strength and protect them from harm, until the last grain of sand falls. Skullduggery dropped his hands. I'm sorry. What? The guardian gestured to the middle of the square, as a plinth rose from the ground. When it settled, an hourglass rose from within the plinth. Once you have activated the Merin sigil, the hourglass will turn and the sands will run. For how long? Skullduggery asked, stalking over to examine the plinth. This amount of sand. It looks like it'll only run for, what, a little over twenty minutes? The Guardian nodded. Twenty-three, exactly. Skullduggery looked back at him. So, if I fight you now, and I win and the sigil is activated, Valkyrie will only be invulnerable for the twenty-three minutes after that moment? Yes, said the Guardian, sounding surprised at the question. Twenty-three minutes of invulnerability and strength is quite generous, we thought. Skullduggery looked up, and Fletcher had the feeling he was glaring at Wreath. He switched his focus back to the Guardian. There's no way to delay it. I activate the sigil, and the invulnerability kicks in when we need it. That is not possible, I am afraid. Is there a problem? There is, Skullduggery said. That's not going to work for us. I am afraid there is no way round it, Skullduggery observed him. Do I have to fight you now? Right at this moment? Porcelain eyebrows rose slightly. Well, no, I suppose not. Can I come back? It is most unusual, said the Guardian. But yes, the tests will only be reset after I am engaged in combat. So I can walk straight here and there'll be no one to stop me. Precisely. Then that's what I'll do. The Guardian bowed. I shall await your return. Skullduggery turned, looked up at the balcony. We're going back to Roarhaven. 69. Strange Bedfellows There's someone up ahead, her dad said. Valkyrie woke, launched from a troubled sleep like she'd been shot from a cannon. Her body ached, 
Her broken hand alone made her want to cry. The minivan was slowing as it approached an elderly man smiling in the headlights. When they came to a stop, he walked to the driver's side as the window wound down. Afraid the road's closed, folks, he said. A few trees down. Where you headed? When the elderly man saw Valkyrie, his expression changed. Ah, uh, excuse me, I didn't realize. Carry on. He nodded to them and stepped back, vanishing into the darkness. He's with the sanctuary, Valkyrie said. We can keep going. Valkyrie's dad put the minivan in gear and they started moving again. Slight change of plan, Vex said, like he'd been waiting for her to catch his eye. China would throw him in the cell as soon as look at me, so I'll be fading into the shadows once we've arrived. If any of you try to signal to the guards up ahead that something isn't right, I kill Alice. That's the first thing I do. We all clear? We are, said Valkyrie. Vex smiled straight at her. And as for you and your sparkly new powers, if you even think about using them against me, I'll kill Alice and then kill you before you've even learned how to aim properly. Valkyrie's mum shifted in her seat. Could you please stop threatening my children, Mr. Vex? I would very much appreciate it. Vex smiled. But of course, Melissa, my apologies. I don't see anything, her dad muttered. You said there was a huge wall and a gate. You said there was a city. Give it a few more seconds, Valkyrie said. And then suddenly... Roarhaven. One moment there was the road and the headlights picked out, long and narrowing, hedged into on both sides by thin trees. The next, a brightly lit wall, high enough to fill the windscreen and block out the stars. Her dad went to break when it materialized, but stops himself. They drove on to the open gate. Cleavers and sorcerers stood guard, and a man named Krull waved them to a stop. He went round to the passenger side, and Valkyrie lowered the window. Welcome back, said Krull, his eyes flickering over the people in the minivan. Valkyrie doubted he could make out Vex, sitting in the dark in the back. Thanks, she said. We're just headed to the sanctuary. Krull nodded, but made no sign he was going to let them through. Interesting times we're living in, he said. Valkyrie gave him a nod. Yes, they are. Mind stepping out for a moment? All of us? Just you, if you wouldn't mind. Sure, she said, hesitating only a little. She glanced back at Vex, wondering how tense he was, wondering if he'd react to this. But he just sat there, an outline in the dark. Valkyrie undid her seatbelt, opened the door and went to get out. When she was halfway out, Krull grabbed her wrist, yanked her forward. She hit the ground, and tears sprang to her eyes, and there was suddenly a lot of movement and a lot of shouting. Her folks were telling Krull to leave her alone. The sorcerers around her were telling them to stay in the minivan, and Krull was commanding her to lie still. Cold steel closed round her right wrist, and she felt her magic dwindle. It snapped shut round her left wrist and jarred her broken bones. I'm Valkyrie Kane, she cried, Krull's knee in her back. For all I know, you're Darkus, Krull said, grabbing the back of her collar. He hauled her to her feet, slammed her against the minivan. You move and we kill you, you understand me? Her face was squashed against the glass. Her mum stared at her from the other side, horrified. On the seat behind, Vex was inching towards the far door. You killed my son. Krull said into Valkyrie's ear. Her insides went cold and began to churn. I'm sorry, she said, but that was Darkus. That wasn't you killed him here during the battle. Four weeks ago, back when you were Darkus, I wasn't in control. Krull, I'm sorry. I am, but... He grabbed her broken hand and squeezed, and Valkyrie screamed. A few of us have been wondering why exactly sorrows let you back into the fold. Krull said in her ear. We think it's because she likes you. You and the skeleton detective. You're her favourites. Makes us wonder why the hell she's in charge anyway. 
Who the hell elected her? Huh? Who voted her in? I certainly didn't. Please, you're hurting me. You're damn right I am. You know I'm not Darkus, Valkyrie said through gritted teeth. I know no such thing. She tried to turn into him, but he slammed his whole body weight into her and she cried out again. That was too much for her dad to take, and he threw open his door. The cleavers grabbed him when he got out. Now that they were distracted, Vex reached forward, slid open the side door to make his escape with Alice. He clearly figured his plan was falling apart. But Valkyrie's mum dived on him, and they tumbled out of the minivan, and then Valkyrie was pulled away from the window. She twisted, rammed her shoulder into Kroll's chest. She kicked at his knee, got his shin instead. She heard him growl in pain, and he hit her, and bright lights flashed, and she fell to her knees. Then he grabbed her hair, started dragging her backwards, and through the tears in her eyes she glimpsed something on the wall overhead, and it was dropping and spinning, and Tanith landed beside her. She didn't even see the strike, but she heard it connect, and Kroll went stumbling against the minivan. Tanith stalked up to him, her hand closing round his throat, her fingertips digging in behind his windpipe. She pinned his head against the corner of the vehicle, and he gagged. Key, she said. Crowell fumbled in his pocket, fished out a small key. Tanith snatched it from him, smacked him in the jaw, and he dropped. Tanith helped Valkyrie stand and unlocked the shackles. See to your folks, Tanith said. I'll take this little charmer to cool off in the cells. Valkyrie nodded not even waiting around to watch Tanith drag crawl off by the ear. Clutching her left hand, she hurried round to the other side of the minivan. The cleavers were just allowing her father back to his feet. A pretty lady, Corb, was with them, apologizing profusely. Her mum was on her knees, her back to Valkyrie. Vex, said Valkyrie, where is he? Run off, said Corb, looking round. There was a bit of a scramble, but he hightailed it when he saw us closing in. No, Valkyrie breathes. Alice! Her mum stood and turned, tears in her eyes and Alice in her arms. Still asleep, she said, laughing. Can you believe that? Still asleep after all that? What an amazing sister you have. What an amazing mum, Valkyrie said, running forward and hugging them both. Wiping the healing mud from her hand, Valkyrie entered the room of prisms by Skullduggery's side. Cynic Dosh had patched her up, eased her bruises, and mended her broken fingers, and now she felt great. She felt refreshed, strong, and she had a cool new array of magic powers she hadn't even explored yet. China was resplendent in red. She sat atop her throne like an ice queen, gazing down at her loyal subjects. The monster hunters, Saracen, Fletcher, Wreath, and Tanith. Standing within arm's reach of the throne was the black cleaver. Thank you for joining us, China said, in a tone that made it impossible to gauge whether or not she was being sarcastic. Has everyone been briefed on the latest developments? We all know what's been going on. Valkyrie, where are your parents? In the dining hall, she said. The chef's making them something special, and Alice is bringing the roof down with her crying. So I've heard, said China. Have you told them that it's not safe for them to leave the sanctuary? I told them. They don't know the truth about Alice and the scepter. But I doubt they're planning on going for a walk anyway. They already asked a cleaver to go out and bring back baby food and nappies. It had never occurred to me that you could buy nappies in Roarhaven. Truly is a wonderful place, China said. To business, then. And before we begin, I'd like to introduce you to a new guest. Though, of course, I use the word like in its loosest possible sense. The door opened, and Tanith muttered something as Billy Ray Sanguine walked in. He flashed a smile of perfect white teeth. A smile that faltered slightly when his eyeless gaze fell upon Tanith. Folks, he said in greeting, once more we appear to be on the same side. 
this is getting to be a habit. Mr. Sanguine, China said, please tell the room what you told Mr. Tipstuff. Darkus is preparing, he said. She's had to take some time for her power to soak through her new body. She also said something about needing to absorb Valkyrie's essence in order to be whole. Gross, said Valkyrie. Skullduggery tilted his head. Darkus is not at full power. That's what it sounds like. But she will be soon. I'm talking a day or two. Tops. We need to draw her in now, said Saracen, before she's ready to face us. But we need to be ready to face her, China said. Skullduggery, do we have any kind of a time frame? The city will never be ready, he answered. But we can make a decent stab at it. We need the night. Tomorrow morning we'll take Ravel out of the circle that's keeping him hidden. Once Darkus senses him, she should be drawn straight here. She will be, said Sanguine, nodding. I reckon punishing him was a last act that's even remotely human, and there's a part of her that's clinging to that. When she gets here, what do we do with Ravel? Donegan asked. China sat back. We arm him, Saracen frowned. We what? It's in his best interests to help us, China explained. I am not fighting beside that man, said Saracen. He murdered Ghastly, for God's sake. Shudder is dead because of him. Skullduggery, come on, talk some sense into her. Actually, China said, it was Skullduggery's idea. Valkyrie's eyebrows shot up. What? Ravel will fight alongside us, or he'll spend the rest of his life in agony, Skullduggery said. He doesn't have a choice. I don't like it any more than you, but we're going up against an enemy the likes of which we've never faced. We need everyone we can get, and at least we know how Ravel fights. This is unbelievable, Saracen muttered, but said no more. We have three godkiller weapons, said China. Mr. Sanguine here has a fourth. But I doubt we'd get that off him without a fight. Sanguine grinned. Not a chance. Three godkillers, then. Skullduggery, Saracen, and Ravel will wield them. There is another out there, of course. The most powerful. But Dexter Vex has run off with it. If anyone encounters him over the next few hours, feel free to liberate the scepter from his person. What good will that do? Valkyrie asked. It's bonded to my sister. No one here is laying a finger on her, even if we do get the scepter back. I wasn't suggesting that at all, China said, but failed to elaborate on what she was suggesting. And speaking of secret weapons, she continued, we have one last weapon to take into account. She produced the death touch gauntlet from somewhere behind her and put it on the arm of the throne. I told you, Valkyrie said, I'm not wearing that. I don't even need it now that I've got my freaky new powers. New powers that we've never seen before, China said. White lightning, a type of energy we have yet to identify. We don't even know what to classify your discipline as. Freak sounds good to me, said Sanguine. China glanced at him. And yet nobody asked you. Valkyrie, without knowing what you can do or how to control it, I'm afraid you need every advantage you can get. Take the gauntlet, please. Valkyrie shook her head. I've seen myself wear it in the vision, just before Darkus kills my family. My family is here now, China. Because of Vex, we have to keep them close. We can't even let them leave. The vision is coming true. If I wear that, I'm allowing that future to happen. And if you don't wear it, China said. You might be allowing it to happen that much sooner. Valkyrie glared, her heat matched by the cool of those ice-blue eyes. Finally, she looked away and turned to Skullduggery. I can't wear it. You have to, he said. China's right. That's Grand Mage Sorrows, China corrected. Or I'll have you both flogged. The circumstances and the visions are coming true, Skullduggery said, ignoring China. So you know you'll be called upon to fight. You owe it to yourself, to us, and to your family, 
to give yourself every advantage. The circumstances haven't changed, but the details have. We've seen clothes change. We've seen people in the early visions that aren't there in the later ones. Your family dying. That could be one more detail that we see changed. But only if you fight hard enough. Valkyrie folded her arms. Fine, she muttered. Skullduggery waved his hand, and the gauntlet floated down to her. She took hold of it and stuffed it in her jacket pocket. It was too big to fit in all the way. Tell us about your plan, China said to Skullduggery. When Darkus attacks, we'll need you here to lead the initial defence. Skullduggery nodded. If Sanguine is right, her targets will be Ravel and Valkyrie. Ravel will draw her in, but when she realises that Valkyrie is here, I fully expect her to forget about Ravel and focus on her. So our main objective in the opening stages is to protect Valkyrie Kane. Questions? We have sorcerers and cleavers and godkillers on our side, said Gracious, not to mention our own nutball deathbringer. But unless we get lucky, we're not going to be able to contain Darkus for long. That's where Fletcher comes in, Skullduggery said. He'll teleport me to the necropolis, where I'll face the Guardian in the final test. So, if and when Darkus does reach Valkyrie, hopefully she'll get a nasty surprise. How long will the final test take? asked Saracen. I have no idea. This is far from ideal. Of that, I am aware. Are we sure this is a wise course of action? Donegan asked. Skullduggery, like it or not, you're one of our heavy hitters. We can't afford to lose you in the middle of a pitched battle. We don't have much choice, Skullduggery said. If Darkus kills Valkyrie and absorbs her essence or her soul or her power or whatever it is she's after, then we're done for. We're beaten. Twenty-three minutes of invulnerability, plus Valkyrie's new powers and that gauntlet, may be all that stands in the way of Darkus and the end of the world. But we can't lose you, said Saracen. There's no choice, said Skullduggery. Only the dead can enter the necropolis. I don't see a whole lot of dead people volunteering to take my place, do you? At that exact moment, the door opened and everyone looked round as a beautiful, athletic redhead walked in, followed by a handsome, muscular man. I am Vorian Scapegrace, the woman announced. And I'm here to save the world. 70. Return of the Living Dead What followed was confusing. Valkyrie stayed out of it. She watched the arguments and the debate and said nothing. She watched people change their minds, change them back and change them again. Gradually, an unlikely outcome began to rear its head. People were agreeing that Scapegrace should have his brain put back into his old, dead, zombie body in order to go into the necropolis and face the Guardian in battle. It was all very unsettling. She accompanied Skullduggery, Scapegrace and Thrasher to the medical wing, and Cynic Doche brought them to see the two original bodies in all their zombie glory. They floated in green liquid in a big glass tank. They looked disgusting. Are you sure you want to do this? Valkyrie asked. I mean, they're falling apart. And the way you look now is, well, it's a lot more attractive. Scapegrace looked at her. I'm a woman. A woman is not a bad thing to be, he nodded. I accept that. I understand that. I have had my horizons broadened by my time in this body. Not broadened as much as some of my pub's patrons would have liked, but broadened nonetheless. But we belong in those decaying shells, Valkyrie, if it's at all possible to get us back into them. He turned to Cynic Doche. Give it to us straight, Doc. Our brains may not survive the transplant, right? Cynic Doche hesitated. They... they won't survive. There is no maybe here. If we attempt it, your brains will fall apart. They're only held together by twine as it is. Scapegrace frowned. 
Twine? Yes. Our brains are held together with string? I'm afraid so. He stared at her and shook his head. I hate Dr. Nice so much right now. So what's the point of doing this if our brains are going to fall apart? Thrasher asked. I've spoken with my colleagues, said Sinekdosh, and we've come to the conclusion that we don't need to transplant your brains. We just need to transplant your minds. Valkyrie stood there and waited for her to start making sense. There is a vegetable plant hybrid we've been working on, modifying the genes and receptors, mutating the proteins and acids so that they are, in effect, neurotransmitters. Our work on the synapses alone has been quite illuminating. Valkyrie stood there and waited for her to start making sense. Anyway, Cynic Dosh said, blushing, we think we can install these hybrids into your old bodies and, with the help of some skilled sensitives, transfer your minds into them. That sounds great, Thrusher said, a huge smile breaking out. Wait a second, said Scrape Grace. You're saying you're going to... you're going to put our thoughts into... into vegetable plant hybrids? Yes. Our... Are our brains going to be vegetables? Sinekdosh hesitated again. Kind of. Valkyrie couldn't help it. She burst out laughing. The operation took most of the night. Valkyrie spent time sleeping or in the ops room, a brightly lit space of monitors and weird-looking computers. In the center was a long table displaying what appeared to be a highly detailed scale model of Roarhaven. It was only when it started to flicker slightly that Valkyrie realized it was a hologram. Little hologram people ran about on its streets. She even thought she recognized a few faces. The room was buzzing with activity. No one needed her, so she stayed at the back, in the dark. She took the death-touched gauntlet from her jacket, and put it on a table no one was using. She left it there. She was on her third cup of coffee when the doors opened and the two zombies walked in, grinning like conquering heroes. One of Scapegrace's teeth fell out, and he kicked it under a chair. Skullduggery walked over to them. This is a surprisingly brave thing you're doing, he said. I know, said Scapegrace. I've just been thinking that. I think I felt more heroic in the woman's body. She was stronger and fitter and better, and I just felt a lot braver speaking in her voice. My own voice is kind of nasal. Have you noticed that? How can my voice be nasal if most of my nose fell off years ago? Don't worry, Master, said Thrasher. I'll be right behind you every step of the... Shut up, Scapegrace said. Thrasher looked... Bizarrely pleased, as he said, Sorry, Master. This final test, said Scapegrace. Is there any way I'll be able to cheat? Probably not, Skullduggery said. He handed him a folded piece of paper. This is a map. When Fletcher teleports you in, you'll be at the bottom of stone stairs. Before you, the necropolis. Follow these instructions exactly, and you'll get to the square where the guardian waits. Will he be expecting me? He'll be expecting me. Explain to him that I won't be coming, and don't take no for an answer. Then combat will begin. I have been trained in the martial arts, Scapegrace said, bowing slightly, although that was when I had a stronger, fitter, more athletic body. But I'm sure I'll be fine. You're going to have to be more than sure. We're relying on you here, Vorian, okay? The fate of the world may very well rest in your hands. You can count on me. On me, Thrasher said brightly. Less so in him, said Scapegrace. Stay in this room, Skullduggery said. I have a feeling when we need you, things will move very fast. Thrasher nodded eagerly. But Scapegrace looked decidedly paler. Valkyrie wondered how that was possible. Saracen approached. 
We're ready, he said. Are ready enough anyway. We can't afford to wait around any longer. Okay then, Skullduggery said. Let's go talk to Mr. Ravel. Ravel was standing in the protective circle. Two cleavers guarded the door. Skullduggery walked into the room first, then Saracen. Valkyrie came last. We're going to need you to step out here, Skullduggery said. Ravel shook his head. Skullduggery, you can't ask me to do that. Step out, or we'll drag you out. She'll come for me. Please, if our friendship has ever meant anything to you... Friendship? Saracen interrupted. You want to talk about friendship? Saracen, I'm well aware of what I've done, but that's no... You murdered Ghastly, Saracen said. You and Anton beheaded. You plotted and planned behind our backs for God knows how long, and then you betrayed us all. I was trying to do the right thing. You killed them. Sacrifices had to be made, Ravel said. He spoke with the air of someone who'd had this conversation a thousand times before, which was probably close to the truth. I don't expect you to understand, but I have seen what's coming, okay? Sooner or later our little magical community is going to be revealed to the world, and they're going to come after us. And as powerful as we are, there are simply more of them than there are of us. They will hunt us down and kill us. We're meant to protect the mortals. A look of annoyance crossed Ravel's face. Says who? Really, Saracen, who says that? Who commands that? We make up our own minds. Just because we've decided in the past to protect them doesn't mean we can't decide now to rule them. It's for their own good, anyway. They can't be trusted to run this world. Look what they've done to the environment alone in the last... We're not debating this said Saracen. You can come up with all the excuses you want, but nothing changes what you've done. I know, said Ravel quietly. But Saracen, Skullduggery, Valkyrie, if I leave this circle, Darkus will come for me. You don't know what it's like. Please, don't ask me to go through that again. You're bait, Skullduggery said. You've known for days now that you were going to be bait. You knew this was coming. So that's it. You're just going to leave me alone and defenceless against her. No, because we're not like you. We prefer to give people a fighting chance. She'll be coming for you, and you're going to be ready. You'll be with us. Ravel looked shocked. You want me fighting beside you? After... after what I've done? Do we want you beside us? Skullduggery said. No. But that's where you'll be. We don't know how long it'll take her to get here. But we're as ready as we're going to be. Let's go. For a moment, Ravel seemed pinned to the spot. Then he took a shuddering breath and stepped out of the circle. 71. Ravel. He came through loud and clear lit up on her mind like a star in the night sky. She turned, her eyes closed, until the star burned bright enough for her to follow. South, towards Roarhaven. He was in the sanctuary. It was a trap. It was so obviously a trap. Darkus opened her eyes and smiled. Seventy-two. The mission was a go. Scapegrace had never felt anything like this before. While his stomach was incapable of producing the butterfly's effect he had felt sure would have accompanied such a moment, he nonetheless felt thrilled beyond measure at the thought of doing something so important, of doing something so worthy. Thrasher was unusually quiet, which was a good thing and they stood quietly in the ops room while people around them talked really fast to each other. She's coming, Saracen Rue said. China Sorrows, the most beautiful woman scapegrace had ever seen, walked quickly to the hologram of the city. She's been seen? Our sensitives are blacking out, said Rue. The ones we've been searching for her. Finbar says their minds are being overloaded the closer she gets. 
Get Finbar isolated, China said. Cassandra too. Where are Geoffrey Scrutinus and Philomena Random? We need them all isolated. I've sent for them, said Skullduggery. They'll be ready when we need them. You can count on that. Where's the black cleaver? China scowled. I have no idea. Skullduggery nodded and looked at Tanith Lowe. Tanith, you've just been assigned bodyguard duty. Me? said Tanith, appalled. Her? said China, appalled. Deal with it and move on, Skullduggery said. How long do we have before Darkus gets here? We estimate no longer than half an hour, Rue answered. Skullduggery turned to Scapegrace. Are you ready to go? We are, said Scapegrace. He found himself unbelievably thankful that Thrasher was coming with him. He didn't want to embark on this alone, no matter how tough he talked. He looked at Thrasher and said, You're an idiot. Thank you, sir, Thrasher replied. Fletcher will take you to the necropolis now, Skullduggery said. If you run, you can make it to the Guardian in a little over twenty minutes. No matter what, he has to agree to fight you. And no matter what, Vorian, you have to win. Do you understand? I do. We're going to be putting all our efforts into keeping Darkus away from Valkyrie for approximately twenty-five minutes. If you take any longer than that, if you get lost, or you take too long with a fight, or if you lose, then it'll all be for nothing. I won't let you down. We're counting on you. The world is counting on you. Skullduggery held out his hand. Scapegrace shook it. Clarabel burst through the doors and ran up to him. Scapey! Gerald! Take me with you! I can help! Clarabel, no, said Scapegrace. Skullduggery stepped away, gesturing to Fletcher. I can mend you if you get hurt, Clarabel said. If bits fall off, I can stick them back on. I'll be useful. You're alive, Scapegrace said softly. No one living can enter the Necropolis. Necropolis, Thrasher whispered. But you're my only friends, Clarabel said. She was crying. Scapegrace's heart was a rotten piece of meat in his chest, but even so it broke at the sight of her tears. He hugged her. We're going to save you, he said. Please don't go. You have other friends here. They think I'm weird. I think you're weird. But you're weird too. So that doesn't matter. Gerald, please. I'm sorry, said Thrasher. But if we can come back, we will. Because we're family, Clarabel. We'll always come back to family. Clarabel hid her face in her hands. Don't leave me. Scapegrace stepped back. He took hold of Thrasher's wrist, and then Fletcher took hold of his. Goodbye, Scapegrace said, and he didn't even have time to blink, and they were somewhere else, somewhere new, in a cavern at the bottom of marble steps facing a city. Enter there, Fletcher said. You have the map, right? Thrasher held it up. Yes, we do. Fletcher nodded. If I survive this, and if you survive this, I'll see you again. Good luck, the both of you. He disappeared. Scape Grace and Thrasher, alone in the city of the dead. I feel sad, said Thrasher. Shut up, Scape Grace growled. He started running. They got lost four times, thanks to Thrasher's inability to read the map. Even so, they made better time than expected, and reached the square in the middle of the necropolis in nineteen minutes. There was a tall man in a black robe waiting for them. His face looked like a living porcelain mask. You are not who I was expecting, the guardian said. Skullduggery couldn't make it, Scapegrace said. He sent me in his place. And me, said Thrasher. He didn't send him, Scapegrace clarified. But I am here to face the final test. Will you battle me? And me, said Thrasher. I cannot, said the Guardian. 
You are brave, the both of you, for coming here. But he who begins the trials must end the trials. He told me not to take no for an answer, Scapegrace said. The guardian gave a little smile. You must be a great hero for him to pass this responsibility on to you. I'm no hero, said Scapegrace. I'm just a man who used to be a woman, who used to be a man. My name is Vorian Scapegrace, and I have come here to... The Zombie King? Scapegrace froze. Finally he said, uh, You've heard of me. This is the necropolis, said the guardian, the city of the dead. Of course I've heard of you. There hasn't been a zombie king in centuries. It is an honor to have you here. Scapegrace waited for the punchline. Thrasher nudged him and whispered, I think he's serious. If the skeleton has asked you to come here in his place, the guardian said, then it would be a privilege to engage you in combat. Scapegrace blinked. So, so we can fight? The both of us? Thrasher asked. Against you? The guardian bowed. If that is what you wish, please choose your weapons. A pillar rose up, rumbling from the ground. Hanging from it were swords and knives and maces and spears. Scapegrace looked at the guardian, standing there with a peaceful expression on his porcelain face, unarmed and courteous, and he chose a curved, gleaming sword. Thrasher chose two smaller swords. The pillar rumbled again and sank into the ground. Brandishing his weapon, Scapegrace stepped towards the guardian. Shall we begin? By all means, the guardian said, and the biggest sword Scapegrace had ever seen materialized in his hands. Oh, Thrasher muttered. Oh, dear. 73. The radio has been on for the last hour. 80s pop. Gant has probably had enough of listening to Jeremiah. Now... Don't you want me for the Human League plays? Danny listens to it in the darkness over the Cadillac's engine. His mom loved 80s pop. The Human League, Duran Duran, Erasure. His dad preferred 70s rock. Led Zeppelin, Rush, Sabbath. They both had an appreciation for music, though, which is probably where Danny gets it from. The Cadillac stops. The engine cuts off, taking the music with it. Car doors open. Danny waits. There's some muffled talking, then footsteps. A rattle and click, and the trunk opens. Danny curls up tighter, like a flower shrinking from sudden cold. Hands over his eyes to shield them from the light. Metal tightens over his wrists. Handcuffs. Out, says Jeremiah. Blinking madly, Danny moves his aching bones. He's sore and tired and cold, and he reeks. His left shoulder is throbbing and his right ankle is swollen. He's thirsty and his stomach is empty. He manages to get one leg out and clambers awkwardly from the trunk. They're on a residential street. It's the middle of the day, but it's quiet. No one around to see him. He could shout for help, but he doesn't bother. Gant would have thought of that. Jeremiah would be ready for it. One side of the street is practically identical to the other. All big colonial houses, with lots of space in between. Jeremiah marches Danny ahead of him, and they follow Gant up the steps to number four. Gant twists a key in the lock and walks through. Then Jeremiah pushes Danny so that he stumbles in after him, and Danny pitches straight into hell. The heat is the first thing to hit. So powerful it makes Danny close his eyes and turn his head. He tries to back out, but Jeremiah is behind him, already shutting the door. He can hear water flowing and boiling, and behind that he hears screams. People are screaming. He cracks his eyes open, and fright tears through him. 
He's on a metal walkway, a bridge suspended by chains above a lake of liquid fire. His surroundings are impossible. The inside of this colonial house is a church so vast he can't see the top. There are bridges above him, and ceilings and walkways, but they are impossibly high, and the twisted architecture vanishes into darkness, punctuated only by small patches of distant light. Gant is halfway across the bridge. Jeremy gives Danny a shove. Danny reaches out for the thin railing to stop himself from going over, but it burns his finger and he hisses, clutching his hands close to his chest. He limps quickly after Gant, away from Jeremiah. The heat is oppressive. His shirt is already drenched with sweat. The screaming continues. They get to a platform that sways under their weight. Danny walks with his knees bent, waves of dizziness roiling around his head. The heat doesn't affect Gant, but Danny can still find it within himself to be pleased that Jeremiah is finding this as uncomfortable as he is. Large patches of sweat have already soaked through the big man's jacket. His fat cheeks are red and he's puffing like it's hard to breathe. Jeremiah doesn't complain, though, and he doesn't walk like he's scared of falling. They climb iron stairs. Danny keeps his hands to himself. He can feel the heat through his shoes. The stairs are steep, and there are a lot of them, and Danny's legs are trembling by the time they reach the top. He glances down at Jeremiah, who was finding the climb tough going. Good. There's a hut ahead. Gant walks in. With no other route open to him, Danny follows. This hut, at least, has a solid floor. Nothing to lurch beneath him, and no grill to allow the steam from the liquid fire to billow and scald his skin. Solid walls, too. Chains hang from the high ceiling. Gant turns to him. What did you give me? Danny asks. Gant smiles. You think you've been drugged? You think this place is some ghastly hallucination? You think it couldn't possibly exist? I know it can't. And yet it does, says Gant. So what does that say about the things you know? Hmm? Does it, perhaps, say that there's a lot more to this world than you've seen so far in your limited little life? There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than I dreamt of in your philosophy. Do you know where that is from? Hamlet, says Danny. Everyone knows that line. Gant chuckles. Not so. There are still those to whom Shakespeare is a mystery. They have no interest in solving. Jeremiah joins them, sucking in mouthfuls of hot air like he's going to have a heart attack at any moment. Gant observes him with a look of distaste. Where are we? Danny asks. My home, answers Gant. A man's home is his castle, is it not? And a man must be master of his domain. This is my domain, Danny, my boy, and I am master over it. But how can it exist? It's not right. It's not possible. Gant pulls on one of the chains, one with a hook on the end. There are many names for it, he says. The easiest one for you to understand would be simply magic. He attaches the hook to Danny's handcuffs, looks over to Jeremiah, who was still trying to get his breath back. Jeremiah, Gant says sharply. Jeremiah nods and staggers over to a wheel on the wall. He takes a handkerchief from his pocket, wipes it uselessly across his forehead, then wraps it round his hand. He takes hold of the wheel, and, with every turn, the chain draws towards the ceiling, dragging Danny's arms up over his head. Jeremiah puffs and grunts, and Gant waits, but finally Danny's feet leave the floor, and he dangles there the handcuffs cutting into his skin. Jeremiah locks off the wheel and comes to stand beside his master. Are you the devil? Danny asks. Gant laughs. No, my boy, no, I am not. Though you wouldn't be the first to make that mistake. And you think Stephanie's just going to come rushing in here to save me? 
She barely knows me. She's coming, Gant says, and gives another smile. And when she gets here, we'll be ready for her, won't we, Jeremiah? Oh, yes, says Jeremiah. We'll be ready, all right. <laughs> then we'll see, Gant continues. We'll see who she is and what she is. Is she noble like we've heard? Or is she evil incarnate like others have said? Which do you think, Danny, my boy? Which one do you think is coming to your rescue right at this moment, hmm? The angel or the demon? 74. Valkyrie and Skullduggery were on a rooftop when Darkus drifted into view. They watched her float down, a vision in burnished red, until she was standing on the shield that enveloped the city. She put her hand to it, and bright colors began to ripple outwards from that point. The shield darkened, and an overcast grayness fell upon Roarhaven. It won't hold for much longer, Valkyrie said, and Skullduggery jabbed a button on his phone and spoke into it. Now, he said. Valkyrie realized that, despite everything, she was actually looking forward to what happened next. The shield faltered and sputtered and failed, and Darkus hovered there, watching it retract, unaware that a helicopter gunship, recently liberated from an unscrupulous private army operating out of the Middle East, had just appeared behind her. A helicopter gunship! This was awesome! There was a streak of light and a sudden plume of smoke, and before Darkus even had a chance to turn, the rocket hit her. The explosion sent her spinning out of the sky, trailing smoke and fire, and she vanished behind a building. Skullduggery wrapped his arm round Valkyrie's waist, and they flew to a roof that overlooked the square. Darkus was on her hands and knees, trying to rise. The helicopter, an AH-64 Apache, according to the pilot Fletcher had been partnered with, opened up with its minigun. Bullets chewed up the ground around Darkus, pummeling her and driving her back to her knees. The pilot, a sorcerer who could fly anything but preferred aircraft with fun weapons, let loose another rocket, and the explosion lifted Darkus up and threw her like a rag doll. She rolled, her body limp. She'd been hurt, but there was no blood, no burns. Darkus rose suddenly, stumbling away from the minigun's angry bullets, raising her hand towards the Apache. The minigun altered its aim and loosed another barrage that thundered into her chest. She fell to a sitting position, but Valkyrie glanced up in time to see the helicopter's rotor blades disintegrating. The Apache whined and dropped, and she saw Fletcher grab the pilot and they jumped, disappearing the instant they cleared the stricken aircraft. The Apache had time to flip halfway over before it hit the ground right on top of Darkus. My turn. Skullduggery said, stepping away from Valkyrie. He hefted the god-killer sword as Ravel and Saracen appeared on the rooftop opposite. Saracen already had an arrow knocked in the bow. Skullduggery and Ravel jumped down into the square. There was a squeal of protesting metal, and then Darkus stumbled from the smoking wreckage. Saracen let loose the arrow, but Darkus whirled, snatched it from the air before it hit her. Saracen sent two more after it, keeping her busy while Skullduggery ran up behind her. She snatched both arrows and broke them, then ducked the swing that would have taken her head from her shoulders. Skullduggery spun, the blade going low for her legs. But again Darkus moved, just out of range, almost stepping straight towards Ravel's spear. At the last moment, though, she seemed to sense he was there, and she slipped sideways and backed away from them both. Ravel! she said in a voice so loud Valkyrie could hear her from where she stood. You're working with Ravel? After what he did to Ghastly? Until you're dealt with, Skullduggery said. I'd make a deal with Mevelant himself. Saracen sent another arrow her way, but she caught it, stopping it millimeters from her eye. Godkillers, she said. And there I thought Tanith had destroyed them all. Valkyrie frowned. Darkus was getting her cockiness back. 
She was being given time to recover. Let me guess, Darkus continued. Billy Ray, wasn't it? He did something. Switched them. Ooh, that Billy Ray, he is so much trouble. We're giving you one last chance to surrender, said Skullduggery. Ravel hefted the spear and closed in. Skullduggery approached from the left. Darkus smiled as she watched them come, moving slightly to avoid giving Saracen a clean shot. No, you're not, she said. If I surrender, you're going to kill me immediately. I'm far too dangerous to be kept alive. Where would you put me? Not even the cube could contain me now. No, you're going to kill me. You just want me to make it easy on you by allowing you to get in close enough to do it. Sneaky, Skullduggery. Very sneaky. Thought it was worth a try, Skullduggery said. I like this suit, and I'd hate to see it crumpled. Oh, yes. That's the one you die in, isn't it? In Cassandra's vision? It's a nice one, I have to admit. You look good in black. Dashing, even. I'm glad you didn't try something silly like wearing the navy pinstripe. As if putting on different clothes would alter what's going to happen. We've both seen it. We both know how you're going to die. Out here in the streets. Erskine and Saracen, though. Now your deaths remain a mystery. Do I kill you here? Do I kill you now or later? How badly injured are you? How long does it take you to die? Is it quick and merciful or slow and protracted? Questions, questions. And speaking of questions, Saracen, are you going to take this opportunity to finally tell us what your power is? You'll die wondering, said Saracen from above. I like your optimism, Darkus responded. But you all know I can kill you with a click of my fingers. So click, said Skullduggery. Darkus smiled. Figures blurred past Valkyrie, forcing a startled cry from her lips. She hadn't even heard them run up. And here they were, leaping off the edge of the building, diving gracefully into the square, spinning to land silently on their feet. The vampires fell upon Darkus. They may not have been as savagely powerful as their nighttime selves, but they were strong and agile, and proved enough of a distraction to make Darkus forget about clicking her fingers. There were twelve of them. Twelve or fifteen. It was hard to count they were moving so fast. Darkus lashed out, caught two of them by pure chance, but the others weren't giving her time to get her bearings. She backed off. The vampires a constant whirling threat, avoiding her grabs and smacking her hands down when she raised them. Skullduggery went with them, jabbing at her with the sword whenever a space opened up. Valkyrie's attention was diverted by the cracks in the ground behind Darkus. Cracks that hadn't been there a moment ago. Darkus took another step backwards, and Billy Ray Sanguine reached up, grabbed her ankles, pulled her into the ground, down to her knees. The vampires broke off on cue, and Skullduggery brought the sword down in an overhead swing. And Darkus raised a hand, and the sword hit an invisible barrier centimeters from her skull. Valkyrie's eyes widened. Suddenly she could see the magic. Everyone in that square had an aura around them. The vampires shone with a dull, pale blue. Saracen was surrounded by a deep purple, and Ravel by a strong shade of orange. Darkus had a silver light that shone from deep within her. And it was this silver light that the sword was pressing against, trying to break through. Skullduggery Pleasant burned with a brilliant red. As Valkyrie watched, entranced by this new facet of her power, the silver light wrapped around the sword, and she was about to cry out to warn Skullduggery when the blade shattered. Darkus grabbed him threw him into Saracen, just as he was about to let loose another arrow. The vampires renewed their attack, but Darkus was ready for them. The silver light pulsed, and three vampires exploded into nothingness. No, that wasn't quite right. Valkyrie could still see their swirling colors, now without physical forms to inhabit. Their magic, their energy, feeding back into the world in a continuous stream of life and death. She looked at her own hand, turning it, 
mesmerized by the new brilliance that shone through her skin from within. She could almost see her veins, her capillaries, the bones of her fingers. And then Darkus flew by and knocked her off her feet. She went rolling across the roof, and when she stopped, her hand was normal and the brilliant colors were gone. She looked up as Darkus flew in great loops and steep dives, trying to outrun the two arrows that chased her. Skullduggery lifted Saracen, dropped him to the roof, and he knocked an arrow and let it fly. This arrow went to Darkus from another angle, and she barely avoided it. It swerved when it missed, joined the other two in pursuit. Darkus flew straight up into the clouds. The arrows followed. Ravel landed nearby in a gust of wind, helped Valkyrie to her feet before she even knew it was happening. She shook his hand off, but she doubted he noticed. He stood with Skullduggery and Saracen, peering up as if he were still part of the team. Skullduggery looked back at her. Your turn's coming up, Valkyrie nodded. The fear she felt was not just in anticipation of the conflict with Darkus. It was also about the fact that her life now lay in the hands of the two most incompetent zombies who had ever died. 75. Scapegrace fought well. In his imagination, he fought well. He ducked and whirled and countered and parried and thrust. In his imagination, the sword was an extension of his arm, and he was magnificent. In reality, things weren't quite so impressive. He swung his sword a hundred times, and a hundred times the guardian wasn't there anymore. A step to the side, or a step backwards, or a step forward, and Scapegrace would miss and go stumbling, and the guardian would then turn to Thrasher and fend off his ridiculous attacks. Compared to this porcelain-faced stranger, they were clumsy idiots who didn't know what the hell they were doing. But then, compared to anyone, they were clumsy idiots who didn't know what the hell they were doing. But Scapegrace didn't give up. He couldn't. His sword clanged against the guardians. This wasn't about him any more. He knew how pathetic he was. He could see through all of his past illusions. He was a joke, a punchline. But so what? None of it mattered. What mattered was winning. What mattered was helping Valkyrie Kane save the world. He turned again as Thrasher distracted the Guardian. Maybe this was his chance. Now, while the Guardian's back was turned, while he was busy fighting Thrasher, was it heroic to stab an opponent in the back? Not in the slightest. But then, Scapegrace wasn't a hero. He was just a man, doing what he could to help others. He started forward, and then the Guardian plunged his sword through Thrasher's head. No! Scapegrace shrieked as Thrasher crumpled, the sword still lodged in his skull. Blind rage seized Scapegrace's mind, and suddenly he was throwing his own sword down and diving at the Guardian. They rolled across the ground. But Scapegrace was the first up, his teeth gritted, hatred burning in his eyes. Again and again his fist came down on the Guardian's unbreakable face. He tried to keep the anger going, tried to draw strength from it, but he was weak and getting weaker. It was as if Thrasher, that idiot Thrasher, had been his strength all along, and now that he was lost, Scapegrace fell back into a sitting position. The Guardian lay there, looking at him. Then he sat up. You have passed the final test, he said. Scapegrace didn't care. The skeleton began the trials, the guardian continued. He was told the first test was a test of purity. But all the tests have been tests of purity. You have passed the most important test of all. You were pure of heart, Vorian Scapegrace. Thrasher was pure of heart, but not me. I'm selfish and mean and stupid. What about me is pure, eh? 
If you think you can see something pure in me, you tell me what it is. I can see into your soul, said the guardian. The things you say about yourself are true, but the pure of heart rise from humble beginnings. Sometimes all you need is one single moment to redeem yourself. And I had that, did I? You had. You had a moment of pure compassion. It was fleeting. In fact, I almost missed it. But it was there. In that moment, thinking about your friend, you were pure of heart. And now the sigil is yours to activate. The guardian opened his robes. A light burned where his heart should have been. Without even being told, Scapegrace knew what to do. He reached for that light, felt the warmth on his dead skin, and seized it. The light flared, spreading through hidden veins in the guardian's face, and got so bright Scapegrace had to look away. When it faded, and he looked back, his hand was empty and the guardian was gone. The hourglass turned slowly and sand began to fall. I did it, Scapegrace said. I, I did it. From behind him, the weakest of voices. I always knew you would, master. Scapegrace spun round to his hands and knees, crawled quickly over to where Thrasher lay. He took Thrasher's hand, held it tightly. It has been an honor serving you, sir, Thrasher said. Oh, you idiot. What have you done? I seem to have a, a sword stuck through my brain, sir. That's, that's not good, is it? It isn't. I thought as much. Master... There are some things I wish to say. Call me Varian. Thrasher's eyes blinked back tears that would never fall. Varian, he breathed. What a beautiful name. Thank you, Jared. A peaceful smile blossomed. Varian, until I met you, my life was... An exceptional. I was a lonely man. I had no friends. I had no one. Hush, Jared, said Scapegrace. Save your strength. I must speak, Warren. I have so much to say. So little time. I met you when my life ended, and yet it began. Oh, God. I've never been a brave person, said Thrasher. I've never seen myself as being worthy of the things other people take for, for granted, of being liked, of being loved, put for in you. You make me brave. I treated you terribly. A soft chuckle. <laughs> you did. I insulted you. I treated you like a fool. I should have valued every moment with you. I valued our moments enough for both of us. I... Oh, for it? I feel myself slipping. Hold on, Gerald. I'll get help. I'll... It's too late for me, the master. But I want you to know that I will always be with you. I will always be right. He raised his hand, and his finger tapped against Scapegrace's chest. <laughs> Despite himself, Scapegrace smiled. You're quoting from E.T. at a time like this. 
I love that movie, Thrasher said, his voice no more than a whisper. But I love you more. And then his eyes closed, and he went limp. Scapegrace's body was incapable of producing tears, but he cried nonetheless. He cried for his friend, his companion, for the one person who always stuck by him, no matter what. He cried for the man Gerald had been, the man he had become, and the man he would now never be. And he cried for himself, for the loneliness that was now gripping what was left of his heart, a heart that didn't beat, suddenly realizing that if by some miracle it started to pump blood once again, it would have probably beaten for Gerald. Scapegrace got up slowly, seized the hilt of the guardian's sword, and with great effort he pulled the blade from the head of his friend. Immediately Thrasher opened his eyes. Oh, I think that did it. Scapegrace yelped, dropping the blade as he jumped back. Thrasher sat up. These new brains are remarkable, he said. I suppose there's something to be said for having the brain of a vegetable after all, eh? Scapegrace stared as Thrasher got to his feet. The idiot grinned at him. Those were some pretty nice things you were saying to me. Maybe we needed this. From this moment on, Vorian, maybe we can be equals. Hmm? If we're careful, we have a hundred lifetimes to look forward. Shut up! Thrasher blinked. Vorian? You call me master. I was just being nice to you because I thought you were dying. I was dying. You're not anymore. Now you're just an idiot with a hole through his head. But all those things you said to me, you called me Gerald. Gerald is a stupid name for a zombie. Your name is Thrasher. Your name will always be Thrasher. Thrasher slumped. Yes, sir. Now, give me the map. I'm getting out of here. Uh... Sir? Scapegrace looked up and froze. They were surrounded by blurred figures, their faces indistinct and their shapes hazy. Ghosts. Two people, two solid people, stepped to the front. They were dressed like the Guardian, with robes and porcelain masks. We have been waiting for you, said the first of them. He spoke with a Scottish accent. I am the Inquisitor. You have proved yourself worthy, and you are, of course, entitled to leave Marin Ta'ul at your discretion. Before you do, however, a bigger moment of your time. Scapegrace glanced at Thrasher. Okay, sure. What can I do for you? The Inquisitor's porcelain face appeared hopeful. You are a zombie king. Are you not? I used to be, said Scapegrace. He still is, said Thrasher. I gave that up, Scapegrace insisted. Now I'm just me again. Just normal old me. My no zombie king. Not really. I don't think I ever was. But we need you to be, said the Inquisitor. We have been waiting for one such as you. I have been waiting for centuries. Scapegrace frowned. For me? Why? The Inquisitor spread his arms wide. This is Merin Ta'ul, the city below, the necropolis, the city of the dead. Down here the dead number in the hundreds of thousands. The others are watching us even now, waiting for me to ask. To ask what? To ask you to be our king. Scapegrace blinked. I'm sorry. A zombie king is but one name for a king of the dead. I need you here, my lord. 
I beseech you, rule over us. We are yours to command. Seriously? Thrasher stepped closer. What about Clarabelle? He whispered in Scapegrace's ear. We told her we'd go back for her. She's waiting for us. Scapegrace nodded. That's right. Listen, Mr. Inquisitor, we have a friend, and she needs us right now. We need you more. We made a promise, though. A promise to the living is a meaningless thing, the Inquisitor said. Our oath of servitude to you, however, would be eternal. Scapegrace hesitated. Eternity was a mighty long time, and to rule down here, to take on something as important as the mantle of King of the Dead, that was something he'd never even considered possible. But to do so would be to abandon Clarabelle, and he could no more do that than he could cut off his own arm. Although he could probably have cut off his own arm relatively easily. Some day, he said, when my work in the world of the living is done, when they need me no longer, I will return here. This I vow to you. The Inquisitor bowed. All the ghosts bowed. As you command, my lord. Scapegrace nodded to them all, and, with Thrasher at his heels, he walked away with as much imperial majesty as he could muster. 76. Darkus had gone through them like they weren't there. She'd taken out Saracen first. Those arrows had been getting too close, so she dumped a wall on them. He lay there now, his bones broken. Valkyrie didn't know if he were alive or dead. Darkus had killed or injured whatever sorcerers, vampires, and cleavers leaped at her next, and then she'd gone after Skullduggery. Valkyrie had watched it from her hiding place. He jabbed, swung, and thrust with what remained of the sword, and Darkus played with him long enough for her own amusement. Then she'd torn the sword from his grip and hit him so hard Valkyrie hadn't even seen where he'd landed. Darkus used the sword to kill a few cleavers. Then Solomon Wreath sprang at her from the shadows. Darkus had slashed him diagonally from the hip to the shoulder, and his body came apart in a violent display of blood and innards. Valkyrie's hand had gone to her mouth to stop herself from crying out. When Solomon's remains had settled on the ground, Darkus discarded the sword and had gone after Ravel. And what had Ravel done? He had thrown down the spear and he had run. Darkus's laughter reached Valkyrie, and it beckoned her. She couldn't stand by any longer. She didn't think the Marin sigil had activated yet. She certainly didn't feel any different anyway. But she couldn't keep hiding, not when there were so many people risking and giving their lives to buy her time. She watched a lone cleaver attack Darkus. She watched his scythe burst apart and his legs snap. He fell into the dirt and the rubble of the street, and Darkus walked over to him to finish the job with her bare hands. Screw this. Valkyrie slipped out of her hiding place, ran across the rooftop. It was a long way down, and she jumped. While she fell, she focused on her magic, focused on the energy inside her, tried to summon the barrier that would protect her when she landed, the cushion of light that had made her bounce off the tree by the roadside. But nothing happened. She could feel the magic. It crackled between her fingertips, but she didn't know how to summon it or control it, and now she was dropping towards certain stupid death, and she was going to die, and her tattoo began to burn. And she landed on her feet, and her bones didn't break. She straightened up, peeked inside her jacket. The sigil glowed on her arm. She was invulnerable. Cool. She reached out with her hand, and then reached out with her magic, and white lightning sprang from her fingers and hit Darkus, made her stumble. The injured cleaver forgotten about, Darkus whirled, and her look of anger became a look of curiosity. Well now, she said, look who's got herself a whole new bag of tricks. Damn right, said Valkyrie, striding towards her. 
What are you? An energy thrower? Your magic is bubbling and boiling inside you. I can see it from here. It's impressive. It's different. You're not just an energy thrower, are you? There's something else. Your magic is purer than that. Darkus frowned. What are you? I'm stronger than you. Well, Darkus said, smiling, we'll see about that. She hit Valkyrie full force, and a thousand suns exploded behind her eyes. And when Valkyrie's brain came back online a moment later, she was tumbling backwards down the street. She came to a sprawling, ungraceful stop beside a parked car and waited for her head to clear. Apparently being invulnerable didn't mean that she couldn't feel pain. Good to know. Valkyrie stood, rubbing her jaw. You're not this powerful, Darkus said, walking after her. You may have got your fancy new magic, but you can't be this strong. They've done something to you, haven't they? Have they boosted you? Did you finally step into the accelerator? Did it drive you insane? Strength tingled through Valkyrie's veins. She waited until Darkus was a little closer, then punched her hands through the car beside her and stepped back to fling it. But the doors tore off, and she ended up throwing them instead. And she missed. Darkus laughed. Super strength isn't as easy as it looks, is it? See, you've got to think about these things. If you want to throw a car, you've got to grab the body. She darted to a little Volvo got one hand on its underside while the other gripped the frame and then flung it like a discus at the Olympics. Valkyrie tried to get out of the way, but it clipped her shoulder and spun her round. She stumbled, tripping over the pavement, and Darkus flew at her. They collided, hit the wall and lurched away, hands clutching at each other's throats. The little Volvo had just come to a rocking stop beside them and Valkyrie slammed her forehead into Darkus's face, and the back of Darkus's head hit the Volvo. Valkyrie did it again, and again, doing her best to turn Darkus's head to pulp, but it was the Volvo that gave way first. Darkus fell sideways, and she grabbed Valkyrie's hair, pulling her head down into a knee that would have caved in her face were it not for the sigil on her arm. Before she could recover, Darkus's eyes lit up, and twin streams of energy exploded against Valkyrie's chest, sending her crashing through a window. There were people in here, a family, and they screamed and ran out of the back as Valkyrie struggled to get up. The front door burst into a million splinters, and Darkus came at her like a bullet train, driving her through the wall and into the kitchen in a shower of plaster. They rolled across the floor, punching and biting and scratching and gouging. Valkyrie scrambled up and heaved, swinging Darkus into the fridge by her hair. She moved back quickly, dragging Darkus the length of the room, then let go and kicked her head so hard she heard the spine snap. But even as Darkus rolled away, Valkyrie heard the clicks as the vertebrae repaired themselves. Darkus got up, and Valkyrie hit her with a chair that smashed on impact. She grabbed one of the legs as they fell and plunged it through Darkus's throat, then punched her as she gagged. Darkus spun, staggered, but spun again with a back fist that sent Valkyrie crashing into the hall. Darkus pulled the chair leg out and dropped it, healed herself and spat blood. She was grinning. Valkyrie ran at her, but Darkus flew upwards through the ceiling. Valkyrie hurried out into the street, looking up. She saw Darkus as a speck in the sky, swooping around, coming back down at an alarming speed. Power crackled in Valkyrie's hands while she waited for her to get near, and then she let loose and the lightning hit Darkus, making her veer off course and crash into the ground. Valkyrie sprinted over just as Darkus was getting to her hands and knees. She lashed a kick into her side, kicked her again while she rolled. Darkus caught the third kick, tried to twist Valkyrie's leg off, but Valkyrie just blasted her at close range. They clung to each other, and there were hair pulls and eye gouges and headbutts and bites, and then they were lifting off the ground, rising high above the city, still scrapping, still fighting, still snarling. And then Darkus let go, and Valkyrie fell. And oh, how she fell, straight down, with the wind rushing in her ears and her hair whipping about her face. She was glad she didn't have her stick with her, 
It probably wouldn't have survived what came next. She hit the ground. It was painful. Valkyrie rolled onto her back and lay there, panting. Darkus flew down to the ornate concrete fountain beside her and stood on the edge. Is that it? Is this the full extent of your plan? Please, Valkyrie, tell me you have something more up your sleeve. It was a good tussle. It was. But let's face it. All I have to do is keep hitting you until whatever is boosting your power wears off. I can't imagine that'll be very much longer. Something moved in the shadows behind Darkus. Valkyrie said nothing. If you were as smart as you like to think you are, Darkus continued, you'd be trying to hide from me right now. I mean, it's you I'm after. You get that, right? I came here so that we can be whole again. Is that your way of surrendering? Valkyrie asked. Darkus smiled. I'm not the one who'll surrender. And it won't be like it was, either. There'll be no more of your annoying little voice in my head. But when you're gone, what you are, behind all the thoughts and the snarky comments, will remain. That's what I want, Valkyrie. You're a part of me. We belong together. You feel it too, right? You feel that a part of you is missing? She did. She couldn't deny it. There was an emptiness to her now, a loneliness she hadn't felt before. Not even the new magic, whatever it was, could fill that gap. Come on, Darkus said, holding out her hand. Why are you fighting? All you ever do is fight. Why? Who says you have to? There are other ways, Valkyrie. Try acceptance. Accept that we belong together, that we're stronger when we are one, that we're better. Stop fighting. Stop hurting. I don't want to hurt anyone anymore. Not even Ravel. I'm tired of that. I'm tired of this. Come on. Take my hand. You never have to be lonely again. Well... Maybe that's the difference between us, Valkyrie said, getting to her feet. I don't mind the loneliness. Not really. You know why? Because I know I have friends. And they're standing right behind you. Skullduggery and Melancholia emerged from an archway. Shadows writhed round Melancholia's body like angry snakes and more shadows seeped from beneath Skullduggery's shirt as he walked. They covered his body, forming armor, and when he rose up on a tide of darkness it was not Skullduggery pleasant who crested that wave, but Lord Vile, in all his terrible glory. 77. Lord Vile and Melancholia attacked. They were relentless two of the most powerful necromancers of the last thousand years, and they drove Darkus back between them. Shadows were knives and whips and hammers and chains. They cut, tore, ripped, and bludgeoned. Darkus was given not one moment to recover, not one second to heal. Valkyrie watched in numb astonishment as her adversary, as the adversary, was sent to the ground again and again. She watched as Darkus got up for maybe the tenth time, took a step, and faltered. Frowning, Darkus looked down at her left foot. It was badly broken, twisted at an unnatural angle. She glared at it, and finally the foot moved, mending itself. But the frown on her face remained. Vile and melancholia closed in. Twin beams of sizzling energy burst from Darkus's eyes, but Vile was already shadow-walking away. Melancholia seized her chance, leaped high into the air and sent down a thousand thorns of darkness. They ripped through Darkus, tearing through her armored clothes and shredding her flesh, and Valkyrie caught an unmistakable grimace of pain. Darkus was hurt. The shadows coiled and Vile emerged, taking Darkus's head in his hands and wrenching it to one side. Her neck broke and immediately mended. 
but the cry of pain that accompanied her wild swing was enough to spur Melancholia on even while Vile fell back. The shadows lashed again and again, cutting through Darkus's defences. She was spending so much power healing her body that she could no longer dampen her pain. She was feeling every strike now, and her wounds were taking longer to repair. She darted suddenly, closing the gap between herself and Melancholia. Caught off guard, Melancholia tripped, and Darkus landed on top of her. She rained down punches. Melancholia's shadow armor convulsed in panicked response. She wasn't used to physical confrontations. Valkyrie ran in, slipped her arm round Darkus's throat, hauled her off. Melancholia rolled over onto her hands and knees, regaining her bearings. Darkus twisted, managed to hook a foot between Valkyries. They fell, Valkyrie on the bottom. Darkus turned into her, hit her with everything she had, but Valkyrie grabbed her wrist, threw her left leg over Darkus's head, and straightened. Darkus fell onto her back, and Valkyrie yanked down on her arm as she raised her hips, and she heard the elbow break. Darkus screamed. Valkyrie lost her grip, and Darkus rolled away, still screaming as she got up, clutching her dangling arm. Before she could heal, Vile sent a shard of darkness right through her torso. Darkus dangled there, off her feet, her eyes wide and blood running from her open mouth. The shard retracted, and Darkus stood, swaying. She was in shock. They were going to win. Darkness reared up around her, forming a Venus flytrap of shadows. It sprang closed, two dozen razored barbs skewering her body. The shadows started to melt, and Darkus stumbled through them, falling to her knees. She started to flicker. She was trying to shunt. Valkyrie raised both hands, white lightning flowing from her fingertips. The lightning hit Darkus, and she cried out and fell sideways. She stopped flickering. Melancholia and Vile walked up behind her as she tried to crawl away. Say this for her. She's not going down without a fight. Melancholia reached down, grabbed a fistful of hair, and she pulled Darkus back up to her knees. Darkus gasped, her face splattered with her own blood. Melancholia allowed her shadow armor to retract, and it lashed at the ground wildly, like a petulant child denied its plaything. This has been invigorating, Melancholia said. Truly invigorating. Finally, I'm realizing my own potential. I can... I can sense life and death. I can see it. I can see it all around us. I see it in you, Darkus. I see your life. I see how easy it would be to just pluck it out. Darkus reached up, tried to free herself, but the effort was feeble, and Melancholia slapped the hand down. I am the death bringer, Melancholia continued. I am the ultimate necromancer. Who are you? Your Valkyrie Kane's dark side in the body of her reflection. You're nothing but the collection of spare parts. And they were all scared of you? Really? Melancholia laughed. Her eyes were black, and black steam rose off her. It's me they should have been afraid of. You thought you were a god? Maybe you are, but even gods can die. And I? I am death. Melancholia, Valkyrie said. Melancholia looked up, blinking those black eyes. Valkyrie? she said, sounding dazed. She sharpened. Yes, sorry, getting carried away with the whole power thing. Are my eyes black? They feel black. They're black. Cool. Melancholia glanced at Vile. Let's do what we came here to do. Their shadows moved like a thousand tiny snakes, burrowing slowly into Darkus's body. Darkus screamed as blood ran. This time there would be no healing. This time there would be no surviving. They were going to kill her slowly, 
and make sure there was not even a sliver of life left behind. Valkyrie's hands started to tingle. She unzipped her jacket, pulled it halfway down her arm. The tattoo was pulsing. Not long now, she could almost feel her invulnerability about to slip away. It didn't matter. Darkus was done. Defeated. All they needed was another few seconds, and then those shadows would split her apart, and it'd all be over. Darkus clasped her hands before her. Vile and melancholia didn't notice. Darkus's arms started to tremble. Silver light spilled from between her fingers. Very, very bright light. Valkyrie ran forward. Stop her! she screamed. Don't let her! But it was too late. Darkus opened her hands. 78. The silver light exploded outwards and consumed the world. 79. It swallowed vile and melancholia. 80. A deafening rush of air. The world filled with fragments, bricks and masonry, and glass and wood and metal. Valkyrie thrown, tossed and spun, buildings torn down, folded like paper, streets crumpled, lampposts snapped. Eighty-one. And then everything was silent. Eighty-two. There was a wind. Valkyrie didn't know where it had come from. Just a moment ago it was a still day. A moment? A minute? An hour? But now there was a wind. A strong wind. Catching the clouds of dust and spinning them into little tornadoes. She turned over. Eighty-three. Onto her back. Dust in her eyes. Dust in her mouth. She was cold. She'd lost her jacket. The shock wave had yanked it away from her. Was she hurt? She wriggled her toes. Wriggled her fingers. No broken bones. Was she bleeding? She didn't think so. She was okay. She was unhurt. Invulnerable? No, not any more. The tattoo had dulled. It had probably used up the last of its strength, keeping her alive during the... What? What was that? That was more than an explosion. It had been like a small nuclear bomb going off. Groaning, Valkyrie sat up. Eighty-four. Roarhaven was in ruins. The eastern quarter had been obliterated. It was a flat, smoking landscape of rubble and wreckage. Fires raged in the southern districts. Some of the northern section still stood, from what she could see. Car alarms traveled to her in the wind. They sounded like people dying. Valkyrie started walking. When she was sure her legs weren't going to fail her, she ran. Finding her way around Roarhaven when it stood tall and proud had been hard enough, but now the landmarks she'd used were flattened or gone altogether. She took a few wrong turns, had to double back, often climbing through demolished buildings to save time. She passed bodies and ignored them. And then a rock flew at her, struck her across the temple and she went tumbling down a small hill of debris. She sprawled in a heap at the bottom, her elbows cut and bleeding, blood running from her forehead into her eye. There were footsteps, slipping and sliding through the broken mess in their eagerness to get to her. Valkyrie managed to get to her knees, her vision blurry. Figures approached. She saw hate in their faces. We hurt her, one of them said. We can finish her said another. Valkyrie raised her hands. 
I'm not her, she said. Her voice sounded weird. She sounded drunk. I'm not Darkus. She didn't even see what struck her, but she felt the pain across her ribs and she cried out, fell onto her side. The figures crowded round her, their boots seeking her, finding her, crunching against her. She covered up, yelled at them to stop. A rib broke jaggedly. A kick to her kidney sent new flashes of pain arcing through her. Someone tried kicking her skull and broke the fingers of her left hand again. They screamed and cursed, and she heard their words. They knew who she was, and they didn't care. In their eyes, Valkyrie Kane was as much to blame for all this as Darkus. A kick found the side of her head and rolled her over, her body limp. Funny how this seemed to clear her eyesight. She saw in perfect clarity the foot coming for her face. It was clad in a heavy, steel-capped work boot. Good, she decided. She would have hated to be killed by a soft little running shoe. But the work boot never reached her. At the last moment, it vanished. There was another pair of boots there now. Brown boots, well-made, familiar. They stepped and pivoted and spun. And then all the other feet ran away. The brown boots bent, and a leather-clad knee came down. And gentle hands touched her face. Val, Tanit said. Val, can you hear me? Valkyrie felt her head being moved, and she tried focusing on Tanit's worried face, but she couldn't. Then she was being lifted, hoisted up over Tanit's shoulder. A fireman's lift, it was called. Tanit started running. She crossed the rubble smoothly, like she was skating on ice. She ran up the sides of broken buildings so that Valkyrie was looking straight down at the far below ground. Tanit's balance was impeccable. She crossed narrow beams in ruined houses, leaped from rooftop to rooftop, landing so gracefully Valkyrie could have been floating on a cloud. She blacked out a few times, but that wasn't Tanit's fault. That was just her approaching death. And then they were inside, in the sanctuary, and she was being laid out on a bed in the medical wing, and a light was being shone in her eyes. Multiple fractures, Cynic Dosh was saying. Concussion? Valkyrie, can you hear me? There were people screaming. The medical wing was full of injured people. On the bed beside her, Valkyrie saw Saracen Rue hooked up to a respirator. She tried to sit up, but a pair of strong hands held her down. Tanit's face swam into view. Steady, okay? They're helping you. Just stay there. Val, that explosion. Were you there? What was it? Is Darkus dead? Cynic Dosh came back, shouldered Tanith out of the way and jabbed a needle into Valkyrie's arm. Warmth flooded her body so suddenly it made her gasp, and the pain fell away. I need an X-ray, Cynic Dosh shouted to one of her assistants as she lifted Valkyrie's shirt. We've got internal bleeding here. There was movement all around, and someone was holding a scanner, and there was a bright blue light, and Valkyrie lay there and looked up at the ceiling. She coughed suddenly, but it didn't hurt. It didn't even alarm her when she tasted blood. It should have, though. Coughing blood should have alarmed her. She frowned. The warm feeling was nice. It was too nice. It wanted her to sink into it, to surrender completely. But she had things to do. She couldn't lie here and bleed. What was it that guy said in that movie? I ain't got time to bleed, Valkyrie muttered, sitting up. Synecdoche looked horrified. Valkyrie, lie down. You have serious injuries. Now that she was sitting up, her head was starting to clear. She held out her left hand. Her fingers were swollen and purple. Bandage me. Lie down. I'll lie down when I'm done. Synecdoche clenched her jaw but nodded to an assistant who hurried forward with a roll of bandages. While he rapped, Cynic Dosh busied herself with applying a clear gel to the cut on Valkyrie's forehead. Valkyrie looked around as best she could. 
Donegan Bain lay three beds away. She couldn't see Gracious. The door opened and China strode in. She was dressed in black. Her eyes were alive with worry. What happened? The explosion was Darkus's doing, Valkyrie said. There was a light. She was holding it. And then, I don't know, I don't know what it was. I didn't see what happened to her. I've heard reports that Lord Vile was seen in the area, China said. Valkyrie nodded. He was working with melancholia. What about Skullduggery? Tanith asked. I... I don't know, Valkyrie answered. China's face was anxious. Vile? she insisted. What happened to Vile? Valkyrie looked at her. She knew. Somehow she knew. I don't know that either, Valkyrie said. He was closer to the explosion than I was. I don't know what happened to him. China hesitated, her face no longer betraying any emotion, then nodded and walked out. Valkyrie slipped off the bed as gingerly as she was able. She couldn't move her left hand in its bandage. Her right leg was stiff for some reason, and when she prodded her side, it felt rigid. She stifled another cough, tasting blood again. Chew these when the pain returns, Sinekdosh said passing her a packet of leaves. Valkyrie nodded, stuffed them in her pocket, and left before the doctor could find a reason to keep her here. With Tanith following behind, she glimpsed China talking with Cassandra and Finbar, and ran to join them, ignoring the ugly jolts that rang throughout her body with each step. Cassandra had eyes closed when Valkyrie reached them. Darkus is alive, she said. She's weak, but recovering. At this rate, she'll be back to full strength in twenty minutes. Fifteen, Finbar corrected. What about Skullduggery? Valkyrie asked before China could. Cassandra shook her head. We can't sense him. But then we have never been able to sense him. His thoughts are constructed differently to ours, and this difference hides him from us. We were able to take a glimpse at Melancholy as the event took place, however. But I'm sorry to say that she didn't make it. She's dead. The girl means nothing, China said. Can you see Vile? Cassandra frowned. Lord Vile is there. We've seen no sign of him. Are you sure? What about anyone else? China said, ignoring the question. Any survivors? Cassandra nodded. Some injured, many scared. They're running from the blast site, apart from... She tilted her head, stayed quiet for a few moments, then. Your parents, Valkyrie. Your parents and your sister. Valkyrie went cold. They're outside? They're running towards the blast site, Cassandra said. Her frown deepened. They're looking for you. Someone's... Someone's behind them, hunting them. It's hard to see who it is. It's hard to... A remnant. It's a remnant. Vex, Valkyrie said. He's chasing them right into Darkus's hands. We need to go. I have to... She trailed off as an idea came to her, and the full weight of what she had to do made itself known. It dragged at her soul, leaving her empty inside. Val? Tanith said. Valkyrie turned to China. The gauntlet, she said. The death touch gauntlet. I left it in the ops room. Get it for me, please. I have to go back to the medical wing. Tanith gripped Valkyrie's arm, as if she were afraid she might collapse. What's wrong? Are you okay? I'm fine, Valkyrie insisted, disentangling herself. I have to get something. I'll meet you back in the ops room. She ran, retracing her steps holding her side as it began to ache dully. When she re-entered the medical wing, the staff were too busy to notice her, so she searched without being seen, found what she was looking for, and pocketed it. A wail of pain caught her attention, and she looked over. A woman having a broken bone reset. Nasty. But behind that woman, someone moving, someone slipping out of one of the smaller doors. Ravel.
She didn't have time for this. She really didn't. But she went after him anyway. The moment the door shut behind her, the sounds of the medical wing dimmed to almost nothing. Valkyrie followed the corridor into a part of the sanctuary she wasn't familiar with. She passed libraries with bookcases that stretched to the ceiling. She passed a room of swords, and another of masks, and another of glass cases containing old, wrinkled body parts suspended in solution. She saw a flickering orange light on the walls, and she turned very, very slowly. Ravel stood, leaning against the wall. His right hand, level with her belly, glowed with energy. He looked tired. What are you doing? he asked. He sounded weary. Don't you have enough to be worrying about without coming after me? I'm not a threat to you. You're a prisoner. He shook his head. Not any more. I thought I'd be okay with it. When I made my plans all that time ago, I knew I'd end up either dead or in shackles. I made my peace with that. But after what Darkest did to me, you have no idea what he was like. So you've said, I'm leaving Valkyrie. You'll never see me again. I'm going to spend the rest of my life alone. That's enough punishment, isn't it? Exile? Enough punishment? You had shot her killed? You murdered Ghastly with your own hands? You started a war that killed hundreds of sorcerers? You're seriously telling me that just a punishment for all that is you feeling lonely? I'm not going to stand here and justify my actions to you. Good. But you're not going to stop me. Darkus is still out there, isn't she? She's your concern. Worry about her, not me. I'm not your enemy. Your hand is lit up. Are you going to fire? How will I fight Darkus if you kill me? What if we fail? And she goes after you? A glimmer of cold determination flashed in Ravel's eyes. I'll be ready for her. If she comes after me, she's going to have to finish the job. No more torture. No more taking her time. He raised his hand. Go on, Valkyrie. You're not wearing your jacket. If a fire, you're dead. She didn't have time for this. Didn't have time for him. Okay, she said. But when we're done with Darkus, we're coming after you. Ravel smiled sadly. You'll never find me. His hand stopped glowing and he stepped back, and Valkyrie hurried back the way she'd come. She got to the ops room just as Fletcher teleported the sensitives away. China stood with Tanith and Sangwen at the table. Apart from them, the room was empty, the monitors abandoned. Valkyrie, Sanguin said. You look dead. She ignored him. The badly flickering Roarhaven hologram showed the devastation the explosion had caused. Smoke rose from rubble. She could even see little bodies lying in the streets. China gave her the death torch gauntlet and she pulled it on. It felt heavy and cold. Use the sigil to activate and deactivate, China said, indicating the symbol burnt into the black steel. When it's activated, whatever you do, do not scratch your nose. Valkyrie flexed her fingers. It kills without pain? China nodded. Instant, painless death. Whatever you touch. Are you sure you'll be able to get close enough to use it? Shouldn't be a problem, Valkyrie murmured. A cough rose in her chest and burst painfully. She wiped blood from her mouth. Jesus, foul, Tanith whispered. I saw a ravel, Valkyrie said. He's running. He said if Darkus finds him, he'll be ready for her. I think he's going to use the accelerator. China's eyes narrowed. One more use could overload us. Very well, Tanith, Mr. Sanguine. You go with Valkyrie. We can't detect Darkus on the map, but the odds are she's still in the blast area. I'll head down to the accelerator and deal with... She stopped, frowning over Valkyrie's shoulder. Where the hell have you been? The black cleaver stood in the doorway. How can you be my bodyguard if you're never around? Johnny continued. The cleaver took out his scythe. Now what are you doing? 
There's no one to guard me against now, you moron. Wait till our enemies show up before taking that thing out. Valkyrie's hand closed round China's wrist. Wait. Don't worry about it, Valkyrie. He's defective. Always has been. No, said Valkyrie. What he's always done is obey orders. A necromancy technique brought him back to life. So he started off obeying the necromancers. But then Nai stitched him back together. So it stands to reason that now he'd obey Nai's orders. Yes? So? So Nai was just broken out of prison. China stopped trying to pull her wrist free. With suspicious ease. A prison run by a secret member of the Church of the Faceless? And Eliza hasn't exactly been happy with you, has she? China observed the black cleaver. Have you been sent to her to assassinate me, you treacherous little toad? The scythe world, and the black cleaver started forward. Valkyrie and the others immediately began backing away. Billy Ray, Tanit said, her sword already in her hands. Take Val where she needs to go. I ain't leaving you, Sanguine said, his hand reaching into his jacket. Tanit's eyes never left the cleaver. Yes, you are, goddammit. But get back here immediately after, said China. Tanith nodded quickly. Immediately. Sanguine's face was a mass of conflicting emotions. Finally, he grabbed Valkyrie. Fine, he snarled. But don't die while I'm gone. The ground cracked and swallowed them. 85. The fear that gripped Tanit's heart as she fought the Black Cleaver was not new. She'd felt it before, in corridors very similar to this one, deep in the bowels of the old sanctuary back in Dublin. There she had faced this same man, back when he was clad in white, and a supposed pawn of Nefarian Serpine. Every move he had countered, every attack he had parried, and even when she thought she'd had him beaten, he had answered with a strike that very nearly ended her life. And here she was again. Tanith ducked the scythe and darted close, but the ever-spinning staff blocked her own sword swipe and sent her reeling. A snaith, the wooden handle was called. She'd learned that much since the last time they'd tangled, at least. She liked to know the name of things that hurt her. It was handy to have something upon which to focus her frustration. The scythe whistled for her face, and she jerked back, almost stumbled, managed to keep her feet beneath her while the black cleaver advanced. China was behind her, moving out of the ops room into the corridor, and Tanith followed. The black cleaver came last, his blade catching the light when it blurred by at a particular angle. It was pretty in its way. Tanith's sword caught the light too, but there was no rhythm to it. Against such an opponent, her skills seemed to dull, and the grace and fluidity she was used to displaying abandoned her, replaced by clumsy movements and wild, desperate lunges. Fear made her stiff and uncoordinated, and filled her head with thoughts and strategies when it needed to be clear. The black cleaver let his body do the thinking. Tanith had forgotten how. The cleaver spun and caught her with a kick. China flung her arms out, unleashing a wave of blue energy that cracked the ceiling and the floor, but which the black cleaver moved through like it was nothing more than a strong wind. China stepped back, tapping hidden tattoos around her body that glowed briefly beneath her clothes. Sigils on her legs made her faster not only in movement, but also in reaction. Even so, she barely stayed more than a hand's length from the blade that sought her out. Tanith leaped. The black cleaver spun at the very last moment, deflected her blade, but as Tanith landed, she sprang again, twisted in midair, and caught him with a kick. At the same time, China tapped her chest with both index fingers, and a stream of energy burst from her sternum. It hit the cleaver square in the back, and he went staggering to his knees. The energy stream cut off, and China sagged, suddenly very pale. Trails of smoke rose from the cleaver's coat as he stood. He turned to them, the scythe twirling in his hands. 86. 
Valkyrie hung on as Sanguine burrowed through the earth, the rumbling filling her ears. She kept her eyes closed against the constant spray of dirt, rocks, and stones scraping painfully against her T-shirt and her bare arms. They changed direction a few times, then went up, bursting free of the darkness into the daylight. Sanguine let her go without a word, and he sank back into the ground. In this part of Roarhaven, the streets were smoking ruins. She heard her name being called, her mortal name, and scrambled up onto a hill of rubble. The wind was deceptive, carrying sounds through the ruined streets and whipping them away again before Valkyrie had time to pinpoint their source. All she could see was desolation and smoke. She hugged herself, shivering against the cold. She wished she had her jacket. Don't take this the wrong way, Darker said from behind her. But you look terrible. Valkyrie turned, and Darkus's gaze dropped to her arms. You're wearing it, Darkus said, almost excitedly. The gauntlet thing. And you have the tattoo. You know what that means, don't you? The vision is about to come true. Not necessarily, said Valkyrie, coming back down the pile of rubble carefully. She narrowed her eyes, trying to see the aura that would alert her to Darkus's intent to use magic. Already little things are different. There's no ghastly for a start. And you're wearing different clothes. But you're not. So not everything has to be different. I'm still going to take your family away from you. Why? You came from me. In a way, they're your family, too. Valkyrie picked up a faint, silver light emanating from within Darkus. You said you wouldn't hurt them. I have no intention of hurting them, Darkus said. In fact, this will be different from the vision, because instead of burning them right out of existence, I'm going to allow them to live on as energy. You see? You're not the only one to have learned a few things from seeing the future. Her eyes flickered to the gauntlet, and her smile widened. So come on. What does it do? Does it make you strong? I was punching you with everything I had, and you didn't even bleed. You looked indestructible. You don't look indestructible now. What's the matter? Did you break it? Why don't you come over here and find out? Darkus laughed, and suddenly Valkyrie could see the aura surrounding her, like a light being switched from dim to full. Oh, I would, but you're a sneaky little thing. I should know, right? I think it'd probably be best to take care of you from over here. She raised her hand, and the silver light pulsed, and Valkyrie held out her left hand, which was glowing white beneath the bandages. The white energy pushed against the silver, keeping it back. Darkus frowned, and the silver retreated, and Valkyrie lowered her hand. How do you do that? Darkus asked. Valkyrie tried to reply, but her legs were shaking and her mouth was dry. That one act of self-defense had drained her. Darkus approached slowly, and Valkyrie concentrated on not falling down. If Darkus knew how weak she was, it'd all be over. Instead, she watched her come with what she hoped was a calm expression on her face. She couldn't even run if she'd wanted to. Darkus got closer and Valkyrie found herself wishing she'd move faster. Valkyrie's legs weren't going to be able to keep her up for very much. Valkyrie's legs gave out and she fell to her knees. 87. The scythe opened up Tanit's arm, and China had to cover her as she stumbled away from the return swipe. Blood ran freely down to her hand, turning her grip on her sword slick, another cut to add to her growing collection. Her left leg and her back shared similar wounds. The cleaver's boot heel smacked against China's jaw. She spun, her legs folding beneath her. Tanith charged, gritting her teeth as she pressed the attack. The cleaver met her coolly, and then, almost like he was proving that he could, he caught Tanith with the exact same kick 
that had felled China. She hit the ground. She'd lost her sword. Running footsteps. Someone had called for help. Finally. The cleavers closed in, grey surrounding black. No time was spent on questions, and no breath wasted on negotiations. The greys had their enemy, and they attacked. They worked as a team, fainting when another slashed, moving forward when another dropped back. Their sides went high and low, and the black cleaver spun and dodged and parried and blocked. The sharp clang of blade upon blade and the dull whack of snaith upon snaith filled the corridor in a rapid rhythm, never slowing. Few openings appeared during the furious exchange, but when they did, scythe blades slid uselessly across armored uniforms. Unless someone took the initiative, they'd fight themselves to a standstill. The black cleaver dropped his scythe. He moved between two swipes and grabbed the head of the nearest cleaver, twisting it as he spun behind him. He shoved the dead man into the path of his comrades and lunged at the one who darted clear. They traded elbows and knees while they grappled for the scythe, and then the black cleaver whirled with a kick that snapped his opponent's head round so fast that Tanith heard the vertebrae pop. But the two remaining cleavers were already too close to avoid. One of them kicked the fallen scythe out of the black cleaver's reach while the other swung his own side down. With frightening accuracy, the blade slid between the black cleaver's helmet and collar, pierced his neck, and buried itself deep within his torso. The black cleaver dropped to his knees. His head! Tanith shouted. Take his head! The grey kept both hands on his side, pinning the black cleaver down while his partner took an executioner's stance in front. The executioner swung without ceremony, without wasting a moment to gloat or ponder, but he was still too slow. The black cleaver ducked, and the side cut through the snaith, holding him down. Still with a blade lodged within him, the black cleaver sprang at the executioner, got his hands on that helmet, and wrenched it to one side. Three cleavers, three broken necks. The remaining grey attacked with fists and feet and elbows and knees. The black cleaver was a blur. He never tired. He never faltered. The grey made one mistake, responded to a feint when he should have backed off, and the black cleaver got his hands on him and added another broken neck to his tally. He took hold of the blade sticking out of his neck and pulled it from him. Black blood dripped, and he let it clatter to the ground as he picked up another scythe. "'Where's Fletcher Wren when you need him?' China muttered, as she helped Tanith to her feet. "'Go,' Tanith said, grabbing her sword. "'I'll hold him off.' China stared at her. "'You? I'm your bodyguard, aren't I? Besides, Ravel needs to be stopped, and I don't know the way down to the accelerator room. So it looks like a grand and noble gesture is called for.' China raised an eyebrow. I'm almost impressed. Yeah, well, I'm not doing this for... She stopped. Someone was whistling. Ennio Morricone, the theme from The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. The black cleaver looked round. Billy Ray Sanguine stood beneath the flickering light, whistling, one hand in his pocket, the other dangling by his leg, holding the god-killer dagger. China squeezed Tanith's arm and ran. Sanguine came to the end of his little tune, and he raised his head slightly, and Tanith reckoned he knew damn well that he'd never looked so cool as he did right at that moment. You have one chance to walk away, Sanguine said. How are you? I take it. The black cleaver faced him, his scythe ready. Sanguine shrugged, like he was disappointed and started forward. 88. Darkus didn't laugh when Valkyrie fell. She didn't mention it at all. In fact, she wasn't even looking. Her eyes were on the man who was emerging from a broken doorway. Here he is at last, she said. My little traitor. Oh, I'm no traitor. Dexter Vex said, smiling. 
I'm just someone who wasn't seduced by the carnage you promised. I'm just someone who understands that our goals aren't exactly compatible. Darkus shrugged. Your fellow remnants believed what they wanted to believe. Yes, they did, said Vex. And they almost doomed us all. Valkyrie forced herself up. Her legs were weak, but her strength was returning slowly. And you think you can save the day? Darkus said to Vex, strolling towards him. Me? said Vax, nodding. Found a few friends. A remnant swooped down, attaching itself to Darkus's face. She grabbed it, pulled it away, and another latched onto her back. She reached behind her, and a third was suddenly in her hair, its little claws tearing at her scalp. A fourth remnant flew at her, and a fifth, and they were at her face, and prizing open her mouth, and Darkus stumbled and cursed. And when her mouth opened, the first remnant slipped in, then the second, then the third, and then a stream of remnants flowed down from above, straight into her open mouth, and her hands were at her bulging throat, and her eyes were wide, but there was nothing she could do to stop the flow. Hundreds of remnants, no, thousands, flying into her, faster and faster, overpowering her, taking control, even as black veins started to rise beneath her skin. Then the flow ended, and Darkus gasped, staggered, and Vex watched the whole thing with his hands in his pockets. You're going to deliver what you promised, he said. You're going to give us a playground that will be ours forever. The black veins faded slightly. You think you can... You think... She gasped again, and the black veins rose. Her lips darkened. You're one of us now, said Vex. It took practically all of us to do it, but I think it's been worth it, don't you? Now it's time for you to do what you do best. Kill, destroy, have fun. Darka smiled, but the smile turned sour and she frowned. The veins faded again before rising. She was fighting it. Practically all of you, she rasped. Should have brought more. She stood up straight, eyes locked on Vex. I'm killing your brothers and sisters. For the first time, Vex lost his confidence. Impossible. I'm killing, Darkus said slowly, every last one of them. I'm burning them inside me. They want to. They want to get out. Stop said Vex. Stop! Energy burst from his hand, but Darkus caught it in her palm. Her skin sizzled and healed. They're making me stronger, she said. Every one of them I kill makes me that little bit stronger. The last of the veins faded. Her lips returned to their full natural color, and she smiled. Vex launched himself at her, and she batted his hands away and grabbed him by the throat. She forced her hand into his mouth, shoving it down his gullet. Come on now, she said. Where are you? Don't bother trying to hide. I can put you back together. You know I can. I can make you solid again. Ah, there you are. Come on out. Come on. She yanked the remnant free, and Vex sagged, and she threw him away. He hurtled through the air, landed and rolled, dead or unconscious, with all that blood Valkyrie didn't know. All she knew was that he'd landed in the street beside her. The remnant wriggled in Darkus's grip, but its struggles only made her widen her smile. Scared, are you? I bet you are. When you're like this... You can't form thoughts, can you? Not really. All you are is instinct, emotion. Right now, all you are is fear. Valkyrie reached Vex without Darkus looking round, and she tugged the backpack from over his shoulder. She wanted to check his pulse, to check he was still alive, but she couldn't. She had to move, and so she sprinted for the other side of the street. Once safely behind a half-demolished wall, 
she put the bag on her back, fixing the strap across her chest, feeling the reassuring weight of the scepter. She peeked out as Darkus let the remnant go, and watched her laugh at the speed with which it flew off. Valkyrie cut through the remains of an alley, started running. 89. She had to admit, she was impressed. Sanguine wasn't taking any chances fighting the Black Cleaver, but neither was he missing opportunities. The God-Killer dagger gave him confidence, but he wasn't letting that spill over into cockiness. He attacked with skill and timing and patience, and he came close a few times. The Black Cleaver obviously knew what the dagger was, because he twisted and spun and danced just out of reach. There was a healthy respect at work here from both men. Sanguine stumbled away from a swiping blade into the wall, and he smiled. The wall crumbled, and he sank into it. The Black Cleaver turned, wary, stepping lightly and quickly. Sanguine lunged from the opposite wall, and the Black Cleaver blocked the slash. But the dagger cut through the scythe blade like it was paper. The Cleaver abandoned his weapon and flipped backwards to the door of the ops room. He snatched a fallen side from the ground and whirled, but Sanguine was already gone. The Black Cleaver was outmatched. He turned his visored helmet towards Tanith, then broke into a sprint, and she readied herself. As the Cleaver sprinted down the corridor, Sanguine leaped out of one wall and into the other, crisscrossing his path, slashing at every chance he got. The Cleaver flipped or jumped or whirled away from every cut. The closer he got to Tanith, the more desperate Sanguine seemed to become. Tanith tightened her grip on her sword and bared her teeth. The cleaver was five strides from her when Sanguine tackled him. The dagger fell, and the cleaver's elbow smacked into the Texan's jaw, and he spun, ending up facing Tanith, the black cleaver right behind him, scythe whirling in his hands. Tanith opened her mouth to shout a warning. The scythe swung for Sanguine's neck, but he was already turning, launching himself into a dive. Tanith had seen wells and floors crack before him, but never had she seen clothes and flesh. This was the moment where that changed. The black cleaver's armoured coat frayed, and the pale skin beneath split, almost too fast for it to register, and Sanguine dived through the cleaver. He hit the ground behind and rolled to his feet, dripping with black blood. The cleaver looked down at his ruined torso. Now Sanguine grinned, his cockiness returning to him. But he had a right to be cocky. Diving through the body would have killed just about any living creature. But of course, the Black Cleaver wasn't living. Sanguine was still grinning when the Black Cleaver twisted round, and the tip of the scythe blade whispered across his throat. For a moment, he stood there, frowning. Then a thin line of red opened up above his collar. He coughed, and the wound opened further and wider, and he stepped back, gagging, his hands up, trying to close the cut to keep the blood in. He dropped to his knees, the front of his shirt turning red, his tie becoming sodden. Blood splashed onto the floor, soaking into his trousers. He toppled over sideways, dislodging his sunglasses. He lay there, mouth open, gasping for breath that wouldn't come. Choking on blood, he couldn't spit. And then he died. Something wrenched deep within Tanith's chest. The Black Cleaver turned to her. He attacked, and she blocked. Blades clashed. He was fast, and so was she. Something burned inside her. Sanguine was dead. Did she care? Some part of her did. The burning gave her strength. Her wounds still bled, and her head still spun. But she had found her center now, and she sank into it and let her body do what it wanted to do. No longer was fear clouding her judgment. No longer were frightened thoughts obstructing her flow. She was an extension of her weapon, and her weapon was an extension of her. She thrust her sword through the cleaver's ruined coat, then retracted it and spun away before the scythe reached her. She found an odd, detached satisfaction in noticing the black blood she had drawn. But she could stab him in the chest all day, and it wouldn't make the slightest bit of difference. He was a zombie. The only way to stop him was to take his head, but there was no way she was going to be able to do that while he wore that uniform. She was reminded of something she'd once told Valkyrie years ago, 
and she smiled thinly as they broke off. The black cleaver watched her get her breath back, the way a lion would watch an injured gazelle. I suppose it's fitting, she said, that it comes down to you and me after all this time. Sometimes I feel like I should have died that day we fought in the Dublin Sanctuary. I think that blade of yours was meant to kill me six years ago. Now, maybe fate was looking the other way, or maybe it just changed its mind. But I survived. I always survive, and I always will. Then she turned, and she ran. The black cleaver stayed where he was for a moment, probably expecting some cunning new attack. When he realized she wasn't turning round, he gave chase. But instead of leading him towards people, towards sorcerers and cleavers, she led him to the quieter parts of the sanctuary. He caught up to her inside the cleaver barracks. Blades clashed once more. She backed up through the doorway into the training area. Whether or not the black cleaver guessed her plan, she had no way of knowing. Similarly unknown to her was whether or not her plan even had the slightest chance of working. She was about to pit the black cleaver's training against his new master's orders. Tanith edged her way into the combat circle, defending all the while. Her arms were tired, her muscles screamed, her sword got heavier with each parry. She broke off, skipped back a few steps, giving herself room, and the black cleaver looked down, noticing where they now stood. He looked at her, and she took one hand from the sword and started to pull off her coat. It was just like she'd told Valkyrie, and like Darkus had repeated to her. When someone steps into the circle, the challenge has to be met. No armor, no clothes. That's the rule. Yet the black cleaver stayed where he was. When the coat was off, she dropped it outside the circle. Then she knelt on one knee, slowly put the sword on the ground beside her, and started on her boots. When they were off, she stood, looked at the black cleaver, and said, Come and have a go, if you think you're hard enough. The black cleaver watched her for a moment, then laid down his scythe and opened his coat. 90. Valkyrie heard them. She crossed a ruined street, then another. Saw them coming. They looked tired, frantic, scared and tired. Her mum held out her arms, and her dad passed Alice to her. They were taking turns carrying her. Valkyrie stepped back, out of sight. Her insides were cold. Her thoughts were jagged and awkward and they fumbled around the options in her head, unable to come up with anything new, with anything better. She was locked on a course, and for once she couldn't think her way out of it. She heard her parents call her given name. She looked at her hands, her left hand wrapped in dirty bandages, her right wearing that gauntlet. She frowned and peered down at herself, her mind suddenly swimming with a tremendous sense of déjà vu. I've seen this, she muttered. I was watching from there. Her eyes fixed on the space beside her. It was empty, save for some swirling dust. But she knew it wasn't. In Cassandra Farris's basement, she was standing there watching this happen with Skullduggery at her side. Hi, she said, because she could think of nothing else to say to her younger self. She remembered hearing the words she was to speak next, and the overpowering sense of guilt that came with them. This is where it happens. But then you know that, right? At least you think you do. You think this is where I let them die. Her dad called her name. They were getting closer. She remembered what was set to come next. Darkus waving her hand and her family being consumed by black flames. She shook her head at the image. I don't want to see this, she said. Please, I don't want this to happen. Let me stop it. Please let me stop it. From her pocket, Valkyrie took the device she'd stolen from the medical wing and looked at it through tears. Please work, she whispered. Please let me save them. She stuffed it back in her pocket, wiped her eyes, and ran out to the middle of the street. Steph! her mum cried, grabbing her and hugging her. Her dad rushed in, embracing them both. Valkyrie fought to free herself. Mum, Dad, you have to get out of here. No, without you, her dad said. We heard the explosion and we thought, we thought you might have been in the middle of it. I was on the other side of the city, Valkyrie lied. 
You have to go, okay? It's too dangerous. Her mum grabbed Valkyrie's left arm. What happened to your hand? Is it broken? Oh my God, Steph, you're covered in cuts. I'm fine, Valkyrie said, pulling her arm away. We found your friend, said her dad. The poor girl. Valkyrie looked at him. Melancholia? She was lying on the street. She... Steph, she's dead. I'm sorry. I know. She... She didn't deserve that. Come back to us, said her mum. Please, let's just forget about all this and leave. Stephanie, this is insane. You're going to get yourself killed. Please, honey, please come back with us. I can't, mum. You know I can't. I don't know that. You have no reason to stay. I have the only reason to stay. Darkus is part of me. Steph, please, I'm begging you. Mum, listen to me. I might be the only person who can stop her. I have to do it. Nothing you say will make me change my mind. I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this for Alice. And I'm doing this for everyone. Everyone, Mum. If I don't, they all die. Her mother's face crumpled. But we can't stay with you. We have to protect Alice. I know, Valkyrie said softly. That's what I'm counting on you to do. Bile rose in her throat as she held out her hands. Let me have her. Just for a minute. I have a charm I can put on her. Like a magic spell? To keep her safe? Valkyrie nodded, not trusting her voice. Her mother passed Alice over. She felt incredibly heavy in her blanket. I have to do this alone, Valkyrie mumbled. If you're nearby, it won't work. Her dad wrapped his arm round her mum. We'll wait here. Don't be long. Valkyrie turned, hurried away as fast as she could so they wouldn't see her face. She turned a corner, found a building still standing, and went inside. The living room table had a bowl of fruit on it. She swept it onto the ground and put Alice lying in its place. She stared at her little sister. I'm so sorry, she said. I'm so sorry, sweetie. Tears sprang and she sagged against the table. Great racking sobs sent new spirals of pain through her. She barely noticed. Please forgive me. I love you so much, Alice. I love you so much, sweetheart. Her face was wet with tears. Her nose ran and spittle flew with every word. Her crying became a roar. She curled her right fist, slammed it against her own head. The edges of the gauntlet drew blood. But it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough pain. It wasn't enough suffering. It wasn't enough punishment. She put her injured left hand flat on the table and slammed her right fist down onto it. She screamed, fell back curled up on the floor and screamed until her screams became long, anguished wails. A part of her was aware of how pathetic she sounded. This part of her was glad she sounded pathetic. She deserved to sound pathetic. For what she was about to do, she deserved everything bad that was coming to her. It was only Alice's crying that brought her back. She got up, her whole body trembling. I'm sorry, honey. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to scare you. Please don't cry. She didn't mean to scare you. But hold on, because she's about to do something much worse. Shut up, said Valkyrie. Arguing with yourself, eh? First sign of madness, that. Shut up, I said. She leaned over Alice, soothing her cries. Thought this whole thing was in the past, did you? This little voice in your head. You thought just because Darkus was gone you were alone in here? Or maybe you thought she left and took all your badness with her? Seriously? That's what you thought? If she did take all your badness with her, then why the hell are you doing what you're about to do? Valkyrie stuffed some leaves in her mouth, chewing quickly, forcing herself to swallow. The pain in her hand lessened. She used her torn, dirty, bloody T-shirt to wipe her eyes and nose. Filthy, dirty, filthy, dirty, filthy, dirty, filthy. She took the sunburst from her pocket, laid it carefully on the table. Then she took the scepter from the bag and put it beside it. Tell her you love her. Go on, tell her. I love you, Valkyrie said. Hypocrite. I love you, Alice. I have never loved anyone as much as I love you. What I'm... What I'm about to do, it... It kills me. 
Yeah, not as much as it's going to kill her. With her left forefinger, broken and crooked, she pressed down on the sigil on the back of the gauntlet. Gritting her teeth, she dragged her finger clockwise, and the sigil lit up. Then she held her right hand over Alice's little body. She realized she was speaking, repeating I'm so sorry so fast it almost became one long word. She had to do it. She could not think of anything else to do. Darkus needed to be stopped. Skullduggery's plan was too uncertain. The scepter was the only thing that was guaranteed to work. So do it. Kill her. Kill your sister. Alice babbled away in her own private baby language, her bout of crying completely forgotten. She blinked up at Valkyrie and smiled, showing dimples. The most beautiful child in the world. She reached for the gauntlet, and Valkyrie snatched her hand away instinctively. No touch, Valkyrie heard herself say. Somewhere in her mind, she heard mocking laughter. She lowered her hand again. I love you, she said, and pressed her finger to Alice's forehead. Ninety-one. There was a crack, and her heart lurched as her baby sister went limp. Valkyrie's mind turned to ice. She almost ripped the gauntlet off without deactivating it. She pressed her broken finger into the sigil until it stopped glowing, then dropped the gauntlet onto the table and grabbed the scepter. Her powers were acting up again. She saw the scepter anew. She saw the magic inside it suddenly churn as it recognized its new mistress. Then she dropped it, grabbed the sunburst star, and pressed it to Alice's chest. Please work, please work, please work, please. The star gave a little beep as a pulse went through Alice's body. And nothing happened. No! Valkyrie screamed. No! Please! She reset it, her hands shaking, the world moving much too fast and much too slow. Reset it, and the sigil started lighting up. Come on, come on. You've killed her. Come on, work, please. You've killed her. The star pulsed and those beautiful eyes snapped open, and Alice let out a wail. Valkyrie grabbed her, hugging her so, so tight. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, baby. Please forgive me, please. Alice just cried and cried, scared and hurt, and Valkyrie cried with her, relieved but distraught. She'd killed her sister. No matter what else she did with her life from this moment on, she could never escape the fact that she had knowingly and voluntarily killed her own sister, and she didn't even have Darkus to blame it on. 92. Fighting naked was an extremely liberating experience. Tanith dodged back, deep into the combat circle, her bare feet sure on the ground, and the black cleaver came at her again. She blocked his slash and kicked at his leg for the fourth time. He lurched left, kept her at bay with his scythe. She glanced down, saw his swollen knee repair itself. It was still an uneven battle, but it was no longer so weighted against her. One good swipe was all Tanith needed to separate his head from his body, and with this renewed optimism, fresh strength poured into her arms. She pressed the attack. Now that she could see his face, she was no longer in any danger of being gripped by the same kind of fear that had turned her into a clumsy, awkward fighter. His face was unremarkable. His head was shaved, as all cleavers were. His eyes were dull. His skin was pale. His head, like his body, was an intricate jigsaw of scarring. Tanith had heard that Dr. Nye had put him back together, piece by tiny piece, and it hadn't been overly concerned about the aesthetic quality of what it was doing. Tanith's sword drew a line of black blood across the cleaver's chest, adding a new scar to his collection. She hoped he liked it. She batted his blade to one side and slashed again, caught his leg, then went up high, angling for his neck. At the last moment, he snapped his head away and she found herself overextended. He whirled, the snaith taking her feet from under her. Tanith hit the ground, tried to roll to absorb the impact, but she wasn't quick enough. He stabbed downwards and she turned over, tried to get up, got a knee in the face. 
She landed on her ass, stunned, the sword almost slipping from her hand. The black cleaver brought the scythe down, and she tumbled backwards and immediately cartwheeled to her left. But she was still dizzy, and she wobbled. He could have ended the fight there and then, could have got behind her and killed her before she had a chance to get her bearings. But he kicked out, and instead of getting a blade in the back, she got a foot in the ribs. Breath heaved from her, and something sharp and nasty dug into her side. But at least she wasn't dead. Not like sanguine. Billy Ray's face swam into her mind. What the hell? She blocked the scythe and tried to reply, but her strength was leaving her again. The cleaver was relentless, and he drove her back. He broke through her defense, cut her. It was a shallow wound across her arm, and she barely felt it, but it was there. And blood called to blood, and one wound led to another, and within moments her right leg was bleeding. She limped sideways, holding her sword in one hand. The black cleaver moved parallel with her, then came forward. At first, Tanith didn't think anything of it. She was getting too tired to think at all. But then she noticed that he had come up against the edge of the combat circle. That's why he hadn't gone for the killing blow. The first rule of the combat circle was no clothes, no armor. The second rule was that nobody leaves until the victor stands over the vanquished. The Black Cleaver's training had allowed her the chance to even the playing field. Now it seemed like it would allow her the chance to win, providing she was willing to cheat. Which, of course, she was. She got both hands back on the sword, and met his attack with a parry and a thrust, and she moved right, as quick as her injured legs would let her. She started to follow the curve of the circle, and he anticipated the move and went to close off her retreat. And then she cheated. She stepped sideways, out of the circle, went low and spun, her sword slicing through the cleaver's knee. He fell awkwardly, and she slashed upwards, taking the fingers from his right hand. She didn't stop there, though. She took his left hand off at the wrist, noting the black blood that leaked from the stump as his scythe fell. He rolled backwards, giving himself space. She was fairly sure he wasn't going to be able to kick her to death but she didn't intend to put that theory to the test. She closed in, cutting off his avenues of escape, and he backed up, his bare feet on the edge of the circle. She smiled at him. I like your shoes. He looked at her strangely. Then he launched himself at her, and she swung. She was aiming for his neck, but her foot slipped in all that blood, and so her blade carved his skull in two instead. His body fell to the ground, suddenly graceless. She took off the rest of his head, and then went to gather up her clothes. If the world was about to end, she might as well be dressed for the occasion. 93. Alice finally stopped crying, and Valkyrie carried her back to her parents. But as she neared, there was a deep, low rumble, and the building beside them weakened by the explosion, started to lean sideways. Valkyrie yelled out a warning that was swallowed by the noise, but saw her dad grab her mum's hand and break into a sprint as the building fell around them. Clouds of dust rolled up the street, and Valkyrie ducked into a doorway, covering Alice's head with her blanket. The dust followed them, and Valkyrie kept moving, running through two connecting rooms and out through a ruined wall into the next street over. She bent double, coughing, and made sure Alice was okay before straightening up. Stephanie! She heard her dad shout from somewhere nearby. We're here, Steph! She climbed another pile of debris, saw her folks dusting themselves off. She went to wave to shout back, when Darkus landed behind them. Valkyrie ducked down. This was it. This was the moment in the vision. She placed Alice between two pieces of rubble and took the bag off her back an empty bag with a jagged hole in the bottom. Her eyes widened. She stumbled, retracing her steps. The scepter had fallen out when she was running. She would have noticed otherwise. And there it was, lying on the floor in the building she'd just come through. She ran to it and grabbed it, sprinted back, passed Alice, and got to the top of the pile of rubble just as dark as waved her hand, and Valkyrie's parents exploded into nothing. No! she screamed. 
Darkus looked at her, the surprise on her face quickly replaced by a smile, and the smile quickly replaced by a frown when she saw the scepter being raised as Valkyrie ran at her. Black lightning flashed, turning the wall behind Darkus to dust. Darkus darted sideways, but Valkyrie fired again, sending her reeling. Everywhere she moved, every direction, Valkyrie cut her off with a streak of lightning until Darkus was scrambling backwards and Valkyrie was standing over her, breathing hard, the black crystal pointed right into her face. The scepter trembled. Inconsolable, unknowable rage scraped its fingers through Valkyrie's mind. Bring them back, she said. Darkus looked up at her, licking her lips to wet them. Valkyrie recognized the mannerism. She did that sometimes, when she was nervous. Even Darkus was scared of the scepter. Bring them back! They're energy, said Darkus. Don't think of them as dead. Think of them. I will kill you, Valkyrie told her. If you do not bring them back to me right now, I know you can do it. Darkus shook her head. Before, maybe, when I was whole, when we were together. But I'm not as strong as I was. If you join with me, if you let me absorb your energy, I'll be able— I will kill you, Valkyrie said dully. Bring them back. You have three seconds. Valkyrie, come on. Three. I'm not strong enough any more. Two. Please, I'll bring them back when I have more. One. Okay, Darkus said. Okay, I'll do it. Valkyrie didn't lower the scepter. Darkus raised her hand, very slowly to the space where Valkyrie's mum and dad had been standing. She narrowed her eyes, bit her lip, and then with a soft whoomp, Valkyrie's parents were standing there, blinking. What the hell just happened? her dad said. Valkyrie looked round, made sure they were all in one piece, and a vice gripped round her throat and the scepter was ripped from her grasp. You stupid girl, Darkus said, lifting her off her feet. She kicked uselessly as her parents ran to help. You had a chance to kill me. You had the only chance to kill me, and you wasted it. With the flick of the wrist, Darkus threw Valkyrie into her parents. They went down in a heap. Darkus examined the scepter. This was your one remaining weapon. I am disappointed. I thought you were smarter than that. You take your chance when you can, Valkyrie. Haven't you learned anything from skullduggery? You have to be ruthless. You just have to be. Because what have you achieved here? You made me return your parents to you at the expense of controlling the situation. She cocked her hand back and hurled the scepter into the air. In an instant, it was a speck in the distance. Then it was gone. And I'm just going to kill them again, along with you and everyone else. So congratulations, Valkyrie. You've doomed the world. Valkyrie got up slowly, painfully, and her dad tried to pull her back down. No, not pull. He was tugging at her shirt. She glanced at him, saw he was looking behind Darkus. She followed his gaze, saw Fletcher standing in a doorway across the street. He was holding up his hand, five fingers splayed. He started counting down. Four fingers, three fingers. He vanished, and Valkyrie turned her attention back to Darkus, counting the countdown in her own head. Two. One. She lunged, energy erupting from her hand, blasting Darkus right in the face. Darkus screeched, staggered, managed to grab Valkyrie as she went, and she twisted, hurling Valkyrie off her feet. Before she hit the wall, the impact snapping her bones like they were dry twigs, Valkyrie glimpsed Fletcher again teleporting in right behind Darkus, and he wasn't alone. 94. They were all around Darkus before she knew it was happening. Fletcher's work. So that's why they'd been keeping him out of the fight until now. Sneaky. She saw hazy outlines, heard voices, felt hands on her. Valkyrie's blast, whatever it had been, had disorientated her for a moment, but just for a moment. Darkus healed her eyes first, so she could see what the hell was happening. She was on her knees. Four people formed a circle around her. Cassandra Pharos stood in front, with her eyes closed, one hand on Darkus's head. 
Finbar Rong and Geoffrey Scrutinous were on either side, a hand each on Cassandra's shoulders. They held hands with Philomena Random, standing behind Darkus and closing off the circle. Darkus didn't know what the hell these crazy old hippies were trying to do. Probably kill her with love or something. As the rest of her face healed, she reached up, wrapping her fingers round Cassandra's wrist. That hand on her head was annoying her. She crushed the wrist as she stood, and Cassandra's eyes popped open in astonishment, like she hadn't expected something so pedestrian as pain to interrupt her meditations. Darkus's own eyes lit up, and she let Cassandra have it full blast. The old woman's head blew apart. Geoffrey tried to run, but Darkus grabbed him, twisted his head round, let his lifeless body crumple. Finbar, fair play to him, at least tried to attack. In his last few moments, he realized that a pacifist's life was not for him, and he launched himself at Darkus with a war cry. She killed him easily, of course, and wondered if Sharon would mourn the loss. Philomena shot her point blank in the head. Darkus gave her a smile, took the gun from her trembling hand, and used it to cave in her skull. Fletcher was kneeling by Valkyrie's side, next to Desmond and Melissa. They hadn't even noticed that the circle of love had spectacularly failed. Melissa was sobbing. Valkyrie wasn't moving. Fletcher, Darkus said. Teleporters were the most dangerous of sorcerers, she had decided. Fletcher's was not a power designed to hurt or kill, but all it would take was one sinister motivation, and no one could stand against him. She had figured that out a while ago, and she'd made a decision to kill Fletcher without warning the first chance she got. True, calling his name didn't exactly qualify as without warning, but he deserved to at least see her face as she killed him. He turned his head to her. In that moment, she examined his power, poked and prodded at it, saw how it worked. Then she flicked her fingers, and his heart burst inside his chest. He made a small sound and keeled over, and Desmond and Melissa both jumped to their feet. Mum, Darkus said. Dad, it's time for our tearful farewell. Desmond stood in front of his wife, protecting her. Darkus had expected no less. You're not our daughter, Desmond said. Tears ran down his face. You killed our daughter. We're all just... Darkus began, then laughed and shook her head. I was going to say we're all just energy. I was going to say there is no death. This, what I'm doing, in the grand scheme of things, it means nothing. Only, only if I really and truly didn't get some little bit of pleasure from doing this, then why take the physical approach? Why blast Cassandra's head off? Why get my hands dirty? Because you're sick, Melissa said, hatred ablaze in her eyes. I think you might be right, Darkus responded. I think I'm sick. I reckon I'm evil. I must be right. To have fun doing this? She laughed again. The wind carried her laugh who knows where. What a relief, she said, to admit that. Not just to you either, but to myself. To admit that I like doing this. Fighting, killing, destroying. It's just, it's just so satisfying, you know? I must be evil. That's the only explanation I can find. But then, but then I came from your daughter. So does that mean your daughter was evil? She's a hero, said Desmond. Was, Darkus corrected. Better get used to referring to her in the past tense. Or, hey, forget it. You don't have to get used to anything. You'll be dead soon too, right? But that's interesting, isn't it? All this time I thought I was doing nice for the universe, and actually, actually, no, I just wanted to tear it all down. Do you think we're all like that, maybe? People, I mean? Behind all their ideas about themselves and who they are, do you think they're all just bad? Hmm. Not in the mood for a philosophical debate, eh? Yeah, I get that. That's okay. I think, I think Valkyrie, though, because I knew her so well, much better than either of you ever did. I think Valkyrie would agree with me on this one. 
She had a dark heart, deep down, dark and twisted. I just thought you ought to know about your own daughter before you died. Darkus brought her hands together and then splayed them out to either side, and Desmond and Melissa Edgeley came apart in such an outrageous display of blood and innards that it actually made Darkus queasy. She laughed at the absurdity of her reaction and walked over to Valkyrie, careful not to step in the puddles of her parents. The body of Valkyrie Kane lay broken and battered at her feet, and the energy inside her was gone. Darkus could taste it in the air. It lingered faintly, but her essence had dissipated in the moments after her death. That energy was now lost, flowing as it had back into the stream of existence. She hadn't meant to kill her like that. She hadn't meant to throw her so hard. She thought that after everyone else was dead, it would just be her and Valkyrie, exchanging words at the end of the world. Then Valkyrie would finally surrender and darkness could become whole again. But life, being life, had a funny way of disappointing you. Darkus brushed her hair back trying to get rid of that awful feeling of Cassandra's hand on her scalp. She tucked a few strands behind her ear, looking up as she did so. At the end of the street, there was a black hat blowing along in the wind. It tumbled behind a corner out of sight, and Darkus allowed herself a sad smile. 95. Is it working? Tell me it's working. Ninety-six. She took what she had learned from Fletcher's magic and teleported to the corner. She watched the hat blow into the middle of the street and then settle like a slowly spinning coin. Skullduggery emerged from a side alley. He stood over the hat for a moment, then reached down, picked it up, and brushed it off. He returned it to his head, angling the brim. He'd seen the vision. He knew what was coming. Darkus walked up behind him. He turned to her slowly, dumping spent shells from his revolver. She watched him take bullets from his waistcoat pocket and slip them into the empty chambers, one by one, one to six, enjoying the ritual of it. My favorite little toy, said Darkus. Are you referring to my gun, or to me? Skullduggery was supposed to say, but of course he didn't. He stood there in silence, and she waited for him to speak. He finished loading the gun, and he clicked it shut, held it down by his leg. She's dead, Darkus told him, breaking the silence. I didn't mean to kill her so soon, but, well, he stayed quiet. Anything you want to know before you die? she asked. Any last questions? Ask me anything about Valkyrie and I'll answer as honestly as I'm able. Anything you've always wondered? Not a sound. She smiled. You're an impressive man, Skullduggery. There will never be another like you. And if you don't want to talk, I understand that. You want to get to it, I suppose. I'm... I'm going to miss you. Please know that. She took a breath and gave him a sad smile. I know you made a promise, she said, until the... He was so fast, she never saw him raise the gun. The first bullet hit her throat, the second burrowed through her cheek, and the third blew the back of her head open. They didn't worry her, of course. The entry wounds were already healing before the exit wounds had even formed. The fourth and fifth bullets caused her a little concern, however, smashing through her brain the way they did, and the sixth tore through her breastbone and punctured her heart. That one was probably symbolic. Six bullets, though. He'd got off six bullets. In the vision, he'd only fired three. She reached out to him with her magic, started plucking at the energy holding him together. His fingers went first, and the gun and the glove fell the finger bones rattling on the street, 
She kept pushing, skewering his magic, and she watched his arm fall, his sleeve flapping in the wind. His other arm now, and then she went low, to stop him from getting any closer. She sliced at the magic around his feet, and then his ankles fell apart, and he dropped to his knees, and his hips went, and he toppled backwards, and now he was just a skeleton in a suit that was quickly deflating around him. He tried to sit up, tried to raise his head, but she finished him off, and his bones clattered. The only magic remained in his skull, and she picked it from his spine and held it up, made sure he could see her, and then she kissed him with all the love she could muster. She kissed him goodbye, and when she let the skull fall, the last of who he was disappeared into the ether, and the skull broke, and the jawbone spun away. She stood there, looking down at him, suddenly aware that this was being watched by some past vision of Valkyrie and Skullduggery himself, and she turned to look into the space where they would be standing, and she forced herself to give them a smile. 97. Get ready, said Skullduggery, as... 98. Darkus lifted off the ground, rose high into the air, where the wind dried her tears. Roarhaven spread out below her like a wounded animal, waiting to be put down. She drifted to its weakly beating heart, touched her feet to the ground, and walked right through the front doors of the sanctuary. Cleavers came at her and she waved them out of existence. The sorcerers who tried to fight exploded into nothingness. Those who tried to run she killed with a little more brutality. She wasn't as strong as she once was, but the extra effort made it all the more rewarding. Tanith sprang at her from the shadows. Darkus allowed the sword to almost reach her neck, but teleported before it scratched her. Tanith's cry of surprise was amusing. Darkus punched through her from behind, her fist bursting from Tanith's chest. Tanith Lowe had time to look down at her own heart before she died. Darkus went from room to room, killing, black flames and blood. No one could stand against her. No one could reason with her. China Sorrows tried. China Sorrows died. When the sanctuary was clear of the living, when Cynic Dosh and Clarabelle were resting in peace, and when Erskine Ravel had screamed his last, Darkus reached her magic into the very foundations of the building and shook them. The walls cracked, and the floors crumbled, and the world was filled with a thousand roars, and the sanctuary fell. Roarhaven fell soon after. She left it in her wake, a flat and smoking ruin. By the time she reached Dublin, her heart was heavy. She carved up the streets and threw cars into buildings, and she thought about what she had done. Not even the screams and the sirens could pierce her grey mood. At first, she wanted to take the cities of the world one at a time, so she took London and New York and Moscow and Paris and Berlin and Beijing. She turned missiles to flowers and bullets to rain. She breathed in nerve gas and it cleared her sinuses. She survived the first three nuclear strikes aimed at her by enclosing herself in a little bubble. By the fourth one, she'd figured out how to survive it without the bubble. She may not have been as strong as she once was, but she was still becoming indestructible. And while she may have had the odd headache now and then, she was still a god. But Beijing annoyed her. The mortals were still fighting her, and the sorcerers were helping them. All over the world, they refused to accept the fact that their silly little meaningless lives were over. It was insulting, if she were to be honest. They thought they still had a... 99. Chance with this, and one only. Skullduggery grabbed Fletcher, pulled him to his feet, and pointed at Valkyrie and her parents. Get Alice, and get them the hell out of... 100. Here she was. Destruction incarnate, and these mortals dared to hope that somehow, maybe with the help of all these sorcerers, they could find a way to beat her. It was aggravating. She went away for a week, thought about her next move, 
and decided to just kill them all, absorb as much of their energy as she could, and move on. She had itchy feet. She wanted to explore the universe, to seek out new life and new civilizations, then to kill them too. So she killed the world, burned it to a husk, and flew off into space. She set foot on the moon. She teleported to Mars. The gases of Neptune made her eyes water. By the time she breached the galaxy, she didn't need her body to travel any more. Her body became her mind, and she traveled at the speed of thought. And upon discovering life, her physical form would take shape once again. She appeared as a vast alien god to these otherworldly species, and she was not a nice god. There were challenges that she had to overcome, weapons she was unfamiliar with, life cycles she was ignorant of, a constant pressure on her head like a hand pressing down on her. But her biggest challenge was boredom. When she had had her fill of this universe, she returned to what remained of Earth. She began to long for something new, something different. Using everything she had learned from all those thousands of remnants she had absorbed, she solved the mechanics of reality, and lifted off the ground and... 101. Rose high into the air. Fletcher watched, sure that she would snap out of it, fix her gaze on him, but she didn't. She kept rising, a peculiar look on her face. She reached out with her hands and pulled... 102. The empty space apart. Darkus felt her fingers buzz. This was a new way of doing it, a new way of creating a portal, a doorway to a world with a... 103. Red sky. There was a red sky. And Fletcher's heart thundered in his chest when he heard that music, that awful, sickening... 104. Morning call of the faceless ones, beautiful in its way, and Darkus smiled at last. She hadn't smiled since she'd killed Skullduggery Pleasant all those years ago. She stepped through the portal, leaving the lifeless universe of her home and her portal closed behind her. 105. Fletcher blinked. It worked? Cassandra sagged, and Skullduggery caught her. Finbar collapsed, and Fletcher only noticed when he heard the thump beside him. Oh, he said. Sorry. Finbar mumbled something and waved his hand weakly. Fletcher looked up again, at where the portal had just been, at where Darkus had vanished. We beat her? We didn't beat her, Skullduggery said. We fooled her. There's a difference. Everyone link up. Geoffrey and Philomena held out their hands. They were pale, weak. What they had just done had taken a lot out of them. Fletcher made sure everyone was touching, then teleported back to the medical wing. Valkyrie was the first to see them. Of course she was. And she sat up in bed and tried to move her parents and cynic doche out of the way, but the doctor was having none of it. You do not move, she said sternly. Fletcher and Skullduggery walked over. Valkyrie's neck was in a brace, and her face was swollen and cut. Her left hand sported new bandages, which matched the bandages on her elbows. She's gone, Skullduggery said. Valkyrie tried to nod and winced. I know, she said. I felt her somehow. She seemed happy. She's got a whole new universe to conquer. I'm sure she's thrilled. Fletcher spotted Tanith across the room, sitting on the edge of a bed with her head down. Is Tanith okay? Valkyrie hesitated. She's fine, but Billy Ray Sanguine is dead. I... I told her about it. You know, the two of them. When she had the remnant, I couldn't not tell her. Not after he gave his life to save her. I figured she ought to know the whole story. How did she take it? Valkyrie shook her head. I'm still not sure. Cynic Doche sat her up lifted her shirt, and applied clear gel to her badly bruised torso. We've got an assortment of broken ribs here that we'll have to mend later today, the doctor said. Along with a broken arm, 
the concussion, the fractured skull, and the internal injuries. For now, though, we'll wrap you up and move you on. We need the space, and astonishingly, we are not critical. Cynic Doche motioned to an assistant to finish the job, and hurried to a moaning patient elsewhere. Is that it? Desmond asked. Darkus is gone? It's over? Skullduggery nodded. Cassandra and Finbar and the others gave her the reality she wanted and then allowed her to leave it. As far as she knows, we're all dead. Our universe is dead. There's nothing for her to come back to. No more danger? Melissa asked. Not from Darkus. Melissa sobbed, turning to Valkyrie and grabbed her good hand. Sweetheart. Mum. Sweetheart, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud. No parent has ever been as proud of their daughter. Valkyrie managed a strange smile that looked odd to Fletcher somehow. The assistant finished up, and Skullduggery helped Valkyrie stand. You're coming home with us? her mum asked. I will, Valkyrie said. When I'm cleared here. Steph, please, mum, Fletcher will take you three home now, and I'll be there as soon as Dr. Sinek Josh says I can. I still have things to do here, and I want to check in a few people. I won't be getting hurt any more today, though. I promise. Melissa hesitated, then nodded, and looked up at Skullduggery. I owe you an apology. No, he said. You don't. I said some pretty horrible things. Entirely justified. Oh, I know they were, Melissa said. But I'm beginning to think that your good points outweigh your bad. Steph says it's because of you that she's alive today. That may be so, but I'm only here today because of her. Melissa looked back at Valkyrie. Can I hug you? Would it hurt too much? You can hug me a little, Valkyrie said, an actual smile poking through. Both her parents gave her the lightest of hugs, but they both spent ages doing it. When her father was done, he stepped back. Gordon would be so proud of you, he said. I know I am. You helped save the world today, sweetie. The kid I raised helped save the world. In a way, in a way, I suppose that means I saved the world. If anyone's still listening, Mrs. said, I would like to apologize for my husband. I'm going to get a T-shirt printed up. Maybe a mug? Melissa turned to Fletcher. When you take us home, are we going to throw up again? He couldn't lie. Probably, he said. She sighed. Desmond poked his finger at Alice. And don't think I'm forgetting about you, young lady. Your big sister saved the world today. What the hell have you done? Alice giggled, and Fletcher took them home. 106. Valkyrie and Skullduggery left the medical wing. The sanctuary was in chaos. People ran, shouted at each other. Emergency crews took over. Valkyrie and Skullduggery ignored it all. Valkyrie and Skullduggery had had enough. Are you sure you're okay? he asked, when they entered the peace and quiet of the old sanctuary. I'm fine, she said. You're bleeding internally. A little internal bleeding never hurt anyone. That's not strictly true, though. Do you want me to carry you, or... She gave him a look. Am I slowing you down? Is that what it is? Would you rather be walking faster? To be honest, yes. Well, tough. They walked along in silence for a bit. Congratulations on saving the world, Skullduggery said. Or helping to save it anyway. Being in the general vicinity. Cassandra and Finbar and the others actually saved it. But it was my plan, and you enabled it to happen, so I think we're all winners here, really. Yeah, yes. You don't sound overly delighted. Would you be? I didn't save the world, Skullduggery. I helped cancel out the threat I posed to it. Those people, the ones who attacked me, they had a right. I'm to blame for all this. You know it's not as simple as that. Darkus was part of me. That little fact is inescapable. Valkyrie paused. I noticed you haven't asked me yet how I could suddenly use a scepter. No, I haven't. And I won't. We're called on to do things, 
again and again that a person should never be asked to do. But we find a way, Valkyrie, and your family is safe and Darkus is gone. It looks like we're going to have a happy ending on this one, she grunted. Since when do we ever get a happy ending? It's rare, he said, but it's possible. They started down the steps. You think she stands a chance against the faceless ones? Valkyrie asked. I don't know. Part of the reality the sensitives constructed was to convince her that she'd accumulated more power than she had. But she opened that portal. It probably took everything she had to do it. But that part was no illusion. And if she could do that, she might stand a chance against a faceless one. Maybe even two. But not an entire race of them. Skullduggery shook his head. And she's gone, said Valkyrie. My bad mood is gone. Odd. I don't feel any cheerier. I thought... Yes. They got to the bottom of the steps, walked the cold corridor to the next set. I thought Darkus was my bad side, she said. But I did something so... so terrible. Skullduggery looked at her. Long life can be a curse. The longer you live the greater the chance that you're going to do things you regret. But long life is also a blessing, because you have a lot of time in which to set things right. And what if there is no setting it right? His voice was soft. Punishment is not the answer. Punishment is easy. It's lazy. Redemption is hard. Redemption makes you work. You've been working for redemption for a while now. Are you really closer to it? Are you ready to pick up your family crest again? He tilted his head to her. Do you remember? That you wouldn't carry the crest until you reckoned you were worthy of it? Yes, I remember. So are you ready to carry it now? How do you know when your redemption is complete? I'm hoping you just... No. The scientific method. His jaws opened. He was about to say something, probably something like precisely, but he didn't. He stopped. China lay very still in the corridor ahead of them. Skullduggery sprinted to her. Valkyrie hobbled as fast as she was able, reaching them just as China's eyes fluttered open. I'm fine, she said, her voice a whisper. Darkus? It's over, Skullduggery said, her head in his hands. A slight smile. Not yet. Her blue eyes flickered behind them. Ravel. Trouble. She dipped into unconsciousness, and Skullduggery left her there and stood. Valkyrie followed him into the accelerator room. The accelerator itself was churning. The humming sound was coming from deep within its core, and it was getting louder. The engineer stood looking at them. Ravel was slumped on the ground, his hands shackled behind his back. He was conscious, but clearly dazed. What happened? Skullduggery said. Hirskin Ravel demanded that his power be boosted by the accelerator, the engineer responded. While I know that the title of Grand Mage now rested with China's sorrows, I had never been given the specific instruction to disregard any others from Mr. Ravel, Valkyrie glared. So you said yes? I am a robot, said the engineer. I obey instructions to the letter. There is no room for personal interpretation. And did it work? Skullduggery asked. Yes. But when Mr. Ravel stepped out, he was somewhat disorientated. Upon her arrival, Grand Mage Sorrows engaged him in what was a quite spectacular physical confrontation, during which she was able to secure these shackles upon his person. Valkyrie frowned at the accelerator. It's overloading. I'm afraid so, said the engineer. I warned Mr. Ravel that his usage would hasten the countdown towards its end. He chose to ignore me. So how long do we have? Twelve minutes, eleven seconds. Valkyrie paled. The circular platform within the accelerator, the dais, lit up. One soul, the engineer said, willingly given. The individual steps onto the dais, Death is instant. Their energy, what my creator call their soul, is then used to deactivate the accelerator. Well, okay, said Valkyrie. 
Okay, so there are loads of injured people upstairs, loads of dying people. I'm sure we can get one of them to volunteer. The engineer held up one metal finger. A clarification, it said. When the soul is used to deactivate the accelerator, it is used in its entirety. If there is a heaven or an afterlife, it will not journey onwards. Its energy will not rejoin the great stream, if such a thing exists. The soul will be used up here and now, never to return. But, Valkyrie said, but wait, Erskine, you did this, so this is your chance to— Ravel looked up at them and shook his head. I've sacrificed enough, he said. You're on your own. She looked at Skullduggery. He tilted his head towards her. Valkyrie bolted for the dais, but he caught her, yanked her back, and she cried out and pushed against him, and he hit her, hard in the side, and she folded, gasping. Sorry, he said. Tears in her eyes, and not just tears of pain. Don't you dare, she gasped. I have, unfortunately, little choice in the matter. Skullduggery looked at the engineer. A soul, willingly given, he said. That's it. That's your entire brief. Correct, said the engineer. No loopholes. No other way around it. None. A soul willingly given. That's what your creator programmed into you. Those words and no others. No stipulations. No qualifications. No exceptions. None. Skullduggery looked down at Valkyrie. You heard the robot. She ignored the pain, forced herself to stand. Please don't do this. Let me go instead. Nonsense. He went to turn away, but she grabbed his arm. No, listen to me. We can think of something else. We can figure it out. We don't have time. Valkyrie put herself in front of him, pressed both hands against his chest, felt his ribs. For God's sake, she said. Please don't do this. Skullduggery, please. I can't lose you. He tilted his head, and, with a gloved finger, he brushed a tear from his cheek. You'll never lose me, Valkyrie. But I need you with me, she said. I've done awful things. I... Skullduggery, I killed Alice. Alice is alive. But I still killed her. It doesn't matter what I did after that moment. I killed my own baby sister. What kind of person would do that? A person with no other choice. I need you here. Please. I've done terrible things. I hate... I hate myself. I have to go away. But I need someone to come back to. You can't leave me alone. Valkyrie. Please don't go. Skullduggery, I'm begging you. You're really making a fuss over nothing. She hit him. Punched him right across the jaw, pain flashing through her fist, through her entire body. You are not nothing, you bloody idiot. You changed my life. You made my life better. You made me better. What do you think I'm going to do when you're gone, hmm? You think I'm going to be happy? I swear to Christ. If you go, I go. Well, he said, now you're just being silly. You have nine minutes, fourteen seconds, said the engineer. Nine minutes, said Valkyrie. Nine. We can think of something in nine minutes. We can find a volunteer in nine minutes. Please. Skullduggery put his hands on her shoulders. Valkyrie, trust me on this one thing and step out of my way. I have to do this. She looked up at him. I don't want you to leave me. And I never will. You said we'd be together until the end. He nodded. Yes, I did. A face flowed up over his skull. An unremarkable face with unremarkable features. He leaned in and softly kissed her cheek. The face flowed away. He hugged her, then peeled her arms from around his neck, took off his hat, and put it on her head. He spent a moment angling it just right. There, he said. Looks good on you. She couldn't speak as he stepped round her. He walked up to the accelerator. The engineer watched him impassively. Ravel looked away. I love you, Valkyrie blurted out. 
Skullduggery didn't look back. 107. Danny. Danny! Danny opens his eyes. Someone is behind him, holding him, their arms round his legs, taking his weight. Stephanie? He mumbles. May as well call me Valkyrie, she says. Can you lift your hands off the hook? Danny makes the mistake of looking up. A river of stinging sweat flows into his eyes, blinding him. He grits his teeth, tries freeing himself. Can't move my arms, he says. She releases him, and his full body weight hangs from his wrists again. He swings a little, enough to see her hurrying to the wheel on the wall when he cracks one eye open. Stephanie or Valkyrie, dressed in black, sweating in the heat, but not looking overly concerned about it. They're waiting for you, he says. Christ, he's thirsty. His words feel thick and slow. This is a trap. Yep, she says. Bears all the hallmarks of one. She abandons the wheel, comes back over. What a place, eh? Bigger on the inside, like the TARDIS. Look away. She raises her hand. This is going to be bright. He closes his eyes, but not all the way, and sees white lightning crackle from her fingertips. The lightning hits the chain, and suddenly he's swinging wildly. He looks up. The chain is scorched. He can see a clear fracture in one of the links. Sorry, Valkyrie says, reaching out to steady him. Haven't done this in a while. Another blast should... A large shape bursts from the door, and Danny shouts a warning, but he's too late. Jeremiah swings a sledgehammer into Valkyrie's ribs. The impact lifts her sideways. Mr. Gant! Jeremiah screeches. She's here! She's here! Valkyrie tries to get up. She's wheezing. Jeremiah doesn't give her the chance. The hammer comes down right between her shoulder blades. Valkyrie flattens out. Mr. Gant! I have her! I have her, Mr. Gant! He goes quiet all of a sudden, and assumes the look of a man to whom an idea has just occurred. He leans the sledgehammer against the wall, takes hold of the collar of Valkyrie's jacket, and drags her from the room. Amazingly, Valkyrie is still half-conscious, but she's in no fit state to fight back. The last Danny sees of her are her boots. He starts swinging wildly, kicking out and twisting. The broken link bends a little. He talks, grunting with the effort. He stops when he hears footsteps. Moments later, Gant walks in with a smile on his face, a smile that dims when he realizes Danny is the only person here. Where are they? he asks. Danny swings from side to side, but doesn't answer. Gant fixes him with a stare. She's here. Your usefulness is at an end. Allow yourself a few moments more of life and tell me where they went. Jeremiah took her, says Danny. Through there. A troubling frown crosses Gant's face, and he strides from the hut. Danny kicks his legs up in front, then swoops them behind. He starts swinging forward and back. With every swing, he kicks higher. The chain creaks. Kick in front, swoop behind. Kick and swoop, higher and higher. He looks up as he swings. The broken link widens its jaw. Kick and swoop. His shoulder is on fire. Kick and swoop. Kick and... The world tilts, suddenly and without warning. The broken link gives way, and he's crashing to the floor. He rolls over, gets to his knees, but he can't wait for his burning muscles to soothe. Up he gets, feeling returning to his arms. His hands are still cuffed, but his fingers are tingling. He flexes them until he's sure he can grip and then he picks up the sledgehammer. He leaves the hut, limping only slightly, and steps onto a bridge suspended by chains. It sways under his weight, almost tips him into the sea of fire. He crosses, doing his best not to look down. He can still hear the screaming. Danny gets to the platform ahead and takes the metal steps down. He pauses to wipe the sweat from his eyes, then continues on to where the steps flatten and meet a grill floor. More stairways and bridges lead off it. He leans over the railing, glimpses Gant on the level below him. It takes a moment to figure out the best way down, but when he has it, he hurries after him. 
Hefting the hammer, he approaches a hut suspended entirely by chains. He can hear voices inside. The audacity, Ganta sang. The sheer audacity of you. I'd almost be impressed if I wasn't so disappointed. Danny peers in. It's a small room with a heavy, blood-stained work table against the far wall. Valkyrie is on the ground, not moving. Gant is standing over her, his hands on his hips. Jeremiah stands with his back to the door, his shoulders slumped. No, Jeremiah is saying. I was just getting her ready for you. I was just... I tell you what you were just doing, Gant snaps. You were going to kill her. You were going to kill her and claim the credit all for yourself. Mr. Gant, no, I would never do. And yet here you are, Jeremiah. Here you are in your fettered little cubby hole with your grubby little hands round her throat. Do you think this is how she would want to die? Do you think this is how anyone would want to die? No, says Jeremiah meekly. I thought you were better than this. I thought you respected me more. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Gant. I was weak. I saw her. I put her down. I was going to give her over to you. I was, but, but Mr. Gant, I haven't killed anyone like this in a, a long time. I let you kill ordinary people. Isn't that enough for you? There's a pause as Jeremiah hesitates. Danny wipes his hands on his trousers and takes a grip on the sledgehammer. It isn't as wide as he'd like, because of the cuffs, but it's a firm grip nonetheless. What? Gant says, irritated. Out with it, for heaven's sake. You said you'd let me kill the next one, Jeremiah says quietly. You're not ready, Jeremiah. You always say that. He's almost whining now. When will I be ready? Gant adopts the tone of a disappointed parent. I don't know. Up until a few moments ago, I would have said soon. Very, very soon. Maybe even today. I was so close to letting you do this one. But after this, after this, Jeremiah, I just don't know any more. Mr. Kent, said Jeremiah. And he's crying. Mr. Kent, I'm sorry. Danny takes another peek. Gant is looking down at Valkyrie. I need to know I can trust you, Jeremiah. You can, says Jeremiah. I promise you can. I don't know. I don't think so. Gant turns away a little more, and Danny sees his chance. He runs in, swinging. Jeremiah hears him and ducks under the sledgehammer, but all that does is clear a path right to Gant's face. And it's like he swung the hammer into a metal pillar. The shock of the impact wrenches the sledgehammer from Danny's hands, and he cries out and staggers back. The hammer clatters to the floor, and Gant shoots Danny a smile. Jeremiah roars, charges, takes Danny off his feet. They go down. The big man's weight on him. Danny barely has any fight left. Jeremiah brings out a knife from somewhere. Danny grabs Jeremiah's wrists with both hands, but not fast enough to stop his arm from being nicked. They struggle with the blade. Gant doesn't say anything. Doesn't even move. They roll across the floor, Danny finding reserves of strength he never knew he had. Gant doesn't follow the fight. He's just standing there, smiling and not moving. No, wait, he is moving, but very, very slowly. As he struggles with Jeremiah, Danny remembers the people in the gas station, the dead bodies stacked up in the back room. How had Jeremiah found the time to do all that, unless... Gant said this house was magic. Danny doesn't know about magic, but this place definitely defies reason. Valkyrie shot that weird light from her hands, and Gant himself hadn't even blinked just now when the sledgehammer hit him. Okay, so if the house really is magic, and Gant and Valkyrie are magic, then maybe Jeremiah is too. And by the looks of things, his magic is the ability to draw out his kills while the world slows down around him. The perfect power for a serial killer. Danny refocuses on the knife. Jeremiah's strength is leaving him with every breath he puffs out. He's relying on his weight now to keep the knife in position, saving the last of his energy for one final push. Sweat rolls off Jeremiah's forehead and drops onto Danny's face, onto his gritted teeth. Danny heaves, 
and they roll. And for a moment, Danny is on top. But then Jeremiah flips them over again. Danny's head knocks against Valkyrie's leg. The tip of the knife scrapes his chest. Danny lets the blade dig in. Sensing that his moment has arrived, Jeremiah grunts and snarls and drives downwards, but Danny surprises him by holding on, and they strain and struggle and strain again, and Jeremiah is the first to weaken. Danny shoves him off, rolls on top, and Jeremiah gasps and cries like he doesn't want to play any more. Danny knocks the knife from his hand, and just like that, normal time resumes around them. Gant turns, his smile quickly becoming a scowl as Danny finds himself being lifted off the floor. Valkyrie has him. Run, she says. He runs. She's right behind him. They run across a swaying bridge of chains and mesh. Twice Danny's foot slips through, dangles above the fire, and twice Valkyrie has to haul him up again. They reach a spiral staircase on the other side and head up. I can't, Danny gasps. You have to, Valkyrie says. He trips and he falls, and he bangs his knees and scalds his hands on the hot metal. But he keeps going. He doesn't know how, but he keeps going. By the time they reach the top, his legs are jelly. Valkyrie wraps her arm round his waist, and she practically carries him onwards. Some distant part of his mind takes a moment to appreciate her strength. I'm all turned around, she says. Any idea how we get out of here? He looks around, then points at a distant platform. There, I think. She scans the area finding the quickest path through all the walkways and bridges. Got it, she says, and they're off again. Danny lets himself be led. He's too tired to do anything but follow blindly. Valkyrie is the expert here. She's the warrior. He's just some guy. They cross another chain bridge, almost get to the platform when Gant clambers up a ladder on the other side. Valkyrie holds out her hand. She grits her teeth, focusing, and lightning bursts forth. It hits Gant square in the chest, burns right through his shirt, but he never stops smiling. I'm afraid you can't beat me, he calls to them as he nears. But if you surrender now, I promise to make your death relatively painless. Back, Valkyrie whispers. Danny retraces his steps, the chain bridge swaying. He gets to the last platform and looks back. Valkyrie's hands are glowing white, but instead of firing that lightning at Gant, she grips the chains on the bridge. There's a snap as they break, and a lurch, and the bridge sags, and Valkyrie turns and leaps as it collapses. Danny catches her. They look back at the other platform, at Gant, who shakes his head in an amused fashion. Calmly, he takes another set of stairs. This used to be easy, Valkyrie mutters. You shoot someone, they go down, mostly. This guy, this guy can't be hurt. No says Danny. He can. I think. I heard it. They were going after this woman. There was a fight. I heard Gant, you know, in pain. Not much pain, but, but definitely hurt. Valkyrie wipes her sleeve across her forehead. Her jacket looks crisp and dry, so unlike Danny's own sweat-soaked shirt. Well, he's not feeling any pain in here. He says he's the master of his domain. Valkyrie looks at him. Maybe that's it. In this house, we can't beat him. So what do we do? We take it outside. She has another look at the crisscrossing walkways and chooses a new route. Danny runs by himself to the next set of stairs, but she has to help him climb them. When they reach the top, they find themselves on the same level as the door out of here. Valkyrie leads the way across a chain bridge. Danny comes after her, slow but steady, gripping the chains and making sure his feet don't slip off the edge. This is the longest of the chain bridges, and it sways dramatically as they traverse it. Huh, Valkyrie says. She has stopped walking, and she's scanning the area. Can't see him. Danny stops behind her, grateful for the chance to catch his breath. Can you see him? Valkyrie asks. Danny grunts, shakes his head, not really bothering to look. All they have to do is get to the platform on the other side. Pass through the hut he'd been chained up in, and take the walkway to the door. They are almost there, almost out. Valkyrie curses and pushes him, and Danny cries out and falls, almost slipping from the bridge as a dark shape swoops overhead, crackling with glee. Cadaverous Gant.
swinging from a chain like Tarzan and coming this way. Valkyrie grabs Danny's hands, pulls him up. Gant passes again, his long fingers barely missing Danny's shirt. The swing takes him up high, and he leaps like a circus acrobat, snagging another chain and swings in at a different angle. This time, when he passes, he kicks at the railings and the bridge lurches and Valkyrie nearly falls. Danny lunges, his hands grabbing her jacket, steadying her. She fills the air with imaginative swear words, and Danny releases her. Then something snags his shirt collar, and he's plucked off his feet. Valkyrie spins, grabbing the chain of his handcuffs. The sudden stop is jarring, and above him, Gant grunts in surprise. Danny hangs in the air between them. Below him is nothing but fire. I can hold on forever, young lady, Gant calls down, laughing. Can you? Valkyrie's free hand glows. Lightning surges and bursts forth, rattling the chain Gant hangs from. He lets go, and Danny drops. Valkyrie braces herself, and Danny comes to a jarring stop once again, the pain in his shoulder sending bright flashes before his eyes. He hangs there, not even daring to scream. He sees Gant out of the corner of his eye, swinging gently above them. Danny doesn't know how Valkyrie is holding him, but she is, and incredibly, she starts to pull him up. As they sweat and strain, Gant watches. When it becomes clear that Danny's going to be able to clamber back onto the bridge, he sighs, looks around, and starts climbing the chain into the darkness above. Danny gets to his feet. Every part of him is trembling. Come on, Valkyrie says. He nods dumbly and follows. They get to the platform. Danny's legs give out. He tries to get up before Valkyrie notices, but she looks back. I'm fine, he says. We're almost there. I know. I'm fine. He gets up, gives her a smile to reassure her, and his eyes widen. Valkyrie turns as Jeremiah runs at her. He slashes at her with the knife. Once again, Danny is surprised by how fast he is. But Valkyrie doesn't try to duck or jump away. Instead, she meets him, moving right into him, wrapping her left arm round his knife arm and repeatedly slamming her right palm into his face. Jeremiah's nose splits, and his lips burst, and there's blood everywhere. The knife clatters to the metal floor. Valkyrie sweeps his leg, and he lands heavily, mewling like a spoiled child. He reaches up, grabs her hair, yanks her down on top of him. His hands encircle her throat. They start to blur. The act of killing, this time seen from the outside. To Danny, a blur of movement. To Valkyrie, a struggle that is going on forever. Danny lunges forward to help, but the blurred images are no longer there. There's a screech behind him, and he whirls. Valkyrie lies on the edge of the platform, clutching Jeremiah's hand as he dangles over the sea of liquid fire. Help me! Jeremiah screams. But his weight, plus all the sweat, proved too much, and he slips from Valkyrie's grip and disappears, screaming into the flames below. Valkyrie stays where she is for a moment, then gets up. She wipes her hand on her trousers. No! They both look round at the scream. Cadaverous Gant stands on a higher platform, a hanging chain in his hand. Danny, says Valkyrie, we have to go. She doesn't even get the chance to say now. Gant leaps into a deep swing. At its apex, he lets go. And for a moment, Danny thinks he's going to miss the hut, but he slams into it, scrabbling for purchase before he slips. His fingers dig in. He climbs onto the hut's roof, then drops onto the walkway and strides to the platform. The first chance you get, Valkyrie whispers to Danny. You get out of here. Danny shakes his head. I'm not leaving you. Get out of here and get help, Valkyrie says, and walks towards Gant her hands glowing. She fires that lightning and Gant just walks through it like it's nothing. He hits her, and she goes spinning. I'm going to rip your heart out, says Gant. 108. Gant picks her up, only to slam her down again. Then he kicks her, 
and Valkyrie goes rolling across the platform, gasping. I've known that boy since before either of you were born, he says, his voice little more than a guttural snarl. I practically raised him. He had his flaws, of course he did, but he was a good boy, and he worked hard, and all he ever wanted to do was make me happy. And you, you come to my home, and you... Gans grabs her by the collar, lifts her off her feet. What gives you the right? What gives you the right to kill that poor boy? Valkyrie struggles to breathe. How many people has he killed? They don't count, Gan screams. They don't count. He headbutts her and lets her drop, and Valkyrie staggers and stumbles away from him, blood running down her face. They're cattle, he continues to scream. They're practice. Their lives mean nothing. Danny sees his chance. The walkway is clear, but he hesitates, his feet stuck. Valkyrie glances at him, waves. Go, she says, spitting blood. Go! Yes, Danny, Gant says, kicking Valkyrie's legs out from under her. Go! Run! I'll hunt you down soon enough! He stomps on Valkyrie's back. She cries out, limping, staggering, throwing one foot in front of the other and willing his knees not to buckle. Danny crosses the walkway. He almost falls at the hut, but manages to keep himself standing. He doesn't look back. He doesn't turn at every cry of pain. He lurches into the hut, clinging to the hanging chains for support. The broken link dangles above him, and he looks at it for a moment before reaching up to slip it from the chain. He pockets it, then stumbles to the doorway on the other side. He rests there for a moment. He's almost out. He just has to keep it together for another few minutes. Just one more little bridge, and then the front door, and fresh air and freedom. That's all. He leaves the hut, one foot in front of the other, hands on the railing, easy does it, don't get distracted, don't look over at what's happening to Valkyrie, don't look over at what Gant is doing, one foot in front of the other, one foot in front of the... Danny falls against the door. He grabs the latch, it's slippery beneath his fingers. For the first time the thought occurs to him that it might be locked, that it won't open that some kind of magic will deny him his escape. But when he finally gets a grip and turns the latch, the door does indeed open, and he pulls it wide and cold air blasts his whole body. He sobs with relief and throws himself forward, the steps taking him by surprise. He falls to the sidewalk, skinning the palms of his hands but not feeling it. He crawls on, tries calling for help, but the street is as empty now as when he first got here. He reaches the Cadillac, fumbles for the handle, uses it to pull himself to his feet. Valkyrie's pickup is parked right behind it. He hears her yell in pain. He looks back, into the house. He can still see the top of Gant's head, bobbing up and down as he continues to beat Valkyrie to death. Danny takes a deep, deep breath and wipes some of the sweat from his eyes. Then he stands and takes the broken link of chain from his pocket. It's heavy and big. He turns to the Cadillac and smashes the driver's window. Next to go is the wing mirror. That smashes easily, making plenty of noise. Hey! Gant yells from inside the house. Danny ignores him, goes round to the front of the car. He swings the broken link into the left headlight. Hey! Gant screams. You leave that car alone! Danny moves slowly over to the other headlight, making deep dents in the hood as he goes. Clang! Clang! Clang. Then there's a smash, and no more headlights. Hey! Danny looks up. Cadaverous Gant stands in the doorway, lips pulled back from his teeth. He looks livid. He looks, with the sunlight hitting his liver spots, like a really angry corpse. Danny laughs. This only makes Gant angrier. First you killed Jeremiah, and then you attack my car! Danny brings the chain link down on the hood. Clang. Stop that! Jeremiah took great pride in maintaining this car. He would wax it every day until I could see my... Clang. Stop! Gant screeches. Stop it! Make me, 
says Danny. His throat is so dry it hurts to speak. Come on out of here. Face me like a man. What is this? Gant sneers. You think you're the hero? You think you can- Danny doesn't think anything of the sort. Danny just smashes the passenger side window. Gant lets out a cry of anger and horror and jumps down the steps. Danny backs off into the middle of the street, giving himself room. Gant stalks right up to him, and Danny raises his fists. Thinking maybe he can use the broken link to knock out a few of Gant's yellowing teeth now that he no longer has the house to make him unstoppable. But even out here, the old man surprises him with his speed and his strength. Danny barely glimpses the punch that rocks his head back. He completely misses the one that knocks him on his ass. Dazed, he can only look up as Gant takes Jeremiah Wallow's knife from his pocket. He closes his eyes. He doesn't want to see the end coming and he has no strength left in him to fight. Then suddenly he's being pulled to his feet and spun. Gant holds him from behind and digs the knife into his throat. Danny opens his eyes. Valkyrie stands on the steps of the house. Her face is a mask of blood, and she's holding her ribs with her left hand. Her right hand is outstretched, and it's glowing white. Your aim is off, Gant snarls, almost directly into Danny's ear. You'll hit your friend here, not even kill him. My aim's improving, Valkyrie says. I'm just out of practice, that's all. Then go ahead, says Gant. Fire! If you think you can do it, go on. Tell you what, I'll make it easy on you. I'll count down from three. If you haven't fired by then, I'll cut his throat. Does that sound fair? I have a counter-proposal, says Valkyrie coming down the steps. Her eyes burn. You let him go and drop the knife. You surrender and I arrest you. You tell me why you came after me and who wants me dead. That sounds pretty fair to me. Danny can hear Gant's smile in his voice as Valkyrie joins them on the street. We? Valkyrie's hand glows brighter. Two, she says. The knife digs a little deeper into Danny's throat. One, says Gant. Okay, Valkyrie says, the glow immediately fading from her hand. Okay, you win. Naturally, says Gant. You have shackles, I take it? Put them on. Valkyrie's face turns to stone. Gant's laugh is not a happy one. You think me stupid, girl? You think I'm going to leave you even the slightest chance to gain the upper hand? She hesitates. The shackles are in my pickup, she says, and starts forward. She freezes when Gant presses the blade deep enough into Danny's throat to draw blood. Do not take one more step, you insolent little whelp. Valkyrie narrows her eyes. You want me to get the shackles? I'm getting the... You're not doing anything, Gant says. He drags Danny back towards the pickup. I've heard all about you, he says as they go. I've been told about the things you've done. Up until now, I wondered which version of you we were going to get. The angel or the demon? Jeremiah and I, we were prepared for both. Valkyrie actually smiles. You'd never be prepared for Darkus. You'd be surprised, says Gant. I've killed all sorts of people in the course of my work. And what work would that be, exactly? Killing people like you. They come to a stop at the door of the pickup. Angel or demon, we wondered. Now I know. No, says Valkyrie. You only think you do. Danny feels Gant's grip loosen as he reaches for the door handle. Is that so? Well then, you tell me, young lady, which are you, angel or demon? Valkyrie smiles again. I'm like anybody, she says. I'm a little bit of both. Gant opens the door, and all Danny sees is a flash of brown and black as Zena leaps from the seat. Danny recoils and Gant falls, the big German shepherd snarling as she rolls off his chest. She goes for him again, jaws clamping down on his forearm. Gant screams, and Zena shakes her head furiously. The old man staggers to his feet, kicks the dog in the side. Zena yelps. Dances back, dives again, closing her teeth round his ankle. 
Hollering, Gant swipes at her with a knife. This time Xena gives a yelp of real pain and lets go. Gant swipes again, misses, and then Valkyrie is barreling into him. The knife falls. Valkyrie catches him with an elbow that cracks against his chin. He tries to make a space between them, but she has a hold of him now and she won't let go. She digs her fingers into his face, shredding across his features. He panics, tries to push her off. She's like a limpet. There's no dislodging her. Gant's eyes are squeezed shut. His face is bleeding. Danny watches as Valkyrie's fury is let loose. It's terrifying. They fall and Valkyrie is on top. Xena dances nearby, barking her rage and thirst for blood. Valkyrie crouches over Gant, starts slamming her right palm into his face. He tries to push her off, and she grabs his wrist, wrenches it, and Gant hollers in pain. Valkyrie leans in and snarls. Not so much fun when you're on the receiving end, is it? Please, Gant squeals. I'm an old man. Damn right you are, she says, and drops with an elbow to the jaw. Gant goes limp. Valkyrie puts both hands on his face, shifting her weight to jump to her feet. Then she stands, well out of the way of his limbs. Xena, she says. Hush. Immediately Xena quiets down, but her tail doesn't stop wagging as she keeps her eyes fixed on Gant. Valkyrie walks over to Danny and helps him stand. He hadn't even realized he'd collapsed. You okay? He nods. It's a blatant lie but Valkyrie doesn't seem to mind. Once he's on his feet, she leaves him, walks back to the front door. She shuts it. The dog barks, and Danny looks back, and Gant is halfway to the Cadillac with Xena biting into his already bloody leg. He curses in pain and throws himself through the broken window, shaking Xena off as he drags his legs in after him. Valkyrie's hands glow and white lightning catches Gant on the shoulder as he squirms behind the wheel. The engine roars to life and the car lurches forward. Valkyrie fires again, burning a deep scorch mark into the Cadillac's body, but she's too late to stop it. They watch it speed away, swerving dangerously. Once it's out of sight, Xena stops barking. Damn it, Valkyrie mutters. She looks back at Danny. You in any mood for a car chase? You can have one if you want, he says. I'll wait here. Valkyrie shakes her head. No. I reckon we've done enough these last few days. What do you say? Her hand wraps around the chain of his handcuffs and glows white. And a moment later, the chain breaks. Get in the pickup there, she says. I'll make a few calls, and then we'll head back to Meek Ridge. He gets in groaning a little when Xena jumps in on top of him. She settles herself in the middle, then reaches back to lick her bloodied fur. Every so often, she licks Danny's face. He is too tired to stop her. Valkyrie talks on the phone for a bit, then gets in behind the wheel. Some people are on their way here, she says. They'll seal off the place, make sure Gant doesn't get back in. Hopefully they'll pick him up on the road. If not... You'll get round-the-clock protection until he's arrested. Danny nods. Okay, he says. She reaches into her jacket, takes out a slim packet of dried leaves. She folds one, offers it to the dog. Xena swallows it, and Valkyrie scratches behind her ears. Who's a good doggy, huh? Who's a good doggy? Xena wags her tail in a steady, happy rhythm. Valkyrie pops one of the leaves in her own mouth, chewing it, and holds one out for Danny. For the pain, she says. He takes it without asking what it is. It tastes exactly like he expects it to, like a leaf. But the feeling that floods his body takes him completely by surprise. Wow, he says. Valkyrie starts up the pickup and pulls away from the curb. Long drive back to Meek Ridge, she says. You want the radio on? He'd wanted to sleep. But now that the leaf is working wonders, he's got more important things on his mind. No, he says. I want to know what's going on. Stephanie, Valkyrie, whatever your name is, please. Who are you? She gives him a smile. Well, okay. You deserve it, I suppose. I'll start at the beginning. How about that? Sounds good, he says. 
She fixes her eyes on the road. It all started with the death of my uncle. By the time Valkyrie has finished the story, told him all about Skullduggery and Tanith and Ghastly and Darkus and the Accelerator, they have reached Meek Ridge and are driving past the grocery store. It hasn't burned down, which is a good sign. They take the road up to Valkyrie's place. They pass Danny's car, but they don't stop until they get to the house. They get out. Zena disappears immediately. Valkyrie stretches. Danny looks at her, says nothing. He follows her up the steps, into the house. It's cold in here. Make yourself some coffee, she says, and that's what he does while she busies herself in another room. When he's done, he sits at the kitchen table, looking at his reflection in the window. They'd cleaned up in a gas station, but his face is a swollen mess and his clothes are stained with dried sweat and blood. His eyes dip to the mug of coffee he's set aside for her. Steam rises from the brim. A few minutes later, Zena comes in. She goes right up to Danny, nuzzling her snout into his hand until he pets her. Elsewhere, he hears water running. Zena wanders over to her bed, circles it a few times, and lies down. She rests her head on her paws, then looks up at him with wet, brown eyes. Valkyrie is standing there, in blue jeans and a jacket. Her hair is freshly washed. He hadn't heard her come in. Now I know why you're ninja quiet, he says. There are two bags by her feet. You going somewhere? Home, she says. This surprises him. After, after everything that's happened, it's time. She comes forward, picks up her coffee, tastes it. This is cold. You've been gone a while. I suppose I have. Why did you leave? he asks. I mean, I know that trauma must have been unimaginable, but... We won, she says. But the things I did when I was darkest, and the things I did later in order to beat her, I had to leave. I couldn't stay. Not after what I'd done to... Alice? She nods. I didn't deserve a sister or a family. Stephanie... Now, Stephanie deserved a family. Everything she did, she did out of love for them. But so did you. You said it yourself, protecting them was the reason you did everything. I did it wrong, though. I did it badly. You did what you had to do. I can't believe you've been living up here alone for the past five years, blaming yourself, hating yourself for the things you had to do. You saved us all. No, I didn't save us. Not that time. Danny finishes his coffee. It's lukewarm. Skullduggery sounds like an amazing person. Valkyrie gives one of those soft smiles. Yeah. He was a true hero. To give his life like that? Hmm? Says Valkyrie. Oh no, he didn't give his life. Danny frowns. He didn't? But you said he walked into the accelerator. She shakes her head. I said he walked towards the accelerator. He told me later, when he was taking his hat back, that a world without him would scarcely be worth living in. No. He hauled Ravel up off the floor and pushed him in instead. Danny blinks. But, but the soul had to be given willingly. It was, Valkyrie said. But there was nothing in the rules that said the soul you willingly gave had to be your own. And that worked? Yep. The engineer shrugged, said Skullduggery made a fair point. It allowed the soul to shut down the accelerator, and Skullduggery turned round and made fun of me. There's a knock on the door, and Valkyrie glances at her watch. That'll be him now. Danny jumps to his feet. Skullduggery? That's Skullduggery Pleasant? Probably, yep. I called him. Told him it was time I came home. It's like he said. Years ago, punishment is the easy option. If I really want to make up for the things I've done, I've got to help people. If I want to make up for what I did to my sister, I have to be around her. I have to be a part of her life. She's six now, for God's sake. Six! She barely knows me. It's... It's time that changed. She picks up her bags. 
You can let yourself out, can't you? Uh, yeah. Valkyrie smiles. I'll get the rest of my stuff shipped over to me and then... I don't know. She looks round. I'd sell the place, but I kind of like it. Will I ever see you again? Danny asks. You might. But I might be an old man, yeah? And you'll look exactly the same. She gives him a sad smile. Yeah, maybe. There'll be some people calling around to talk to you. Sorcerers. Good people. They'll make sure everything is all right. Yeah, cool. She raises an eyebrow. Is everything going to be all right? I... I don't know. You're asking me to return to my boring life after... after all this, after you. I don't know if I can do that. So don't. You've dreams, right? You don't want to spend the rest of your life running a grocery store in Meek Ridge, do you? No. I... I used to have a record deal. Valkyrie tilts her head. Seriously? No. Well, there you go. Get your record deal back. Become a rock star. Live an extraordinary life. You don't have to save the world to change it. She taps her leg, and Zena trots over. Danny goes as far as the hall with them. Through the frosted glass in the front door, he can see the dark outline of a tall, thin man wearing a hat. He remembers, as a kid, being scared of Santa Claus. He remembers lying in bed on Christmas Eve, curled in a ball, eyes wide, jumping at every creak the house made, waiting for this ghostly presence to visit. He feels that same kind of fear now. Fear of the supernatural, mixed with pure, undiluted excitement. Valkyrie stops with her hand on the latch and looks back. You want to meet him? Danny hesitates. Hesitates for a long time, then shakes his head. My mind is already blown enough, thank you very much. I think actually seeing a talking skeleton in person would just... I think my head would literally explode. Her smile turns to a grin. Yeah, fair enough. Hey, you have a good life, Danny. You hear me? Same to you, Valkyrie. He gives her a little wave, feels the twinge in his injured shoulder, and winces. What'll I tell people about all this? They won't believe you anyway, says Valkyrie. So don't tell them the truth. Now it's his turn to raise an eyebrow. What? Tell them about sorcerers and lunatics and kidnappings and murder? No, she says. Tell them the real truth. Tell them about what's really important. And what, if you don't mind me asking, is really important? Valkyrie holds her hand palm upwards, and it starts to glow from within. She smiles at him. Magic, she says. That was Skullduggery Pleasant, The Dying of the Light, by Derek Landy. Read by Stephen Hogan, for Harper Audio. Audible hopes you've enjoyed this program.